on the trail of the immigrant by edward steiner published 1906 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox.org read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana in 2015 on the trail of the immigrant chapter 1 by way of introduction my dear lady of the first cabin on the fourth morning out from hamburg after your maid had disentangled you from your soft wrappings of steamer rugs and leaning upon her arm you paced the deck for the first time the sun smiled softly upon the smooth sea and its broken reflections came back hot upon your pale cheeks then your gentle eyes wandered from the illimitable sea back to the steamer which carried you you saw the four funnels out of which came pouring clouds of smoke trailing behind the ship in picturesque tracery you watched the encircling gulls which had been your fellow travellers ever since we left the white cliffs of albion and then your eyes rested upon the mighty teutons who stood on the bridge and whose blue eyes searched the sea for danger or rested upon the compass for direction from below came the sweet notes of music gentle and wooing one of the many ways in which the steamship company tried to make life pleasant for you to bring back your bon appetit to its tempting tables then suddenly you stood transfixed looking below you upon the deck from which came rather pronounced odors and confused noises the notes of a jerky harmonica harshly struck your ears attuned to symphonies and the song which accompanied it was guttural and unmusical the deck which you saw was crowded with human beings men women and children lay there many of them motionless and the children numerous as the sands of the sea unkempt and unwashed were everywhere in evidence you felt great pity for the little ones and you threw chocolate cakes among them smiling as you saw them in their tangled struggle to get to your sweet bounty you pitied them all the frowsy-headed ill-clothed women the men who looked so hungry and so greedy and above all you pitied you said so do you remember you said you pitied your own country for having to receive such a conglomerate of human beings so near to the level of beasts i well recall it for that day they did look like animals it was the day after the storm and they had all been seasick they had neither the spirit nor the appliances necessary for cleanliness the toilet rooms were small and hard to reach and sea water as you well know is not a good cleanser they were wrapped in gray blankets which they had brought from their bunks and you were right they did look like animals but not half so clean as the cattle which one sees so often on an outward journey certainly not half so comfortable you were taken aback when i spoke to you i took offence at your suspecting us to be beasts for i was one of them although all that separated you and me was a little iron bar about fifteen or twenty rungs of an iron ladder and perhaps as many dollars in the price of our tickets you were amazed at my temerity and did not answer at once then you begged my pardon and i grudgingly forgave you one likes to have a grudge against the first cabin when one is travelling steerage the next time you came to us it was without your maid you had quite recovered and so had we the steerage deck was more crowded than ever but we were happy comparatively speaking happy in spite of the fact that the bread was so doughy that we voluntarily fed the fishes with it and the meat was suspiciously flavored again you threw your sweet meats among us and asked me to carry a basket of fruit to the women and children i did so i think to your satisfaction when i returned the empty basket you wished to know all about us and i proceeded to tell you many things who the slavs are and i brought you fine specimens of poles bohemians servians and slovaks men women and children and they began to look to you like men women and children and not like beasts i introduced to you german austrian and hungarian jews and you began to understand the difference 
do you remember the group of italians to whom you said good morning in their own tongue and how they smiled back upon you all the joy of their native land and you learned the difference between a sicilian and a neapolitan between a piedmontese and a calabrian you met lithuanians greeks magyars and finns you came in touch with twenty nationalities in an hour and your sympathetic smile grew sweeter and your loving bounty increased day by day you wondered how i happened to know these people so well and i told you jokingly that it was my social nose which over and over again had led me steerage way across the sea back to the villages from which the immigrants come and onward with them into the new life in america you suspected that it was not a social nose but a social heart that i was led by my sympathies and not by my scientific sense and i did not dispute you you urged me to write what i knew and what i felt and now you see i have written i have tried to tell it in this book as i told it to you on board of ship i told you much about the jews and the slavs because they are less known and come in larger numbers when i had finished telling you just who these strangers are and something of their life at home and among us in the strange land you grew very sympathetic without being less conscious how great is the problem which these strangers bring with them if i succeed in accomplishing this for my larger audience the public i shall be content you were loath to listen to figures for you said that statistics were not to your liking and apt to be misleading so i leave them from these pages and crowd them somewhere into the back of the book where the curious may find them if they delight in them my telling deals only with life all i attempt to do is to tell what i have lived among the immigrants and not so much of what i have counted here and there i have dropped a story which you said might be worth retelling and i tell it as i told it to you not to earn the smile which may follow but simply that it may win a little more sympathy for the immigrant if here and there i stop to moralize it is largely from force of habit and not because i am eager to play either preacher or prophet if i point out some great problems i do it because i love america with a love passing your own because you are a home-born and know not the lot of the stranger you may be incredulous if i tell you that i do not realize that i was not born and educated here that i am not thrilled by the sight of my cradle home nor moved by my country's flag i know no fatherland but america for after all it matters less where one was born than where one's ideals had their birth and to me america is not the land of mighty dollars but the land of great ideals i am not yet convinced that the peril to these ideals lies in those who come to you crude and unfinished if i were i would be the first one to call out shut the gates and not the last one to exile myself for your country's good i think the peril lies more in the first cabin than in the steerage more in the american colonies in monte carlo and nice than in the italian colonies in new york and chicago not the least of the peril lies in the fact that there is too great a gulf between you and the steerage passenger whose virtues you will discover as soon as you learn to know them i send out this book in the hope that it will mediate between the first cabin and the steerage between the hilltop and lower town between the fashionable west side and the ghetto do you remember my lady of the first cabin what those slovaks said to you as you walked down the gangplank in hoboken what they said to you i now say in my book zebogum the lord be with thee end of chapter one by way of introduction chapter two of on the trail of the immigrant this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana on the trail of the immigrant by edward steiner chapter two the beginning of the trail 
some twenty years ago while traveling from vienna on the northern railway i was locked into my compartment with three slavic women who entered at a way station and who for the first time in their lives had ventured from their native home by way of the railroad in fear and awe they looked out the window upon the moving landscape while with each recurring jolt they held tightly to the wooden benches one of them volunteered the information that they were journeying a great distance nearly twenty-five miles from their native village i ventured to say that i was going much further than twenty-five miles upon which i was asked my destination i replied america expecting much astonishment at that announcement but all they said was america where is that is it really further than twenty-five miles until about the time mentioned the people of eastern and southeastern europe had remained stationary just where they had been left by the slow and glacial-like movement of the races and tribes to which they belonged scarcely any traces of their former migrations survive except where some warlike tribe has exploited its history in song describing its escape from the enemy into some mountain fastness which was of course deserted as soon as the fury of war had been spent from the great movements which changed the destinies of other european nations these people were separated by political and religious barriers so that the discovery of america was as little felt as the discovery of the new religious and political world laid bare by the reformation each tribe and even each smaller group developed according to its own native strength or according to how closely it leaned towards western europe which was passing through great evolutionary and revolutionary changes on the whole it may be said that in many ways they remained stationary certainly immobile old customs survived and became laws slight differentiations in dress occurred and became the unalterable costume of certain regions idioms grew into dialects and where the native genius manifested itself in literature the dialect became a language these artificial boundaries became impassable especially where differences in religion occurred each group was locked in often hating its nearest neighbors and closest kin and also having an aversion to anything which came from without social and economic causes played no little part both in the isolation of these tribes and groups and in the necessity for migration when the latter was necessary they moved together to where there was less tyranny and more virgin soil they went out peacefully most of the time but could be bitter relentless and brave when they encountered opposition but they did not go out with the conqueror's courage nor with the adventurer's lust for fame they were no iconoclasts of a new civilization nor the bearers of new tidings they went where no one remained where the romans had thinned the ranks of the germans where hun avar and turk had left valleys soaked in blood and made ready for the slab's crude plough where roman colonies were decaying and roman cities were sinking into the dunes made by ocean's sands they destroyed nothing nor did they build anything they accepted little or nothing which they found on conquered soil but lived the old life in a new home whether it was under the shadow of the turkish crescent or where roman conquerors had left empty cities and decaying palaces in traveling through the most interesting austrian province dalmatia on the shores of the adriatic opposite italy i came upon the palace of diocletian in which the slav has built a town using the palace walls for the foundations of his dwellings in spite of the fact that both strength and beauty lie embedded in these foundations the houses are as crude and simple as those built in an american mining camp upon the ruins of the ancient city of salona i found peasants breaking the corinthian pillars into gravel for donkey paths these people although surrounded by conquering nations were not amalgamated and were enslaved but not changed art lived and died in their midst but bequeathed them little or no culture this is true not only of many of the slavs but also many of the jews who live among them and who have remained unimpressed and unchanged for centuries except as tyrannical governments played shuffleboard with them pushing them hither and thither as policy or caprice dictated the italian peasant began his wanderings earlier than the other nations at least to other portions of europe where he was regarded as indispensable in the building of railroads 
these movements however were spasmodic and he soon returned to his native village to remain there locked in by prejudice and superstition and unbaptized by the spirit of progress but all this is different now and the change came through that word quite unknown in those regions twenty-five years ago the word america having exhausted the labor supply of northern europe which as for instance in germany needed all its strength for the upbuilding of its own industries american capitalists deemed it necessary to find new human forces to increase their wealth by developing the vast untouched natural resources just how systematically the recruiting was carried on is hard to tell but it is sure that it did not require much effort and that the only thing necessary was to make a beginning in nearly all the countries from which new forces were to be drawn there was chronic economic distress which had lasted long and which grew more painful as new and higher needs disclosed themselves to the lower classes of society most of the land as a rule was held by the privileged class the labor was illly paid the average earning of a slavic peasant during the harvest season was about twenty-five cents a day which sank to half that sum the rest of the time with work as scarce as wages were low if a load of wood was brought to town it was besieged by a small army of laborers ready to do the necessary sawing other work than wood sawing there practically was none and consequently in the winter time much distress prevailed the labor of women was still more poorly paid a muscular servant girl who would wash scrub attend to the garden and cattle and help with the harvesting received about ten dollars a year with a huge cake and perhaps a pair of boots no less huge as a premium these wages were paid only in the most prosperous portion of the slavic world being much lower in other regions while in the mountains neither work nor wages were obtainable the hard rye bread scantily cut and rarely unadulterated with an onion was the daily portion while meat to many of the people was a luxury obtainable only on special holidays i remember vividly the untimely passing away of a pig which belonged to a titled estate according to the law which reached with its mighty arm to this small village the pig must be decently buried and covered by not balsam and spices but quicklime and coal oil hardly had these rites been performed when the carcass mysteriously disappeared but meat was scarce and the peasants were hungry during this same period the jewish people who were scattered through eastern europe began to feel not only economic distress but existence itself was often made unbearable by the newly awakened national feeling which reacted against the jews in waves of cruel persecution such trade as could be diverted into other channels was taken from them and they grew daily poorer living became precarious and life insecure it did not take much agitation to induce any of these people to emigrate and when the first venturesome travelers returned with money in the bank silver watches in their pockets store clothes on their backs and a feeling of i'm as good as anybody in their minds each one of them became an agent and an agitator and if paid agents ever existed they might have been immediately dispensed with now one can stand in any district of hungary poland or italy and see coming down the mountains or passing along the highways and byways of the plains larger or smaller groups of peasants not all picturesquely clad passing in a never-ending stream on towards this new world the stream is growing larger every day and the source seems inexhaustible sombre jews come on whose faces fear and care have ploughed deep furrows whose backs are bent beneath the burden of law and lawlessness they come thousands at a time at least five million more may be expected and he does not know what misery is who has not seen them on that march which has lasted nearly two thousand years beneath the burden heaped by hate and prejudice both peasant and jew come from russian austrian or magyar rule under which they have had few of the privileges of citizenship but many of its burdens from valleys in the crescent-shaped carpathians from the sunny but barren slopes of the alps and from the russian polish plains they are coming as once they went forth from earlier homes peaceful toilers who seek a field for their surplus labor or as traders to use their wits and it is a longer journey than any of their timid forebears ever undertook
the most venturesome of the slavs the bohemians in whom the love of wandering was always alive started this stream of emigration as early as the seventeenth century sending us the noblest of their sons and daughters the heroes and heroines of the reformatory wars idealists who like the pilgrim fathers came for freedom to worship god their descendants have long ago been blended into the common life of the people of america scarcely conscious of the fact that they might have had the same pride in ancestry which the descendants of the pilgrims delight to exhibit not until the latter part of the nineteenth century in the seventies did the bohemian immigrants come in large numbers and in a steady stream bringing with them the czechs of morovia a neighboring province together they make some two hundred thousand of our population fairly distributed throughout the country and about equally divided between tillers of the soil and those following industrial pursuits nearly all bohemian immigrants come to stay and adjust themselves more or less easily to their environment the economic distress which has brought them here while never acute threatens to become so now from the over accentuated language struggle which diverts the energies of the people and makes proper legislation impossible the building of railroads and other governmental enterprises has been retarded by parliamentary obstructionists to whom language is more than bread and butter business relations with the germanic portions of austria have come almost to a standstill conditions which are bound to increase immigration from bohemia's industrial centers the poles were the next of the western slavs to be drawn out of the seclusion of their villages those from eastern prussia being the earliest and those from russian poland the latest to have swelled the stream of emigration the largest number of the polish immigrants is composed of unskilled laborers most of them coming from villages where they had worked in the fields during the summer time and in winter went to the cities where they did the cruder work in the factories the poles from germany's part of the divided kingdom have furnished nearly their quota of immigrants and those remaining upon their native acres will continue to remain there if only to spite the germans who are grievously disappointed not to see them grow less under the repressive measures of the government they are the thorn in the emperor's flesh and with social democrats make enough trouble to verify the saying quote, uneasy lies the head that wears a crown End quote. true even with regard to that most imperial of emperors the austrian poles who have retained many of their liberties and have also gained new privileges have had a national and intellectual revival under the impulse of which the peasantry has been lifted to a higher level which has reacted upon their economic condition and although that condition is rather low in galicia as that portion of poland is called immigration from there has reached its high water mark the largest increase in immigration among the poles is to be looked for from russian poland where industrial and political conditions are growing worse and where it will take a long time to establish any kind of equilibrium which will pacify the people and hold them to the soil the slovaks who were relatively the best off and further away from the main arteries of travel are comparatively speaking newcomers and furnish at present the largest element in the western slavic immigration they have retained most staunchly many of their slavic characteristics are the least impressionable among the western slavs and usually come lured by the increased wages they are most liable to return to the land of their fathers after saving money enough materially to improve their lot in life from the austrian provinces carinthia and styria come increasingly large numbers of slovenes who are really the link between the eastern and western slavs they belong to the highest type of that race but represent only a small portion of the large slavic family of the eastern slavs only the southern group has moved towards america the russian peasant being bound to the soil and unable to free himself from the obligation of paying the heavy taxes by removal to a foreign country with the larger freedom which is bound to come to him will also come economic relief so that the emigration of the russian peasant in large numbers is not a likelihood lured by promises of higher wages in our industrial centers croatians and slovenians come in increasingly large numbers while in smaller numbers come servians and bulgarians 
the only slavs who are thorough seamen and who are coming to our coasts in increasingly large numbers as sailors and fishermen are the dalmatians and last but most heroic of all the slavs is the montenegrin who has held his mountain fastnesses against the turk and who have been the living wall resisting the victories of islam his little country is blessed by but a few crumbs of soil between huge mountains and boulders and in the measure in which peace reigns in the balkans he is without occupation and sustenance so that he is compelled to seek these more fertile shores where he will for the first time in history and quite unconsciously quote, turn the sword into the plowshare and the spear into the pruning hook End quote. Tennyson does not over-idealize the Montenegrin in his admirable sonnet. They rose to where their sovereign eagle sails. They kept their faith, their freedom, on the height. Chaste, frugal, savage, armed by day and night against the Turk, whose inroad nowhere scales their headlong passes, but his footstep fails, and red with blood the crescent reels from fight before their dauntless hundreds in prone flight by thousands down the crags and through the vales o oh, smallest among peoples rough rock throne of freedom warriors beating back the swarm of turkish islam for five hundred years great senegora never since thine own black ridges drew the cloud and break the storm has breathed a race of mightier mountaineers from lithuania a province of russia come smaller groups of non-slavic emigrants people with an old civilization of which little remains and with a language which leans closest to sanskrit yet who because of their subjection to russia have sunk to the level of the russian peasants then there are magyars and finns rather close kinsmen who because one lives in the south and the other far north are as different as the south is from the north greeks and syrians traders all of them and workers only when they must be we shall follow them more closely as they pass into our national life the Italian immigration, the largest which we receive from any one source, comes primarily from southern Italy, from the crowded cities with their unspeakable vices. The smallest number of immigrants come from the villages where they have all the virtues of tillers of the soil. The most volatile of our foreign population, and perhaps the most clannish, they represent a problem recognized by their home government, which was the first to concern itself with it, to study it systematically, and to aid our government so far as possible in irrational solution. The number of Italian immigrants is still undiminished, and in spite of the fact that in recent years more than 200,000 of them have annually left their native land, their withdrawal is scarcely felt, and the number could be doubled without perceptible diminution at home. There are then upon this immigrant trail many people of varied cultural development, some of them coming from countries in which they have been part of a very high type of civilization, while others come from the veritable backwoods of Europe, into which neither steam nor electricity have entered to disturb the old order, nor has yet awakened a new life. None of them starts for America tempted by wealth which can be picked up in the streets. That mythical man who, upon landing, refused to take a quarter from the sidewalk because he had heard that dollars were lying about loose in America has found it true because he has gone into politics. The immigrant of today, be he Slav, Italian, or Jew, starts upon this trail with no culture, it is true, but with a virgin mind in which it may be said to grow not always with a keen mind but with a surplus of muscle which he is ready to exchange at the mouth of the pit or by the furnace's hot blast for a higher wage than he could earn in the miry fields of his native village but it is by no means settled who gets the best of the bargain end of chapter two the beginning of the trail Chapter 3 of On the Trail of the Immigrant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. On the Trail of the Immigrant by Edward Steiner.
Chapter Three: The Fellowship of the Steerage. Back of Warsaw, Vienna, Naples, and Palermo, with no place on the world's map to mark their existence, are small market towns to which the peasants come from their hidden villages. They come not, as is their wont, on feast and fast days, with song and music, but solemnly. The women bent beneath their burdens, carried on head or back, and the men who walk beside them, less conscious than usual of their superiority. The women have lost the splendor which usually marks their attire. Their embroidered, stiffly starched petticoats, flowered aprons, and gay kerchiefs have disappeared, and instead they have put on more somber garb, some cast-off clothing of our civilization. The men, too, have left their gayer coats behind them to wear the shoddy ones which neither warm nor become them. Beneath the black cross which marks the boundary of the Polish town, they usually rest themselves. The cross was erected when the peasants were liberated from serfdom, and beneath it every wanderer rests and prays, every wanderer but the Jew, for whom the cross symbolizes neither liberty nor rest. These towns, which used to be buried in a cloud of dust in the summer and a sea of mud in the winter time, to which the peasant came but rarely, and then only to do his petty trading or his quarreling before the law, are the first catch-basins of the little percolating streams of immigration, and have felt their influence in increased prosperity. They are the supply stations where much of the money is spent on the way out, and into which the money flows from the mining camps and industrial centers in America. One little house leans hospitably against the other, a two-story house marks the dwelling of nobility, and the power of the law is personified in the gendarmes who, weaponed to the teeth, patrol the peaceful town. In Russia, before one may emigrate, many painful and costly formalities must be observed. A passport obtained through the governor and speeded on its way by sundry tips. It is in itself an expensive document, without which no Russian subject may leave his community, much less his country. Many persons, therefore, forego the pleasure of securing official permission to leave the Tsar's domain, and go, trusting to good luck, or to a few rubles with which they may close the ever-open eyes of the gendarmes of the Russian boundary. Austrian and Italian authorities also require passports for their subjects, but they are less costly and are granted to all who have satisfied the demands of the law. These formalities over, the travelers move on to the market square, a dusty place where women squat, selling fruits and vegetables, the plaster cast and gaily decorated saints, stoically receiving the adoration of our pilgrims, who come for the last time with a petition which now is for a prosperous journey. There also, the agent of the steamship company receives with just as much feeling their hard-earned money in exchange for the long-coveted ticket, which is to bear them to their land of hope. From hundreds of such towns and squares, thousands of simple-minded people turn westward each day, disappearing in the clouds of dust which mark their progress to the railroad station and on towards the dreaded sea. From the small windows of fourth-class railway carriages they get glimpses of a new world, larger than they ever dreamed it to be, and much more beautiful. Through orderly and stately Germany, with its picturesque villages, its castled hills and magnificent cities they pass, across mountains and hills and by rushing rivers, until one day upon the horizon they see a forest of masts wedged in between the warehouses and factories of a great city. Guided by an official of the steamship company, whose wards they have become, they alight from the train, but not without having here and there to pay tribute to that organized brigandage by which every port of embarkation is infested. The beer they drink and the food they buy, the necessary and unnecessary things which they are urged to purchase, are excessively dear, by virtue of the fact that a double profit is made for the benefit of the officials or the company which they represent. The first lodging places before they are taken to the harbors are dear, poor, and often unsafe. Much bad business is done there which might be controlled or entirely discontinued. For instance, in Rotterdam three years ago, coming with a party of immigrants, we were met by an employee of the steamship company and taken in charge, ostensibly to be guided to the company's offices near the harbor. 
on the way we were made to stop at a dirty third-class hotel whose chief equipment was a huge bar and were told to make ourselves comfortable while we were not compelled to spend our money we were invited to do so urged to drink and left there fully three hours until this same employee called for us i complained to the company through the only official whom i could reach and who no doubt was one of the beneficiaries for the complaint did not travel far this is only the remnant of an abuse from which the emigrant and the country which received him used to suffer for our stringent immigration laws have made it more profitable to treat the emigrant with consideration and to look after his physical welfare yet admirable as is the machinery which has been set up at hamburg for the reception of the emigrant these minor abuses have not all passed away and while care is taken that his health does not suffer and that his purse is not completely emptied he is still regarded as prey the italian government safeguards its immigrants admirably at naples and genoa but other governments are seemingly unconcerned when the official has done with the emigrants they are taken to the emigrant depot of the company which in many cases is inadequate for the large number of passengers their papers are examined and they are separated according to sex and religion at hamburg they are required to take baths and their clothing is disinfected after which they constantly emit the delicious odors of hot steam and carbolic acid the sleeping arrangements at hamburg are excellent usually twenty persons are in one ward but private rooms which have beds for four people can be rented the food is abundant and good plenty of bread and meat are to be had the luxuries can be bought at reasonable prices at hamburg music is provided and the immigrants may make merry at a dance until dawn of the day of sailing the medical examination is now very strict yet seemingly not strict enough for quite a large percentage of those who pass the german physicians are deported on account of physical unfitness i wish to make this point here and emphasize it that restrictive immigration has had a remarkable influence upon the german and netherlands steamship companies in that they have become fairly humane and decent which they were not but improvement in this direction is still possible the day of embarkation finds an exciting crowd with heavy packs and heavier hearts climbing the gangplank an uncivil crew directs the bewildered travelers to their quarters which in the older ships are far too inadequate and in the newer ships are if anything worse clean they are but there is neither breathing space below nor deck room above and the nine hundred steerage passengers crowded into the hold of so elegant and roomy a steamer as the kaiser wilhelm ii of the north german lloyd line are positively packed like cattle making a walk on deck when the weather is good absolutely impossible while to breathe clean air below in rough weather when the hatches are down is an equal impossibility the stenches become unbearable and many of the immigrants have to be driven down for they prefer the bitterness and danger of the storm to the pestilential air below the division between the sexes is not carefully looked after and the young women who are quartered among the married passengers have neither the privacy to which they are entitled nor are they much more protected than if they were living promiscuously the food which is miserable is dealt out of huge kettles into the dinner pails provided by the steamship company when it is distributed the stronger push and crowd so that meals are anything but orderly procedures on the whole the steerage of the modern ship ought to be condemned as unfit for the transportation of human beings and i do not hesitate to say that the german companies and they provide best for their cabin passengers are unjust if not dishonest towards the steerage take for example the second cabin which costs about twice as much as the steerage and sometimes not twice so much and yet the second cabin passenger on the kaiser wilhelm ii has six times as much deck room much better located and well protected against inclement weather two to four sleep in one cabin which is well and comfortably furnished while in the steerage from two hundred to four hundred sleep in one compartment on bunks one above the other with little light and no comforts in the second cabin the food is excellent is partaken of in a luxuriantly appointed dining room is well cooked and well served while in the steerage the unsavory rations are not served but doled out with less courtesy than one would find in a charity soup kitchen 
the steerage ought to be and could be abolished by law it is true that the italian and polish peasant may not be accustomed to better things at home and might not be happier in better surroundings nor know how to use them but it is a bad introduction to our life to treat him like an animal when he is coming to us he ought to be made to feel immediately that the standard of living in america is higher than it is abroad and that life on the higher plane begins on board of ship every cabin passenger who has seen and smelt the steerage from afar knows that it is often indecent and inhuman and i who have lived in it know that it is both of these and cruel besides on the steamer noridum sailing from rotterdam three years ago a russian boy in the last stages of consumption was brought up on the sunny deck out of the pestilential air of the steerage i admit that to the first cabin passengers it must have been a repulsive sight this emaciated dirty dying child but to order a sailor to drive him downstairs was a cruel act which i resented not until after repeated complaints was the child taken to the hospital and properly nursed on many ships even drinking water is grudgingly given and on the steamer statendom four years ago we had literally to steal water for the steerage from the second cabin and that of course at night on many journeys particularly on the first bismarck of the hamburg american line five years ago the bread was absolutely uneatable and was thrown into the water by the irate immigrants in providing better accommodations the english steamship companies have always led and while the discipline on board of ship is always stricter than on other lines the care bestowed upon the immigrants is correspondingly greater at last the passengers are stowed away and into the excitement of the hour of departure there comes a silent heaviness as if the surgeon's knife were about to cut the arteries of some vital organ homesickness a disease scarcely known among the mobile anglo-saxons is a real presence in the steerage for there are the men and women who have been torn from the soil in which through many generations their lives were rooted no one knows the sacred agony of that moment which fills and thrills these simple-minded folk who for the first time in their lives face the unknown perils of the sea the greater the distance which divides the ship from the fast fading dock the nearer comes the little village with its dusty square its plaster cast saints and its little mud huts from far away russia a small pinched face looks out and a sweet voice calls to the departing father not to forget leah and her six children who will wait for tidings from him be they good or ill from poland in guttural speech comes a god be with you brayther strong oak of our village forest and our dependence the virgin protect thee the slovak feels his marianka pressing her lips against his while she sobs out her lamentation and he to keep up his courage gives a strong pull and a long pull at the bottle out of which his white native palenka gives him its last alcoholic greeting silent are the usually vociferous italians whose glorious mediterranean is blotted out by the somber gray of the atlantic they shall not soon again see the full orbed moon shining upon the bay of naples sending from heaven to earth a path of silver upon which the blessed saints go up and down in the silence of the moment there come to them the rattle of carts and the clatter of hooves the soft voice of a serenade and then the sweet scented silence of an italian night they all think even if they had never thought much before for the moment is as solemn as when the padre came with his censer and holy water or when the acolytes rang the bells mechanically on the way to some deathbed it is all solemn in spite of the band which strikes the well-known notes of le vaterland max sein and makes merrier music each moment to check the tears and to heal the newly made wounds they try to be brave now struggling against homesickness and fear until their faces pale and one by one they are driven down into the hold to suffer the pangs of the damned in the throes of a complication of agonies for which as yet no pills or powders have brought soothing but when the sun shines upon the atlantic and dries the deck space allotted to the steerage passengers they will come out of the hold one by one wrapped in the company's gray blankets pitiable-looking objects ill-kempt and ill-kept 
stretched upon the deck nearest the steam pipes they await the return of the life which seemed clean gone out of them it is at this time that cabin passengers from their spacious deck will look down upon them in pity and dismay getting some sport from throwing sweetmeats and pennies among the hopeless-looking mass out of which we shall have to coin our future citizens from among whom will arise fathers and mothers of future generations this practice of looking down into the steerage holds all the pleasures of a slumming expedition with none of its hazards of contamination for the barriers which keep the classes apart on a modern ocean liner are as rigid as in the most stratified society and nowhere else are they more artificial or more obtrusive a matter of twenty dollars lifts a man into a cabin passenger or condemns him to the steerage gives him the chance to be clean to breathe pure air to sleep on spotless linen and to be served courteously or to be pushed into a dark hold where soap and water are luxuries where bread is heavy and soggy meat without savor and service without courtesy the matter of twenty dollars makes one man a menace to be examined every day driven up and down slippery stairs and exposed to the winds and waves but makes of the other man a pet to be coddled fed on delicacies guarded against draughts lifted from deck to deck and nursed with gentle care the average steerage passenger is not envious his position is part of his lot in life the ship is just like russia austria poland or italy the cabin passengers are the lords and ladies the sailors and officers are the police and the army while the captain is the king or czar so they are merry when the sun shines and the porpoises roll when far away a sail shines white in the sunlight or the trailing smoke of a steamer tells of other wanderers over the deep here slovaks bestir yourselves let's sing the song of the little red pocket-book or the gardener's wife who cried too sad you say then let's sing about the red beer and the white cakes so they sing brothers brothers who'll drink the beer brothers brothers when we are not here our children they will drink it then when we are no more living men beer beer in glass or can always always finds its man other slavs from the southern mountains sing their stirring war song out there out beyond the mountains where tramps the foaming steed of war old jugo calls his sons afar to aid to aid in my old age defend me from the foeman's rage out there out there beyond the mountains my children follow one and all where nikita your prince doth call and steep anew in turkish gore the sword czar dushan flashed of yore out there out there beyond the mountains if the merriment rises to the proper pitch there will be dancing to the jerky notes of an harmonica or accordion for no emigrant ship ever sailed without one of them on board the germans will have a waltz upon a limited scale while the poles dance a mazurka and the magyar attempts a wild sardas which invariably lands him against the railing for it needs steady feet as well as a steadier floor than the back of this heaving rolling monster men and women from other corners of the slav world will be reminded of the spinning room or of some village tavern and joining hands will sing with appropriate motions this not disagreeable song to katyushka or susanka or whatever may be the name of this honey mouth we are dancing we are dancing dancing twenty-two merry dances in the colo merry sweet and true what a honey mouth has merry oh what joyful bliss rather than all twenty-two i would merry kiss greeks serbians bulgarians magyars italians and slovaks laugh at one another's antics and while listening to the strange sounds are beginning to enter into a larger fellowship than they ever enjoyed for so close as this many of them never came without the hand upon the hilt or the finger upon the trigger when providence is generous and grants a quiet evening the merriment will grow louder and louder drowning the murmur of the sea and silencing the sorrows of yesterday and the fears for the morrow yes brothers we are traveling on to america the land of hope let us be merry where are you going Zeska holka a pet name for a bohemian girl 
to chicago to service and soon i hope to matrimony that's what they say that you can get married in america without a dowry and without much trouble ah yes and get unmarried again without much trouble but of this fact she is blissfully ignorant where are you going senor ah i'm going to mulberry street great city yes mulberry street great city polack where are you going kellis land where do you say kellis land where stones are and big sea yes yes i know now kelly's island in ohio fine place for you polack powder blast and white limestone dust yet a fine sea and a fine life all of them are going somewhere to someone not quite strangers they someone has crossed the sea before them they are drawn by thousands of magnets and they will draw others after them we have all become good comrades for fellowship is easily begotten by the fellows in the same ship especially in the steerage where no barriers exist and where no introductions are possible or necessary i am sharing many confidences of young women who go to meet their lovers of young men who go to make their fortunes of bankrupts who have fled the heavy arm of the law of women hiding moral taint of countless ones who are hiding grave physical infirmities and of some who have lost faith in god and men in law and justice yet most of them believe with a simpler faith than our own god is real to them and his providence stretches over the seas no morning no matter how tumultuous the waves but the russian jews will put on their phylacteries and kissing the sacred fringes which they wear upon their breasts will turn towards the east and the rising sun to where their holy temple stood rarely will a slav or italian go to bed without committing himself to the special care of some patron saint vice there is crude rough vice down there in the steerage yes they drink vodka even that rarely but up in the cabin they drink champagne and kentucky whiskies the same devils with other names seldom do the steerage passengers gamble a friendly game of cards perhaps here and there while up in the cabin from sunlight until dawn poker chips are piled and passed to and fro among daintily attired men and women there are rough jests in this steerage and scant courtesy but virtue is as precious here as there although kept under tremendous temptation i have crossed the ocean hither and thither often in the steerage more often in the cabin and i have found gentlemen in dirty homespun in the one place and in the other supposed gentlemen who were but beasts although they had lackeys to attend them and suites of rooms in which to make luxurious a useless existence the steerage brings virtue and vice in the rough a dollar might not be safe and yet as safe as a whole bank up in the cabin the steerage might steal a loaf of white bread or a tempting cake but it has not yet learned how to corner the wheat market the men in the steerage might be tempted to steal a ride upon a railroad but in the cabin i have met rascals who have stolen whole railroads yet were called captains of industry down in the steerage there is a faith in the future and in the despair which often overwhelms them i needed but to whisper be patient this seems like hell but it will soon seem to you like heaven yes this heaven is coming coming down almost from above on yonder fringe of the sea for far away trails the low lying smoke of the pilot boat and but a little farther off is land land none but the shipwrecked and the immigrants these wayfarers who come to save and be saved know the joy of that note which goes from lip to lip as it echoes and re-echoes in thirty languages yet with the one word of throbbing joy land land america end of chapter three the fellowship of the steerage Chapter 4 of On the Trail of the Immigrant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. On the Trail of the Immigrant by Edward Steiner. Chapter 4 Land Ho. 
the gay spirits soon flag when land is heralded for ellis island is ahead with its uncertainties and the men and women who were the merriest and who most often went to the bar thus trying to forget now are sober and reflect the troubled ones are usually marked by their restless walk and by their eagerness to seek the confidences of those who have tested the temper of the law of this unknown el dorado not long ago on one of the ships in which i sailed there was in the steerage a monk who neither walked nor talked like one he shunned me not because of my heresies but because of my latin and although he mumbled out of the prayer book and unskillfully counted his beads i knew that the devil a monk was he on the eve of the great day of landing he was pacing the deck evidently in an unreverential mood and i too was there being one of those who prefer the biting wind of the night to the polluted air of the steerage he came close to me as we walked and hesitatingly asked me in a french to which clung a peculiar dialect never spoken in monasteries whether i had been in america before when i replied in the affirmative he inquired all about the examination of baggage and of men and when i told him how strict it is that nothing is hid from the lynx eyes of the custom-house officials and that nothing is sacred to them not even the body of a monk he grew visibly excited stealthily he drew from under the folds of his cassock a stone a large brilliant tempting diamond and said you may have that as I took it between my fingers, I detected traces of the torn rim of its setting, and passed it back into the trembling hand of his reverence. "'You needn't be afraid of that,' he said. "'I am one of the monks driven out of France, and I am taking the treasures of the Brotherhood over. I am afraid of the high duty, and it will be cheaper for me to give you that diamond, which is a pendant from the jewels of the Virgin, than to pay for what I have, that is, if you will help me pass this little bag safely in.' With this he drew aside his cassock, and fumbling in the folds, brought to light a little bag which he would have handed to me, but I assured him that I was not a smuggler even for pious purposes, and after darting at me an impious glance, he disappeared into the steerage. The next day at quarantine, a messenger boy of unusual size came on board, and calling out the names of a rather large number of steerage passengers, handed them telegrams which were written in English and were rather suspiciously vague. Pavel Motikska, Ivan Kovalov, Isaac Goldberg, and last, Jacques Rosenstein. My friend the monk nearly jumped out of his cassock to reach for his message, and the boy, who made most remarkable haste for the telegraph messenger, slipped a pair of handcuffs where only rosaries hung, and a Jewish jeweler's clerk from Paris, who was running away with the best part of his employer's diamonds, was in the toils of the law. Some years ago, when the steerage of the Hamburg American line had not been made even partially decent by our stringent immigration laws, over 500 steerage passengers, booked for the first Bismarck, at that time the swiftest boat of the line, were, without explanation or notification, stowed away in the freight boat scheduled to cross in 12 days, but never having actually made the trip in less than 16 days. The quarters were very close, but the number of passengers was not excessively large, the weather was favorable, and blissfully ignorant of the slowness of the ship, we were comparatively happy. We were divided about equally into Russian Jews, Slavs, and Italians, and there was very little choice so far as comradeship was concerned. The passengers were all fairly dirty, the Italians being easily in the lead, with the Russian Jews a good second, and the Slavs as clean as circumstances allowed. The Italians were from the south of Italy, and had lost the romance of their native land, but not the fragrance of the garlic. They quarreled somewhat loudly, and gesticulated wildly, but were good neighbors during those sixteen days. They were shy, and not easily lured into confidences by one who knew their language but poorly, in spite of the fact that he knew their country well and loved it. In sixteen days the average American has a chance to discover at least one thing which he has found it hard to believe, that all Italians are not alike, that they do not look alike, and that they are not all anarchists. When some relationship was established between us, and I had to serve as a link among the three races, we had a grand festa to which the Slavs contributed some guttural songs and clumsy dances, and the Italians sleight-of-hand performances, which made them appear still more uncanny to the Slavs. 
they also supplied a marionette theater of the punch and judy show variety and last but not least music from a hurdy-gurdy which played the dulcet notes of cavaliero rusticana and a dashing tune about margarita margarita signors and signorinas said pietro after he had played all the tunes of his limited repertoire i have the great honor of presenting to you the national anthem of the great american country to which we are traveling he turned the crank and out came the ragtime notes of tarara boom dier the last number on the program was a song by a russian jewess a woman whose beauty was marred by bleached hair which had grown rusty and by a complexion upon which rouge and powder had done their worst her voice which was strong rather than melodious had in it an element of artificiality evidently begotten on the stage she at once became the star among our entertainers and though her culture was superficial she was by far the best company for me her parents she told me had been well-to-do jews in a market town in russia they had broken away from many of the observances and traditions of their religion they and their children followed all but the latest fashions a governess imported from france brought with her paul de Kock's novels and other elevating parisian literature music teachers came who discovered in the only daughter a voice which of course had to be cultivated in vienna there were concerts which the father's money arranged a few glowing press notices at so much a line and finally the fruitless struggle to appear in opera then came one of those anti-semitic riots those brutal outpourings of human hate which she was unable to describe all she could say over and over again was strashno strashno it was terrible terrible the house in which she lived was a wreck her father beaten to death and she she could not say it but i knew she told of women whose mutilated bodies were torn open and of children whose heads were beaten together until they were a bleeding mass yes indeed it was strashno strashno terrible terrible somewhat early in her girlhood a clerk in her father's store had looked upon her and loved her with a youth's ardor but she had scorned him as well she might scorn this uncultured stupid-looking son of abraham again and again he asked her to be his wife until through her entreaty her father drove him out of the store she told me much of her life and perhaps many things which she told me were not true i knew for instance that she had not sung before the czar of russia that hans Licht, the great musical critic of vienna did not predict for her a patty's fame and fortune nor did i believe that a young millionaire in berlin blew his brains out because she would not marry him but i did believe that the poor clerk went to new york that he had worked day and night in a sweatshop pressing cloaks that out of his earnings he had supported her in the vain struggle to attain grand opera and that now she was on her way to reward his faithfulness and become his wife what is it like this america what kind of life awaits one on the east side what social status has a cloak presser in new york what chance is there for one to reach the goal of grand opera these and other questions she hurled at me while the line upon the horizon grew clearer and the hearts of men and women heavy from expectation on this ship too susanka a slavic girl nursed her way across the atlantic giving food to a little magyar baby which she despised and while she rocked the restless little one to sleep and sang her slavic lullabies hi you hi you hi one could see in her heavy face her heart's hunger for her own child oh panny velovsky mighty sir my little child i had to leave it with a stara baba old woman and it was gray ashen gray when i left it and it will die it will die and she grew frantic in her grief as she rocked the magyar child to and fro hi you hi you hi you shki who was to blame susanka the look of pain changed to one of fiery anger as she sent back across the sea a curse long and terrible against her betrayer yes those are heavy hours and long on that day when the ship is circled by the welcoming gulls and the fire ship is passed while the chains rattle and the baggage is piled on the deck will they let me in senor why should they not antonio ah senor i have not always been a free man they held me in jail for four years will they know it in america i stabbed a man yes senor will they let us in guter herlabin 
anxiously asks young kev his wife gaitel and six children are with him and one of the boys lies motionless upon the hatch pale worn and almost gone consumption yes he was so well but we were smuggled over and driven by the gendarmes and had to be out in the damp and he caught cold and the cough came and you can see guter herlebin quick consumption Yankev and Geitel, his wife, had an appalling story to tell, and I listened to it as we squatted on the deck under the twinkling stars. The moon shone in silvery splendor upon the quiet water, and I wondered why the sea did not grow angry, the constellations pale, and why the moon did not become red like blood at the horror of it all, a horror which never can be told. Imagine an Easter night, a night when Yankev and Gaitel celebrated the liberation of Israel from Egyptian bondage. On the same night, their Russian neighbors were celebrating the liberation of the human race from the power of death. The synagogue service was over. They had told the story of Israel's passing through the Red Sea, and of the perishing of the Pharaoh's horsemen. Yankev had come home to the feast of unleavened bread and bitter herbs. The neighbors had been to the church where until midnight, in darkness and silence, they mourned at the tomb of the slain Christ. Then, with the passing of the long and silent night, they went from street to street, shouting, Christ is risen! Christ is risen! Christ is risen indeed! But the mob came upon the defenseless home, plundering and burning all in its fury, although mercifully sparing the lives of the now homeless and penniless family. Others fared worse, for they had no money with which to bribe, while their daughters were older and good to look upon. It was a little place and just a little pogrom. It was not written about nor protested against, but what would have been the use? Dumb from agony, we sat there, and I had to breathe back into them the faith which they had almost lost, and the courage which had almost left them, a faith and courage which I myself did not possess. In the peace of the night I could hear only the terror of the voice of the Lord, saying, Vengeance is mine! The gentle Nazarene who came in love to conquer by love I could scarcely see, and I yearned to make the psalmist's prayer my own. Blessed be the Lord God, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. That night, and many another last night on board of ship, I listened to the stories of men and women who were fleeing from the terror of Russia's law. Russians who had wrought in secret, who had planned great things, and who had risked everything. Bogdanov, Filipov, Lermontov, Lerman, Lowenstern, Jews and Gentiles who had struck out in their blind fury, who had felt the terror of the law and the greater terror of taking, or trying to take, human life. Some guilty, some innocent, all of them caught in the same net. Characteristic is the story of a Warsaw merchant who sailed with me on my last journey. On the evening of the 21st of April, 1906, he went to a dentist to have some work done. He went in the evening because he was busy in the daytime, and when he arrived, the police were searching the house, after which all the inmates, dentists and patients, were taken to the police station and cast into prison. Two hundred and fifty persons were together in a room large enough for twenty. The odors were frightful, as in common with all Russian prisons. There were no toilet conveniences outside of that room, in which for three days they were left. After bribing the officials, twenty fortunate men, my informant among them, were given another room. Nine weeks he remained there, utterly unconscious of the reason for his detention, and only after the hard and faithful struggle of his wife was he released, without an apology, to find his business ruined and only sufficient money left to go to America. On the same ship I met the widow of a Jewish physician who was shot down in the act of binding the wounds of those fallen in the uprising of Moscow, binding the wounds of soldiers and revolutionists alike. He was shot in the back by a police lieutenant who afterward was promoted to a captaincy. No, it is not easy to travel in the steerage, not because there is not room enough, nor air enough, nor food enough, although that is all true, but because it is hard to believe down there that the God of Israel is not dead, nor his arms shortened, if not broken, like those of the Greek deities. Yet they still have faith in him, these children of his, who have waited for the fulfillment of his promises. They still wait although Jerusalem the Golden is a faraway dream, and they are scattered wanderers over the face of the earth. 
friday night with the coming of the first star all those who believed met to voice their faith in jehovah in a corner of the steerage quarters while the eyes of the gentiles looked inquisitively on they turned towards zion and lifting up their voices greeted the sabbath come my beloved thou sabbath bride la hoch dodi le cras calo they sang this one joyous song of israel and stretched out their arms as if to press this spiritual bride to their rest hungry souls they do not doubt that jehovah will guide the destinies of israel and that the sabbath bride will some day descend upon the earth to abide forever bringing rest and peace to the israel of god at last the great heart of the ship has ceased its mighty throbbing and but a gentle tremor tells that its life has not all been spent in the battle with wind and waves the waters are of a quieter color and over them hovers the morning mist the silence of the early dawn is broken only by the sound of deep-chested ferry boats which pass into the mist and out of it like giant monsters stalking on their cross-beams over the deep the steerage is awake after its restless night and mutely awaits the disclosures of its own and the new world's secrets the sound of a booming gun is carried across the hidden space and faint touches of flame struggling through the gray are the sun's answer to the salute from governor's island the morning breeze like a dancing psaltress moves gently over the glassy surface of the water lifts the fog higher and higher tearing it into a thousand fleecy shreds and the far things have come near and the hidden things have been revealed the skyline straight ahead assaulted by a thousand towering shafts looking like a challenge to the strong and a warning to the weak makes all of us tremble from an unknown fear the steerage is still mute it looks to the left at the populous shore to the right at the green stretches of long island and again straight ahead at the mighty city slowly the ship glides into the harbor and when it passes under the shadow of the statue of liberty the silence is broken and a thousand hands are outstretched in greeting to this new divinity into whose keeping they now entrust themselves some day a great poet will arise among us who catching the inspiration of that moment will be able to put into words these surging emotions who will be great enough to feel beating against his own soul and give utterance to the thousand varying notes which are felt and never sounded on this very ship are women who have left the burdens which crippled them and now hope to walk erect who have fled through the rough polluting hands of persecuting mobs that they may be able to guard their virtue and have it guarded by gallant men here are hundreds of slavs who never knew aught but the yoke of czar or other potentate whose minds have been enthralled by a galling autocracy and whose closed eyes have never been permitted to see their own downtrodden strength now they shall have the opportunity to prove themselves and show the nobility of a peasant race here are italians from shores where classic art is stored and the air is soft and full of melody yet they were left uncouth rough and unhewn they come to a rougher but freer air that they may grow into a gentler stronger nobler manhood and womanhood melancholy jews whose feet never knew a safe abiding place are here and their hope is that they may find the peace which went out from their race when jerusalem was laid waste and they were scattered among the nations of the earth he who thinks that these people sent but the dollars which lie in our treasury is mightily mistaken and he who says that they come without ideals has no knowledge of the children of men i found myself close to hundreds of these people closest to the russian jews who most excited my sympathies and one day when they heard that i had been in bialystok kishniev and odessa that i knew the horror of it all and that i sympathized with them they crowded around me almost like wild animals what did they ask for above everything money no the one loud cry was for a speech about america preach to us they said preach to us about america it was a polyglot sermon which i preached that sunday from the covered hatch which was my pulpit and when i spoke to them of their new home and their new duties they cheered me to the echo i have passed through this gateway more than ten times i have sounded as far as a man can sound the souls of men and women and i have found them tingling from emotions akin only to those which we more prosperous voyagers shall feel when we have crossed the last sea and find ourselves in the presence of the great judge 
many of these immigrants expect to find more liberty more justice and more equitable law than we ourselves enjoy they imagine that one common life is permeated by a noble idealism and while they cannot give expression to their high anticipations they feel more loftily than we think them capable of feeling many a time i have heard conversations between those who had read about america and those who were ignorant of its life and invariably i have had to keep silence for had i spoken i must have destroyed blessed illusions from the very people who we call sabbath breakers i have heard glowing descriptions of an ideal american sabbath and from men to whom alcoholic beverages seemed essential to life i have heard a defense of laws regulating the sale of liquor if in our superficial touch with them in our own country we find them materialistic and dull to what we call our higher life they are not the only ones at fault cabin and steerage passengers alike soon find the poetry of the moment disturbed for the quarantine and custom house officials are on board driving away the tourists memories of the splendor of european capitals by their inquisitiveness as to his purchases they make him solemnly swear that he is not a smuggler and upon landing immediately proceed to prove that he is one the steerage passengers have before them more rigid examinations which may have vast consequences so in spite of the joyous note of the band and the glad greetings shouted to and fro they sink again into awestruck and confused silence when the last cabin passenger has disappeared from the dock the immigrants with their baggage are loaded into barges and taken to ellis island for their final examination end of chapter four land ho chapter five of on the trail of the immigrant this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. On the Trail of the Immigrant by Edward Steiner. Chapter 5. At the Gateway. The barges on which the immigrants are towed towards the island are of a somewhat antiquated pattern, and if I remember rightly have done service in the castle garden days, and before that some of them at least had done full service for excursion parties up and down Long Island Sound. The structure towards which we sail, and which gradually rises from the surrounding sea, is rather imposing, and impresses one by its utilitarian dignity and by its plainly expressed official character. With tickets fastened to our caps and to the dresses of the women, and with our own bills of lading in our trembling hands, we pass between rows of uniformed attendants and under the huge portal of the vast hall where the final judgment awaits us. We are cheered somewhat by the fact that assistance is promised to most of us by the agents of various national immigrant societies who seem both watchful and efficient mechanically and with quick movements we are examined for general physical defects and for the dreaded trachoma an eye disease the prevalence of which is greater in the imagination of some statisticians than it is on board immigrant vessels from here we pass into passageways made by iron railings in which only lately through the intervention of a humane official benches have been placed upon which closely crowded we await our passing before the inspectors already a sifting process has taken place and children who clung to their mother's skirts have disappeared families have been divided and those remaining intact cling to each other in a really tragic fear that they may share the fate of those previously examined a polish woman by my side has suddenly become aware that she has one child less clinging to her skirts and she implores me with agonizing cries to bring it back to her in a strange world at the very entrance to what is to be her home without the protection of her husband without any knowledge of the english language and with no one taking the trouble to explain to her the reason the child was snatched from her side somewhere it is bitterly crying for its mother and each is unconscious of the other's fate Gidi, moya shina where is my wife 
an old Slovak cries as he looks wildly about for her, whose physique was suspected of being below the normal, and who was passed on for further examination. A Russian youth, stalwart and strong, is separated from his household, which came together to settle in Dakota, but now he, the mainstay of the family, is gone, and they are perplexed and distracted. A little girl, scarcely five years of age, cries, Mitter, Mitter, ich will zu meiner Mitter gehen. She is there alone and uncomforted, surrounded by rough-looking men, while not far away her mother is working herself into hysterics because she must await in the detention room the supreme decision. A woman with three children has two of them taken from her because they are suspected of disease and found to be afflicted by trachoma. The mother also has the disease, but her husband, now an American citizen, comes to claim her and she passes in while the little ones are held in custody by the immigration authorities. One by one we pass the inspectors, we show our money and answer the questions, which are numerous and pertinent. The average immigrant obeys mechanically, his attitude towards the inspector being one of great respect. While the truth is not always told, many of the lies prepared prove both inefficient and unnecessary. On one of the boats, very recently, a number of young women were imported for immoral purposes, and each of them was supposed to be married to the attendant agent of a firm which conducts an international business. The young man, having announced himself as married to the woman accompanying him, was asked, Where were you married? In Paris. Who married you? Père Abelard. When were you married? The 15th of May. Were your wife's parents present? Yes. Next, the young woman was questioned and announced the marriage as having taken place in Brussels sometime in June and that she was an orphan. The case is very plain, and both will have to face the court of special inquiry. A young Jewish girl who really escaped the torment of some Russian persecutions conjured up in her mind a relative in New York whose name and address are not discovered, and the more she is questioned, the more she entangles herself in a network of lies. A dear old mother is held, because instead of the one son who awaits her, she has announced three or four sons residing here, and continued questioning more and more involves her in useless affirmation. The examination can be superficial at best, but the eye has been trained and discoveries are made here which seem rather remarkable. Four ways open to the immigrant after he passes the inspector. If he is destined for New York, he goes straightway down the stairs, and there his friends await him if he has any, and most of them have. If his journey takes him westward, and there the largest percentage goes, he enters a large, commodious hall to the right, where the money changers sit and the transportation companies have their offices. If he goes to the New England states, he turns to the left into a room which can scarcely hold those who go to the land of the pilgrims and Puritans. The fourth way is the hardest one and is taken by those who have received a ticket marked P.C., public charge, which sends the immigrant to the extreme left where an official sits in front of a barred gate behind which is the dreaded detention room. The decision one way or the other must be quickly made, and the immigrant finds himself in a jail-like room, often without knowing just why. There is not much time for explanation. Imagine a room filled by at least fifty people, many of them doomed to recross the terrible sea and to be landed upon strange territory, to find the way unattended to their obscure little village. When they arrive there, they are usually paupers with a stigma resting upon them, for were they not rejected in America? And why? Ah, who knows why? Let us pass through this room. Brother, why are you here? A stalwart, lettish peasant boy answers demurely, Because I haven't money enough. I had some money, and they stole it out of my father's pockets. The father and the boy have been marked by the inspector as likely to become a public charge because they had neither money in their pockets nor friends waiting for them. A matter of ten or twenty dollars is between these men and the fulfillment of all their desires. The court may be lenient, but the father is old and the boy young, and it is more than probable that they will both end their days on the rough Baltic, where society now is as turbulent as that northern sea. 
a servian peasant browned by the hot sun which shone upon the danubian plains where he lived edges up to me for he hears a familiar slavic note in my speech and he brings this bitter plaint how far i have travelled from budapest vienna berlin and hamburg i have spent all my money and now it looks as if i must go back must i go tell me the court will tell him to-morrow that he has passed the dreaded deadline is over fifty years of age not too well built used up by the hardships of his native country and that as he is likely to become a public charge he is marked for deportation he will be sent back to hamburg and how he will find his way home i do not know a german woman with three children is the next whom i notice she is at the point of a nervous breakdown she has a husband waiting for her she has over one hundred dollars but p c is marked on her slip so she must face the court which will admit her but she has a long twenty-four hours to wait and the strain is terrible she needs to be reassured and comforted two boys under ten years of age came unattended fine-looking boys over their heavy blue coats hung tickets with the mother's address how happy they were to be going to mother she had preceded them by several years to work out for herself and for them a new destiny on this side of the sea for on the other side life had been blighted by the unfaithfulness of her husband at last the hour came when she could send for her children how she watched their journeying and how anxious she was while they were on the sea they are on this ship and she is waiting for them behind the iron grating at the island crowds pour into the great hall past the physician towards the inspectors towards the great centre to the east and the west now she sees them the physician looks at their faces and bends low over their chests but instead of walking straight towards her they are turned aside with those suspected of contagious disease where are you from my boy russia one of the few real russian peasants whom i have met he measures five feet six inches is sound as an oak and having escaped through the cordons of gendarmes which separate his native country from the rest of the world came here to meet his brother who was at work in the coal mines near scranton pennsylvania what about your brother ah baron sir my brother they say was killed in the mines and they are afraid to let me in so i suppose i shall have to go back to russia and the big melancholy peasant cried like a baby buy this shirt from me baron i need money what's the matter with you why are you so unhappy you gay carefree romanian half slav half latin and the whole no one quite knows what he is dressed in a shepherd's garb a heavy sheepskin coat over him look here peigny sir this keeps me from going as a shepherd to the west and he shows me a lacerated breast on which a wolf has written the shepherd's story of his faithfulness to the sheep yes the wolves came around and round my sheep he says and i went round and round between the sheep and the wolves and the nearer they came the faster i went my rounds between them but before the morning came they tore many sheep though they tore me first i bled and bled and have remained sore as you see a younger shepherd took my place and i sold all and spent all to come here ah well i could still guard sheep the most melancholy of all men are the detained jews for they usually have strong family ties which already bind them to this new world and they chafe under the delay their children or friends are waiting impatiently crowding beyond their allotted limit trying the severely taxed patience of the officials asking useless questions and wasting precious time in waiting for the courts work their allotted tasks with dispatch but with care and dignity and all must wait in deep uncertainty through the long vigil of a restless night spent on the clean but not too comfortable bunks provided by the government let no one believe that landing on the shores of the land of the free and the home of the brave is a pleasant experience it is a hard harsh fact surrounded by the grinding machinery of the law which sifts picks and chooses admitting the fit and excluding the weak and helpless much ignorance needs to be dispelled regarding these immigrants not long ago i heard one of the secretaries of a certain home missionary society say with much unction as he pleaded for money for his work we land annually on these shores a million paupers and criminals 
unfortunately much of this impression prevails it was my privilege recently as a member of the national conference on immigration to be among the guests of the commissioner of the port of new york and one of the spectacles which we witnessed was the landing of a shipload of immigrants we stood in the visitors gallery and looked down upon a hall divided and subdivided by the cold iron railings many of the visitors were beginning to hold their noses in anticipation of the stenches which would come with these foreigners and were ready to be shocked by the horrors of the steerage slowly the bewildered mass came into view but strange to relate those who led the mass appeared like ladies and gentlemen the women wore modern half-acre hats a little worse for wear but bought in the city of prague a few months before and they were more becoming to these young bohemian women than to the majority of their american sisters the men carried bandboxes silk umbrellas and walking canes the remnants of past glories they were permitted to come in first because they wore good clothing and passed out quickly into their freedom the members of our congress welcoming them heartily by the clapping of hands after them came slavic women with no finery except their homespun rough tough and clean carrying upon their backs piles of feather beds and household utensils strong-limbed men followed them in the picturesque garb of their native villages slovaks poles romanians rutheranians italians and finally russian jews but lo and behold no smells ascended to our nostrils and no horrors were disclosed taking a group of delegates down among them we found that they were wholesome-looking people not devoid of intelligence and when the barrier between us was broken down by the sound of their native speech they were communicative at least and very human the first time i entered new york was at castle garden from the steamer fulda twenty years ago and having watched the tide of immigration ever since i can say that i never have seen at any time a shipload of better human beings disembarked than those which came from the steamer wilhelm ii on december seventh nineteen o five and of the many who came on this ship it is just possible that those who wore neither fashionable hats nor trailing skirts and who were not politely treated it is just possible that they may after all make the best members of this democratic society a gentleman from ohio a member of the conference on immigration said on the floor in open debate and he said it with menacing gesture Quote, we don't want you to send none of them yellow worms from southern europe to our state we got too many of them now End quote. no doubt the gentleman from ohio and the delegate from rhode island who said quote, we don't want no more of them dirty furriners in this grand and glorious country of iron End quote, voiced the common prejudice which rests itself entirely upon its ignorance it is true that many criminals come especially from italy many weak impoverished and poorly developed creatures come from among polish and russian jews but they are only the tares in the wheat the stock as a whole is physically sound it is crude common peasant stock not the dregs of society but its basis its blood is not blue but it is red wholesomely red which is more to the purpose blue blood we also receive thin worn-out blood bought at a high price for the daughters of some of our multimillionaires but no one can claim that either they or we have been specially blessed by it the hardships which attend the examination and deportation of immigrants seems unavoidable and would not be materially reduced if any other method were devised to examine them at the centers of immigration seems a rather vague and not a feasible plan first of all because the immigrant can present himself as physically fit more easily in his native country where the agencies already exist to prepare him for an examination which most steamship companies rigidly enforce because the long journey makes artificial cleansing of diseased eyelids or the hiding of other physical defects impossible again because of the fact that such commissions would be hard to control so far from home and would be in constant danger of exposure to graft a disease not unknown among american officials at home and abroad the next reason is that these countries might object to the presence of such alien commissions which would select the best material and leave the worst and the last reason is that it would give foreign governments a very fine opportunity to detain those who immigrate for political reasons or those who desire to avoid service in the army 
much greater responsibility should be put upon the steamship companies many of which still practice their ancient wrongs upon the most profitable passengers one of the demands which should be made and made immediately is the abolition of the steerage future american citizens should be taught when they step on board of ship that people in america are expected to live like human beings and not like beasts the price they pay for the passage is large enough to entitle them to better treatment and if it is not then the price should be raised to such a figure as to permit it this humane treatment should follow the passenger until the last moment of his stay under government supervision for the more humanely the immigrant is treated the better citizen he is likely to become the steerage is responsible for not a little imported anarchy and the sooner it is abolished the better the more humanely the immigrant is treated at ellis island the more humanely he will deal with us when he becomes the master of our national destiny End of chapter 5 At the Gateway Chapter 6 of On the Trail of the Immigrant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana on the trail of the immigrant by edward steiner chapter six the man at the gate what questions will he ask how much money will he take will he deal gently with us these are the questions which pass from lip to lip among those detained for the subjects of the czar speak of the state in the personal pronoun in fact the state is scarcely known in their vocabulary it is the person of the ruler which they know and which they fear more than they revere the state they have known was to them very personal but to the new state they are just so much human freight which needs to be inspected in the past this has been done not only impersonally but inhumanely as well and that it is now done more humanely and justly so far as possible we owe to the man at the gate he passed through the gate himself in the old castle garden days when not much system prevailed when boarding housekeepers were let loose upon us frightening us half out of our senses and completely out of our change his dollars were few but like the average immigrant of today he possessed a buoyant spirit a strong body keen wits and bright eyes out of which shone good nature and the spirit of the mischievous boy he was admitted without difficulty and drifted into pennsylvania where he shared the lot of the miner his labor and his dangers the miners then were recruited from the strongest immigrant stock and when they felt themselves strong enough to organize he became one of the leaders the fact that he led many a rescue party to save his entombed comrades and that he displayed courage and intelligence brought him into prominence and the governor of pennsylvania chose him as state factory inspector in this position he made enemies enough among the employers to prove that he was faithful to the task set before him which was to enforce the laws regulating the conditions of labor in workshops and factories later he was appointed inspector at ellis island at a time when the condition of that federal post was anything but pleasing to those of us who knew them and who were concerned for the well-being of the immigrant roughness cursing intimidation and a mild form of blackmail prevailed to such a degree as to be common the commissioner in charge at that time was far above all this and though made conscious of the conditions was seemingly powerless to discharge dishonest employees or in any way improve the morale of the place the new spirit had not yet come into politics and the spoils still belonged to the victors who made full use of the privilege among those who did their full duty and smarted under the wrong done to this weak and helpless mass was the once immigrant now inspector the conditions steadily grew worse at least the complaints grew more numerous experiences like my own were not rare i knew that the money changers were crooked so i passed a twenty mark piece to one of them for exchange and was cheated out of nearly seventy five per cent of my money my change was largely composed of new pennies whose brightness was well calculated to deceive any newcomer 
at another time i was approached by an inspector who in a very friendly way intimated that i might have difficulty in being permitted to land and that money judiciously placed might accomplish something a bohemian girl whose acquaintance i had made on the steamer came to me with tears in her eyes and told me that one of the inspectors had promised to pass her quickly if she would promise to meet him at a certain hotel in heartbroken tones she asked do i look like that the concessions were in the hands of irresponsible people and i remember the time when the restaurant was a den of thieves in which the immigrant was robbed by the proprietor whose employees stole from him and from the immigrant also my complaints when i made them were treated with the same neglect as were those of others until with the coming of the roosevelt administration they had their resurrection a change was demanded and the demand satisfied Mr. William Williams, who was just back from Cuba, where he had rendered distinguished service, and who had come under the notice of the President, was tendered the office of Commissioner of Immigration at Ellis Island. Upon his acceptance, the President's instructions were to clean out the stables. A large measure of reform was inaugurated during the two and a half years of Mr. Williams' incumbency of this office in looking for a successor the president consulted the records evidently with the purpose of discovering one thoroughly conversant with the conditions and of experience coupled with executive ability sufficient to further extend the needed reforms mr robert watchhorn was chosen for this important office this official announcement in relation to the appointment appeared in the daily press at this time washington january sixteenth nineteen o five quote Robert Watchhorn will succeed William Williams as United States Commissioner of Immigration at New York. The appointment will be solely on merit. Mr. Watchhorn is now United States Commissioner of Immigration at Montreal. He has been in the Immigration Service for many years, and his record is perfect. End quote. I ventured to ask the Commissioner one day if he had been given any instructions by the President as to the course to be pursued. He replied, yes the president gave me instructions very brief but very pointed mr watchhorn i am sending you to ellis island you will find it a very difficult place to manage i know you are familiar with the conditions all i ask of you is that you give us an administration as clean as a hound's tooth should one desire any further evidence that ellis island is a difficult place to manage let him turn to this incident and its sequel in senator hoare's autobiography of seventy years scribner's quote during the christmas holidays of nineteen o one a very well-known syrian a man of high standing and character came into my son's office and told him this story a neighbor and a countryman of his had a few years before emigrated to the united states and established himself in worcester soon afterwards he formally declared his intention of becoming an american citizen after a while he amassed a little money and sent to his wife whom he had left in syria the necessary funds to convey her and their little girl and boy to worcester she sold her furniture and whatever other belongings she had and went across europe to france where they sailed from one of the northern ports on a german steamer for new york upon their arrival at new york it appeared that the children had contracted a disease of the eyelids which the doctors of the immigration bureau declared to be trachoma which is contagious and in adults incurable it was ordered that the mother might land but that the children must be sent back in the ship upon which they arrived on the following thursday this would have resulted in sending them back as paupers as the steamship company compelled to take them as passengers free of charge would have given them only such food as was left by the sailors and would have dumped them out in france to starve or get back as beggars to syria the suggestion that the mother might land was only a cruel mockery joseph j george a worthy citizen of worcester brought the facts of the case to the attention of my son who in turn brought them to my attention my son had meanwhile advised that a bond be offered to the immigration authorities to save them harmless from any trouble on account of the children i certified these facts to the authorities and received a statement in reply that the law was peremptory and that it required that the children be sent home that trouble had come from making like exceptions theretofore that the government hospitals were full of similar cases and the authorities must enforce the law strictly in the future 
thereupon i addressed a telegram to the immigration bureau at washington but received an answer that nothing could be done for the children then i telegraphed the facts to senator lodge who went in person to the treasury department but could get no more favorable reply senator lodge's telegram announcing their refusal was received in worcester tuesday evening and repeated to me in boston just as i was about to deliver an address before the catholic college there it was too late to do anything that night early wednesday morning the day before the children were to sail when they were already on the ship i sent the following dispatch to president roosevelt Quote, to the president white house washington d c i appeal to your clear understanding and kind and brave heart to interpose your authority to prevent an outrage which will dishonor the country and create a foul blot on the american flag a neighbor of mine in worcester massachusetts a syrian by birth made some time ago his public declaration for citizenship he is an honest hard-working and every way respectable man his wife with two small children have reached new york he sent out the money to pay their passage the children contracted a disorder of the eyes on the ship the treasury authorities say that the mother may land but the children cannot and they are to be sent back thursday ample bond has been offered and will be furnished to save the government and everybody from injury or loss i do not think such a thing ought to happen under your administration unless you personally decide that the case is without remedy i am told the authorities say they have been too easy heretofore and must draw the line now that shows they admit the powers to make exceptions in proper cases surely an exception should be made in case of little children of a man lawfully here and who has duly and in good faith declared his intention to become a citizen the immigration law was never intended to repeal any part of the naturalization laws which provide that the minor children get all the rights of the father as to citizenship my son knows the friends of this man personally and that they are highly respectable and well off if our laws require this cruelty it is time for a revolution and you are just the man to head it george f hoare end quote half an hour from the receipt of that dispatch at the white house wednesday forenoon theodore roosevelt president of the united states sent a peremptory order to new york to let the children come in they have entirely recovered from the disorder of the eyes which turned out not to be contagious but only caused by the glare of the water or the hardships of the voyage the children are fair-haired with blue eyes and of great personal beauty and would be exhibited with pride by any american mother when the president came to worcester he expressed a desire to see the children they came to meet him at my house dressed up in their best and glorious to behold the president was very much interested in them and said when what he had done was repeated in his presence that he was just beginning to get angry the result of this incident was that i had a good many similar applications for relief in behalf of immigrants coming in with contagious diseases some of them were meritorious and others untrustworthy in the december session of nineteen o two i procured the following amendment to be inserted in the immigration law Quote, whenever an alien shall have taken up his permanent residence in this country and shall have filed his preliminary declaration to become a citizen and thereafter shall send for his wife and minor children to join him if said wife or either of said children shall be found to be affected with any contagious disorder and it seems that said disorder was contracted on board the ship in which they came such wife or children shall be held under such regulations as the secretary of the treasury shall prescribe until it shall be determined whether the disorder will be easily curable or whether they can be permitted to land without danger to other persons and they shall not be deported until such facts have been ascertained End quote. senator hoare had touched however only one of the many phases of the situation as the president said it was still a difficult place yet under commissioner watchhorn changes were soon visible the place became cleaner a new and better system of inspection was organized discipline was maintained and strengthened the comfort of the immigrants was considered the money changers were watched dishonest discourteous and useless employees were discharged and above all the institution in its remotest corner was open to any one who wished to come and inspect the place which is so important in our economic and social life 
heartier welcome than the commissioner gives to the visitor cannot be imagined and you may take your place among the dozen or more who come and who are watching him as he decides the destinies of human lives the cases which come before him are those upon which the special courts have already passed so you will see only the wreckage of humanity those who upon landing are barred by the law which is indefinite enough to leave the way open to human judgment for good or ill two undersized old people stand before him they are hungarian jews whose children have preceded them here and who being fairly comfortable have sent for their parents that they may spend the rest of their lives together the questions asked through an interpreter are pertinent and much the same as those already asked by the court which has decided upon their deportation the commissioner rules that the children be put under a sufficient bond to guarantee that this aged couple shall not become a burden to the public and consequently they will be admitted a russian jew and his son are called next the father is a pitiable-looking object his large head rests upon a small emaciated body the eyes speak of premature loss of power and are listless worn out by the study of the talmud the graveyard of israel's history beside him stands a stalwart son neatly attired in the uniform of a russian college student his face is russian rather than jewish intelligent rather than shrewd materialistic rather than spiritual ask them why they came the commissioner says rather abruptly the answer is we had to what was his business in russia a tailor how much did he earn a week ten to twelve roubles what did the son do he went to school who supported him the father what do they expect to do in america work have they any relatives yes a son and a brother what does he do he is a tailor how much does he earn twelve dollars a week has he a family wife and four children ask them whether they are willing to be separated the father to go back and the son to remain here they look at each other no emotion as yet visible the question came too suddenly then something in the background of their feelings moves and the father used to self-denial through his life says quietly without pathos and yet tragically of course and the son says after casting his eyes to the ground ashamed to look his father in the face of course and the one shall be taken and the other left for this was their judgment day the next case is that of an englishman fifty-four years of age to whom the court of inquiry has refused admission he is a medium-sized man who betrays the englishman as he stands before the commissioner and in a strong cockney dialect begins the conversation in which he is immediately checked by the somewhat brusque question what did you do in england i was an insurance agent how much did you earn four pounds a week why do you come to america because i want to change how much change that is how much money have you forty dollars what do you expect to do here work at anything at insurance yes the decision of the court is confirmed deported because likely to become a public charge evidently insurance agents are not regarded as desirable immigrants the next case is a sickly-looking Russian Jew over forty years of age, with an impediment in his speech and physically depleted. He is guaranteed an immediate earning of ten dollars a week. The commissioner turns towards his visitors and asks, What would you do in this case? The answers differ, the majority favoring his admission. Although he values our judgment, the commissioner is compelled to confirm the decision of the court. It is all done quickly, firmly, and decisively, as a physician, conscious of his skill, might sever a limb. But it is done without prejudice. He knows no nationality nor race. His business is to guard the interests of his country, guarding at the same time the rights of the stranger. Work of this kind cannot be done without friction, for intense suffering follows many of his decisions. Yet I have found no one closely acquainted with the affairs of the island who did not regard the man at the gate as the right man in the right place. It is interesting to follow him on one of his rounds, for he watches closely the workings of his huge machine. Why don't you let those people sit down? 
a long line of italians had been standing closely crowded against each other when they should have been seated to await their turn open that box he says to a lunch counter man who forthwith opens box after box containing luncheons bought by the immigrants as they were starting westward boxes containing rations enough for a day or two according to the length of the journey undertaken out upon the roof shaded protected and guarded are many who still await the decision of the court little children who came all alone and who often wait for their parents in vain wives whose husbands have not yet come as they promised they would a promiscuous company of unhappy mortals of various degrees one child a little girl sees her father far away among those who come to claim their loved ones but the law still holds the child and she cries tata tata laban and he calls back to her but his voice is caught by the wind and the man at the gate has to be the comforter for a season and no one knows how long it may be before her own father will comfort her a blind old woman here awaits tidings from her son that she may be speeded on towards her destination and when she hears his voice demands to know just when she may go and she too draws on the sympathies of the man at the gate we follow him into a room which harbors some eight or ten young women marked for deportation they are gaily attired and betray at a glance that they belong to the guild of the daughters of the street they claim to have come to america for all sorts of purposes but they were caught with the men who imported them members of a firm whose business is to supply the new york market with human flesh they know neither shame nor remorse it is all crushed out of them and they brazenly demand to know just when they may go into new york to begin their careers america will be none the worse for their speedy departure we have seen the lame the halt and the blind and one is apt to think that they represent the normal type of immigrants while they are really but a small fraction of the mass which is strong young industrious and virtuous and which makes of the man at the gate an optimist he does not share the feeling that the immigration of today is worse than that of the past in fact he will say quite freely that it is growing better every day he has his fears and forebodings but he knows that the miracle of transformation wrought on us can still be wrought on this mass which is just like us in that it is like clay in the hands of the potter which may be molded just as millions of us have been molded into the likeness of a new humanity the danger he does not hesitate to say lies less in the clay than in the potter the visit over we take the little boat for the battery crowding through a mass of men who look up to the guarded roof where their loved ones are detained tata tata laban comes the painful cry of the little children and one envies the man at the gate who on the morrow may answer these cries and give the children to their fathers and the wives to their husbands who may unite those who have been divided by long years and a wide sea but what if he cannot answer the cry of the children the man at the gate need not be envied for the hard daily task which awaits him the task of opening or shutting the gates of saying this one shall be taken and the other shall be left clear and vivid before his eyes constantly stands the law commanding him on his allegiance to refuse admission not merely to those physically or morally tainted in such degrees as to endanger the nation's life but to those persons likely to become a public charge he is not responsible for the law he is responsible for its execution even though his decisions sometimes are not less hard for himself than for those who find the gates shut against them it requires a buoyant spirit a steady hand a tender heart and a resolute mind he must be both just and kind show no preferences and no prejudices guard the interests of his country and yet be humane to the stranger to be able to say of the man at the gate that he accomplishes this in a very large measure is not scant praise and if here and there his judgment is questioned it simply proves that he is as human as his critics end of chapter six the man at the gate chapter seven of on the trail of the immigrant this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. 
on the trail of the immigrant by edward steiner chapter seven the german in america the past had its apprehensions about the various problems no less than the present has and our forefathers looked upon the non-english speaking immigrants much as we look upon them today no doubt they spoke of them as an undesirable class many of us remember when the german and the scandinavian immigrants who came received no heartier welcome than we now give the slav the italian and the jew this large tide of immigration from among our non-english speaking races had its beginning long before there was a castle garden or ellis island and shortly after the pilgrims and puritans laid the foundations for their colonies at plymouth and massachusetts bay upon the path made by english quakers came in sixteen eighty two the first german immigrants they were mennonites a protestant sect which manifested in its tenets many of the faults and virtues of both quakers and puritans they sailed up the shallow delaware bay where a pen who was mightier than the sword had subdued the savages by his gentle spirit and had made the flat shores peaceful for the habitation of these strangers they settled in what is now called germantown and soon their little cottages were surrounded by gardens where the rosemary wafted its fragrance on the air and where no doubt the cabbage lifted its astonished head above the ground little dreaming that some day it would be the monarch of all it surveyed in some points these germans out puritan the puritans for while it is said that the puritans did not kiss their wife on the sabbath these german puritans did not kiss their wives at all that they brought with them noble ideals is proved by the fact that they were the first people on this continent to oppose slavery and sent to the quakers a petition to that effect it contains the following quaint paragraph quote, if once these slaves which they say are so wicked and stubborn men should joint themselves fight for their freedom and handle their masters and maistresses as they did handle them before will these masters and maistresses tackle the sword at hand and war against these poor slaves like we are able to believe some will not refuse to do or have these niggers not as much right to fight for their freedom as you have to keep them slaves the germans were also the first among us to legislate against the vice of intemperance and may be said to be the first prohibitionists a fame which the modern german immigrant does not care to share with them one of the most ideal men of this time was francis daniel pastorius a man who combined in himself all the graces and virtues of his noble race he was a lover of science and the finer pleasures and was a mystic who yearned for the closer communion with god pietists tunkers and others followed the mennonites in the eighteenth century and pennsylvania was soon dotted by communities in which these strangely garbed people lived their peculiar and simple lives to name them all would require much space and to describe their peculiarities would fill a book the schwenkfelders the moravians and the amish were the most important among the later arrivals and germany seemed to have exhausted her ability to produce sects after their departure encouraged by good queen anne lutherans and roman catholics came later and these were neither so pious nor so intelligent as their predecessors but were the advance guard of that vast horde of peasantry which ceased not its coming for nearly two centuries which moved from pennsylvania to ohio from there southward along the mississippi to louisiana and northward to wisconsin and minnesota and which was a great factor in redeeming the wilderness and making it blossom as a rose thousands of these peasants were sold into a semi-slavery as redemptionists and thousands more laid down their lives in the attempt to blaze paths through the forest and make the fever-stricken plains habitable wherever they went they created wealth by their unremitting industry and by their skill in cattle raising and farming so that where an english-speaking farmer starved and was forced to move westward they stayed and dug riches out of the neglected soil Today, in traveling through this country, one can almost invariably detect the German farm, and the German farmer is everywhere the standard of excellence. These immigrants were not idealists like their forefathers, but were content to worship God as did their fathers, and by the honest sweat of their brows eat the fruit from their own vine and fig tree. 
in eighteen forty eight when the breath of freedom grew into a windstorm there came involuntary immigrants political exiles of whom the late carl schurz is the best known if not the best example they were all educated men many of them real scholars and whatever german culture there is among the germans to-day in our cities is in a large measure due to their influence and example they and their descendants are our real german aristocracy and in the german centers of cincinnati and milwaukee they form the select society while these men were idealists politically they were in a large degree materialists religiously and planted the seed of marxism socialism and of infidelity among their countrymen one whole colony in minnesota made it one of its tenets not to have a church or even to mention the name of god and the little city of new ulm bore that distinction for a great many years but in spite of the most diligent efforts to keep god and the churches out of their town several houses of worship have been built in late years while much skepticism still prevails the younger generation almost as a whole has turned to its god the modern german immigrant comes pressed neither by hunger nor by his conscience but most often to escape irksome military service or drawn by the german wanderlust which carries him beyond the mountains of his fatherland into all corners of the earth although emigration from germany increases and decreases as the economic times are good or bad on board ship he is the jolliest of passengers and you will find him at the bar in the morning for his beer and late at night in the smoke-room with a crowd of jovial men and women singing the songs of the fatherland which grow sadder as he grows jollier he carries with him an exalted opinion of his own country and has fully made up his mind not to let anything crowd out his love for it so that when new york harbor with its vastness and beauty rises before him he insists that it is not half as big or as beautiful as the harbor at hamburg and only at the sight of the skyscrapers does he acknowledge our superiority i once stood before mighty niagara with one of these subjects of kaiser wilhelm and with a deprecating shrug of his shoulders he said we got them in germany too this attitude towards our country lasts a long time and is lost only when success comes the german immigrant invariably has a good common school education although not always possessed of culture and if he has it he does not find much of it among those with whom his lot is cast a young chemist whom i met grew so despondent at the sight of his german boarding-house and at the lack of manners among the boarders that he returned to germany two weeks after he had landed not many such young men come and few of such who come succeed for the hustle and bustle the common tasks to be performed and the common people whom they must meet as equals repel them the weaning from aristocratic notions the being thrown into the hopper without being asked who are you and who are your parents are painful processes and only the fit survive although the process is slow it is sure a young man who has come to this country to study our way of doing business was employed in a large department store in chicago as a bundle boy at first he politely addressed the elevator man thus will you please let me off on the second floor but within two months he said imperatively second and he was on the road towards complete americanization the city of milwaukee is probably the most german city in the united states although nothing in its business or residence portion suggests the germany across the sea and with sixty per cent of its population german it is not impressed upon the city the best things which we usually associate with that nationality the intellectual life of its people does not receive that stimulus which one might expect and whatever german culture there is outside of the ever-diminishing circle of the forty-eighters has been transplanted by americans who have traveled and studied in the fatherland the few germans who try to bring the germany of america in touch with its glorious heritage across the sea usually fail most miserably the cry i most often heard from them was the idealists are dead and the dollar reigns supreme with a few exceptions neither the german stage nor the german newspaper have been able to keep alive that intellectual spirit and as a rule the german population falls below the american in its desire to keep in touch with the intellectual life of germany 
we have two kinds of germans in milwaukee soul germans and stomach germans and the latter are in the vast majority said a keen observer and it does seem that the national spirit rallies around social usages rather than around the things which make germany a world power in the noblest sense the editors upon whom i called were all intent upon telling me how great their papers were and how many subscribers they had and i could not go beyond the business point with any of them although i wasted two hours upon one trying to get a glimpse of his german soul but if i saw it at all it had the american dollar mark written all over it upon the social side the german is abnormally developed and to be a good fellow is to him a high ideal he usually belongs to numberless lodges and societies in few of which he receives any intellectual stimulus he retains his convivial habits and frequents the saloon but is seldom intemperate although the american treating habit often works havoc with his frugality that i have not misjudged the situation is proved by the fact that similar conclusions have been reached by eminent german scholars who have recently visited the united states Professor K. Lamprech of the University of Leipzig, who has recently published his notes under the title Americana, says, quote, Have the Germans done much besides having a large share in making the soil tillable? A visit to the great cities such as Chicago and Milwaukee compels to the sad answer, no. The Germans, capable as they are in their separate and narrower activities, have not held together and have been overcome by others, overcome to the degree that they still make the stupid Dutchman the target for their jokes. One need only to see the part he plays in the American farce to be convinced of this. He is the man who is always too late, who always wants much and at last gets but little, and who, in spite of the fact that he is portrayed as good-natured, is laughed at. This caricature tells some truth and is the product of some observation. Intellectually, he does not stand very high. The Negro also learns reading and writing, but in intense thinking he is outdistanced by the Englishman and presumably by the Slav also. Whoever has visited the beer gardens of Milwaukee, especially the unfortunate Pabst Park, that pattern of stupidity, must say to himself that a people which enjoys such things as are here offered is not capable of intellectual competition in America. Still sadder is the lack of political discernment. One need not speak of the corrupt conditions of American politics. If the Germans had really had the desire, they could greatly have improved the political morals of the United States. That they did not use this opportunity is due largely to the fact that when the early German immigrants came to us, their country was not politically ripe. Nevertheless, they may be accused of not having kept pace with the citizens of the mother country, who, under more difficult conditions, have reached a very high political development. The common people from whom our immigrants sprang now have large powers in directing the political well-being of the fatherland under less favorable conditions. This is also true in regard to the German intellectual development, with which the German-American has not kept in touch, and to which he is now very slowly awaking. End quote. Another thing which this vast German population has failed to impress upon our cities is the love of law and order which characterizes it in its native home, and almost without exception it stands arrayed against any attempt to curtail the privileges of the saloon, while lawmakers and officials are usually kept from enforcing existing laws by their fear of the German vote. One of the Milwaukee beer brewers with whom I talked in regard to his influence upon local politics naively said, Quote, no, we have no influence upon politics at all, but if a sheriff or a judge should try to enforce laws against our saloons, he would simply lose his head. End quote. The fact is that a certain phase of municipal life is completely controlled by the brewing interests in nearly every city where the German element plays a political part, and that element always rallies to the support and defense of the brewers. It is a strange but general experience that the German immigrant is immediately arrayed against the temperance element. This is due in no small measure to the facts that his first lodging place is usually connected with a saloon, that the German newspaper almost always ridicules temperance effort and misinterprets the motives of its leaders, and lastly that designing politicians make their slogan personal liberty synonymous with beer at any time and anywhere. 
only very recently a large portion of the german population of chicago was the leading element in a mass meeting in which over ten thousand people took part demanding the granting of special licenses to dance halls a precedent which would be as illegal as dangerous nevertheless the german is a law-abiding citizen although he has never been convinced that temperance laws are either wise or just and that in spite of the fact that his own fatherland is making strenuous efforts in that direction and that temperance societies are coming to be as numerous in germany as they are in america but much more sensible in their agitation than with us the average german comes willing enough to obey all the laws and if he has proper environment develops quickly into the best kind of citizen neither in milwaukee nor elsewhere did i find that the church whether lutheran or roman catholic had kept pace with the intellectual development of the home church nor has it come to feel its social responsibility to the community the german lutheran pastors in certain synods are often more exclusive than the catholic priests in their unwillingness to cooperate with other churches for the public good and while the churches in germany are the most progressive on the continent here they are the most conservative and correspondingly inactive in the affairs which move society certain synods of the lutheran church and those the most prosperous hold to the osberg confession more tenaciously than luther ever did and believe that beside that church there is no church and outside of that creed no salvation i attended a lutheran church one sunday evening when it was crowded largely by young people all of them wage earners in the lower walks of life the whole burden of the sermon of nearly forty-five minutes length was the thought that salvation is not in morality or merit or good deeds but that the only thing necessary to it is the proper definition of the nature of jesus christ there is not one ethical note in the whole sermon and if it is a fair sample of that man's discourses his flock of more than fifteen hundred souls is feeding upon barren pasture when i called upon a lutheran pastor who was pointed out to me as a liberal i found upon asking him to define his liberality that it turned entirely upon social habits and had nothing to do with theology i want to drink my beer whenever i want to was the article in his creed that had driven him into the arms of a more liberal synod among the germans of the northwest there is a good deal of infidelity fostered by the turner societies but they are languishing and dying and with them dies the unbelief i was told in milwaukee by a business man that the disappearance of those societies is due to the fact that men of affairs discovered that it was poor business policy to belong to them because it arrayed against them the conservative church element and that the cessation of infidel agitation is not a sign of more faith but simply a sign of more common sense one free-thinking paper is still published in milwaukee but its constituency is gradually growing smaller and the lectures on infidelity of whom there used to be many have dwindled to one or two they find it hard to make a living out of a thing that has no life yet the german immigrant contributes positive good to this nation's life he brings usually a sound body and while seldom intellectual he is nearly always intelligent he is scrupulously honest in business affairs and has elevated the business morals of his community by his love of music he has robbed the social life in america of some of its sternness and the german singing societies are known not so much for the artistic quality of their performance as for keeping alive the spirit of good fellowship unfortunately the german falls an easy prey to the prevailing materialistic spirit and when he worships mammon he becomes the most ardent of devotees then he has no time for his gesang varien nor for anything else which is not utilitarian and gelde machine the making of money is his great ideal in his home life he still emphasizes those virtues which have given inspiration to the german poet's best songs his wife is even in america the model hausfrau for quote, she looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness End quote. yet the woman's club has touched her also and the kaffeeklatsch 
with its innocent neighborhood gossip has given way to the formal reception and kindred social delusions the german has been the prime factor in dispelling the puritan idea of the sabbath which to many is a positive evil but may at least be considered a mixed good still he ought not to bear the blame alone for the average american was ready to have his sabbath broken for him and has easily followed into the breach just as it often takes four or five grown persons to escort one child to the circus so one may find four or five natives at every sunday baseball game helping the germans to amuse themselves the disintegrating process has also been stimulated by the american tourists who annually cross the ocean and who during their visits in continental europe leave much of the puritan spirit behind them too much for their own good and the good of their country the german has not largely contributed to the deepening of the religious life of the nation although wherever he enters the life of the church he makes its expression more honest the one thing which he hates desperately is hypocrisy and because of that he guards himself very jealously and seldom speaks of his religious experiences the german methodist and evangelical churches which are of the emotional type are not only failing to grow but are perceptibly becoming smaller this is to be deplored because they developed a somewhat deep if rather narrow christian character and strove to counteract the cold and more formal spirit of the majority of their brethren in other communions the german in america has not produced many great men but he has filled this country with good men which is infinitely better the cause of the dearth of prominent german americans is due to the fact that they blend more quickly than any other foreigner except the scandinavian with the nation's life especially if the german reaches any kind of eminence and the effect which he has upon the life of the nation is difficult to trace just because of that the coarse the crude and the low retain their national stamp while the finer and better soon become part of us some of us seem to know the german best and judge him most from the standpoint of the saloon and all it implies but i have almost always found him industrious intelligent honest frugal patriotic and god-fearing noble qualities for american citizenship if he has not risen to the highest which he is capable of reaching and if he does not exert his influence for the best in all directions it is not due to the fact that he is not willing to do it but because he could not rise much higher than the highest marked out for him by the native citizens or because he could not quite comprehend that this money-making materialistic yankee has ideals which he was trying honestly to realize if we misjudge the german he misjudges the american and rates him much lower than he deserves this has robbed him of a higher standard for himself and made him exaggerate our national weaknesses imitating which has created a peculiar combination of character which does scant justice to himself or to his american neighbor when he revisits his fatherland these weaknesses manifest themselves most and then his adopted fatherland comes in for a good share of the blame for his lack of manners the following incident illustrates this point in the lobby of a fashionable hotel in berlin a german american of this type was expectorating tobacco juice with the exactness and frequency of an adept to a german who called his attention to this nuisance he replied everybody does that in america he needs to know the american and value him as he deserves and he ought to know that which he does not seem to that the making of money is to the true american after all not the greatest of achievements that the hypocrisy with which he charges him in his religious life is less frequent than he thinks it is and that the national ideal is slowly but surely gaining ascendancy he ought also to know that more than any other foreigner he has impressed upon us both his strength and his weakness and that we are growing quite definitely teutonic it is for us to find out what this strength is and to appropriate it more and it is for him to grow conscious of his weakness and eliminate it from his social life that he may become indeed one of the strongest pillars of this republic which already like the coming kingdom is made up of every nation and kindred and tribe and people under heaven end of chapter seven the german in america Chapter 8 of On the Trail of the Immigrant. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. On the Trail of the Immigrant by Edward Steiner. Chapter 8 The Scandinavian Immigrant. The steerage of an English vessel on which the Scandinavian immigrant travels is not the forbidding place usually found on the steamers which sail from continental ports. The passengers have cabins assigned to them, their meals are served in human fashion, and the general appearance of everything is in keeping with that of the travelers who come from the best peasant stock of Europe. The Scandinavian peasants bear no taint of past slavery, and as far back as their saga reaches, they were freemen. When the new light which first shone at Wittenberg traveled northward, it found ready entrance into Swedish hearts, and Scandinavia has ever been the bulwark of Protestantism, so that wherever its story is written, the name of Gustav Adolphe has a prominent place. With scarcely any exception, the Scandinavian immigrant is a Protestant, a confessed adherent of some church, and in most cases an ardent worker and worshipper. Repeatedly, during services on shipboard, I have found that every Scandinavian present took an active interest in it, and on the Sabbath the number of Bible readers and students was astonishingly large. There is practically no illiteracy among them, and the steerage passenger who read nothing on his journey was an exception. The quality of the reading was also remarkable, for on one journey I counted among fifty books, nine of Sheldon's What Would Jesus Do?, and only fourteen novels of a purely secular character. The demeanor of the Scandinavian immigrant is quiet, unobtrusive, almost melancholy, and when he sings it is always in a minor key, his folk song having the dreaminess of the Orient, and being as far removed from the jig of his Irish fellow-traveller as the North is from the South. He is homesick from the time he steps on board of ship until he reaches his home, in the land where there is no more sea and the asylums of the northeast are full of scandinavian men and women who have sunk into hopeless melancholia because of homesickness yet in spite of this most of the immigrants remain in america and more than any other foreigner blend completely into the national life there is scarcely such a thing as a second generation of scandinavians although the first generation never loses its love and longing for fair scandia a great many who come know the english language or at least some words and being in touch here with a spirit which is as serious as their own it is no wonder that they remain and become merged in the national life not one who comes is a pauper although not a few are poor yet nearly all are rich in a heritage of health and character which unfortunately they do not always retain on this side of the atlantic in fact, it is proved that the second generation is weaker physically, and many of the older immigrants claim that it has lost much moral fiber also. This complaint, which I have heard from all foreigners about their descendants, is largely due to the natural tendency to overrate the past and to underrate the present. It is also true that the second generation undervalues the heritage which the parents brought with them from across the sea, and in not a few cases, because of that, it becomes morally and spiritually bankrupt. I have seldom seen Scandinavian immigrants of more than middle age, and most of them are young men and women between 18 and 36. Some remain in the large cities of the East where they are valued as servants, gardeners, and dairymen. More of them drift to Jamestown, New York, as mechanics, but the large majority of immigrants go to the Northwest, where they have been hewers of wood and drawers of water where they have turned the sod of far-stretching acres towards the sun, and where their cattle graze upon a thousand hills. They like the melancholy plains of the Dakotas, the cold winters remind them of their own far north, and if any strange country ever grows to them like home, it certainly is this hospitable region in whose mills and factories, beginning at Chicago and ending in the west, which each day comes nearer to the true east across the Pacific, they are toilers, skilled laborers, and trusted foremen. I have yet to find the shop where they are not liked, although their less industrious fellow workmen of other nationalities call them treacherous, a word which they themselves do not quite understand, but which means that the Scandinavians get ahead, 
and that is often cause enough to give them a bad name in all my dealings with them i have found them frank and generous and while playing farmer in order to know them better my fellow labourer has many a time hitched the horses for me or shovelled my portion of the corn and when he found that i was only a make-believe farmer did not betray my confidence with such experiences and with such high esteem of the scandinavian i joined a party of young swedes who were travelling from chicago to the northwest they were disgusted by that city by its moral and physical filth its noise and its few glimpses of god's heaven and i congratulated them upon going to minneapolis which i described in glowing terms as a clean and godly city in which an american population of new england descent combined with this wholesome scandinavian element in making a model city eager to have america shine to them in its very best light i offered myself as their guide through the city an offer which they readily accepted we had scarcely stepped out on the Union Depot before I wished that I had not said anything about the godliness of Minneapolis, for we were set upon by thugs, fakirs, and lewd women in such numbers and in such a disgusting manner that I thought for a moment I had struck the Bowery in its palmiest days. Dozens of squares around the depot and deep into the heart of the city were filled by brothels of the most disgraceful kind. Pictures were displayed in show windows and in the open porticos of museums, which would make a Paris street gammon blush, and the whole city seemed to be stricken by some fatal disease. Policemen were neither ornamental nor useful. City detectives were employed by gamblers to hustle the fleeced stranger out of town. The mayor, the sheriff, and who knows who else were in league with gamblers and thieves, while vice was everywhere rampant and did not even have to defy the law, for there was no law. Newspaper men whom I interviewed told me that Minneapolis was considered by traveling men the toughest town this side of Butte, Montana. Ministers said that they were helpless, and many told me that it was none of their or my business. Officials were paralyzed. The mayor was a fugitive from justice. The chief of police was about to be sent to the penitentiary for safekeeping, and all of them agreed that these conditions were in no small measure due to the Scandinavian population, which was not fitted for public responsibility. I had just come from Jamestown, New York, which has about the same population of Scandinavians, where they had elected a Swedish mayor who gave great satisfaction, where many offices were held by Swedes, and where I had heard no such complaints. In Minnesota generally, no taint attached itself to such Scandinavians as Newt Nelson, Lind, and others who had served in high offices in state and nation. Therefore, I was shocked, puzzled, and disappointed. I found the common verdict in Minnesota to be, we can't trust the Swedes in public offices. And the number of defaulting county and city treasurers of Scandinavian nationality, especially Swedish, who spent a few years in Stillwater prison, makes the generally accepted estimate of the high character of the Swede as a citizen waver not a little. If this estimate be true, it may be due, first of all, to the Swedish churches, which have not, as a rule, in common with a large share of the American churches, sufficiently emphasized the fact that, quote, righteousness exalteth a nation, end quote, and that it can become exalted only through a righteous citizenship. The Lutheran churches have been busy preaching doctrines and have been so eager to maintain the Osberg Confession that they have not laid much stress upon upholding the spirit of the Sermon on the Mount and all that it means for the kingdom of God. The Mission Friends, as a large body of Swedish Christians calls itself, has been so busy in common with Methodists and Baptists doing evangelizing work and building up its local church membership that it has forgotten that it has something to do with saving the state or the city the second cause may be ascribed to the clannish feeling fostered by cunning politicians which makes these people vote for a scandinavian no matter what his character is just because he is one of their own in this as in the first case i do not wish it to appear that the scandinavian is a sinner above all others but he has been remarkably unfortunate in the character of the officials whom he has chosen and it will take a great deal of repentance and general betterment to make the people of hennepin county unsuspicious of the scandinavian office-seeker the very worst thing in our national life 
the most corrupting thing in every way is this voting as scandinavians or hungarians and not as americans it amounts in many cases to a kind of treason and deserves to be treated as such the politicians and the political party which foster that sort of thing are in a small but very dangerous business which does more to hamper the american consciousness in the foreigner than any other thing i know of and is to-day the great poison which needs to be eliminated from the national life in nine cases out of ten the foreigner is made a scapegoat by designing politicians who give him a small office which pledges him to do an unfair and often dishonest thing in the northwest it has brought a stigma upon the swedes a bad reputation which they do not deserve and which they must throw off for their own good and for the good of the country the third and perhaps the best reason for this state of affairs is the fact that in common with other foreigners they have had a poor example set them by the americans minneapolis citizens were so busy making money that they did not realize that their city was in the hands of thieves and robbers who not only killed the body but cast many a soul into hell one is roused to anger by the disclosures of graft in st louis philadelphia and other cities too numerous to mention but when city officials like the mayor of the city and the chief of police both of them of good american stock are proved to be in league with gamblers and other immoral folk who corrupt the youth and destroy the trustful foreigners who come from farm and forest then one's indignation ought to know no bounds justly the swedes of minneapolis say Quote, the big rascals were americans supported by american voters many of them in christian churches and highly esteemed in business and social life End quote. nor can the contented citizen of that beautiful place take any satisfaction in the fact that some of the rascals were brought to justice and that the conditions have changed this miserable state of affairs might still exist if the aforesaid rascals had not quarreled with each other and finally destroyed themselves scarcely any one in minneapolis deserves the credit of having lifted his voice against it or raised a protest because of the encroachment of a vice which has no bounds and which can be made harmless only by being driven away for a city to give up its waterfront to palaces of shame where openly and defiantly women ply their fearful trade is poor business poor aesthetics poor ethics and poor christianity its encroachment upon the union depot where every stranger enters and its perfect freedom to obtrude itself is all poor politics as it certainly is a poor introduction to that beautiful city's life how much the foreigner is to blame i cannot tell but this is true that minneapolis has the best foreign element and of course some of the worst it has a vigorous earnest american population with a noble heritage and yet it has failed not only in making an all-around citizen of that foreigner but even in governing its own city and the usual excuses of an ignorant sabbath-breaking foreign element do not hold good here for the foreigner in minneapolis obeys the sunday law goes to church one church has over four thousand worshippers on sunday night is not ignorant or vicious and yet he is said to be a poor citizen after all the blame must fall largely upon those americans who have lost the backbone of the puritans and the vision of the pilgrims who feel little responsibility towards the great city problem and rest content with the fact that they live in parks that the saloon cannot encroach upon their dwellings and then are willing to let the rest go as it pleases and where it pleases if their pastors lift the prophetic voice they are fired even as savonarola was burned and it amounts to the same thing there is a perfect stream of new ministers who come and go and many go away broken in body and in spirit in the politics of the state the scandinavian has a well-deserved and honored place and the administration of governor johnson goes far to disprove any aspersions cast upon his people one of the most interesting communities in kansas is the swedish town of lindsberg where bethany college is located it has become an intellectual and musical center and its influence is as wholesome as it is large i am not defending the foreigner he has his faults and too often does not make the most of his great opportunity but he is as clay in the hands of the american who can make of him what he pleases in jamestown new york you have a strong american community with firm convictions and this same scandinavian becomes like it 
in minneapolis you have no such strong convictions of righteousness and you have a scandinavian population which men in authority say is unfit to exercise its citizenship our cities need to cultivate a twentieth century puritanism broad and deep intense yet sympathetic unyielding yet charitable and they will find that the most ready imitators will be the foreigners especially these scandinavians who were our kinsmen before they came here and who are ready to be our brothers and heirs of the same kingdom in everything which makes a strong people and a great state they have taken an active and conscientious part they are staunch supporters of the public schools their children finally become teachers and in every academy and university of the northwest the scandinavians are an important contingent industrious and faithful as students scholarly and loyal as professors their churches are well built well supported and more and more their pastors are taking their places as true leaders among the people they are intensely interested in the larger mission of the gospel and in the evangelization of the world they believe in missions pray for missions give to missions and thus have a wide horizon in the northwest they are the greatest foes of the liquor traffic and one can always count on many of them in an effort to enforce existing laws or frame new ones for its restriction or destruction neither they nor any nationality which has come to america is alike good or free from serious faults but a man would have to be short-sighted indeed not to realize that they have brought to this country rich moral treasures which we have not sufficiently used or developed what a people we might be if we would appropriate all that the jew brings of spiritual vision and cut down his business ardor and craftiness by his own emphasis of the robber gift if we would receive the slav's virgin strength and plant upon it all that we of older civilization have learned to hold precious if we would emulate the german's thoughtfulness and thoroughness and not imitate and encourage him in the trade of lager beer and the use of it what a nation we should be if we would take the hungarian's devotion to his native land and make it burn with just such a true fire upon the altar of this country and finally if we would mingle all the virtues that the nations bring us with the seriousness and loftiness of the scandinavian's mind and heart if we did this through one generation in one city of our country we would bring the kingdom of god down upon the earth nor is this all a pious wish or simply a flow of rhetoric we shall have to do that cultivate in one another the best gifts or we shall reap a harvest of the worst for in the scandinavian we can see how the very best may become like the worst simply through our own neglect we must believe about one another only the best for people like bad boys live up to their reputation this country ought to be no place for racial or national hatreds and no people must be branded as this or that simply because of one superficial or even deep-seated fault how often i have heard from well-meaning respectable people quote, you can't trust the scandinavians they are immoral they are treacherous end quote. when in fact they had no proof for their assertions and simply sowed seeds of discord of which they must some day reap the harvest end of chapter eight the scandinavian immigrant chapter nine of on the trail of the immigrant this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana on the trail of the immigrant by edward steiner chapter nine the jew in his old world home it is said of a certain english scientist that he began his work on snakes in ireland by the sentence there are no snakes in ireland and one could easily without seeming to be facetious begin this chapter by saying the jew has no home he is a man without a country and without a king he belongs to a nation which scattered over the face of the earth has yet retained the chief elements of an ancient faith although no centralized authority guards it inheriting the cultural influences of his past he absorbs the culture of each race which harbors him for a season 
although driven in turn from each insecure habitation he has not degenerated into a nomad but begins the task of home and fortune-making wherever a more hospitable people affords a resting place for his weary feet in his ancient home in palestine in the very citadel of his faith jerusalem he is the greatest stranger and people of alien beliefs have built their monuments on the sites of his grandest spiritual conquests and over the tombs of his prophets and seers weeping he tears his garments and beats his head against a wall which is all that is left of the temple thrice rebuilt thrice ruined and now having upon its ancient foundations a mosque with crescent crowned minaret from whose height the muezzin cries allah ho akbar a sound which vibrates against the ears of the jew like the mocking of the prophets who seem to say i told you so among the arabs his kinsmen he is a stranger for although in speech dress and bearing he is like them in thought and feeling he is above them yet the coarsest mohammedan servant will pronounce the word yahudi with all the scorn of a superior and all the hatred of an enemy his features have not changed since the time when egyptian artists drew with crude touch on their temple walls the story of the stranger's coming his slavery and his exodus Wherever you find him among the Arabs of North Africa or among the Danes of northern Germany, he still bears the marks of his race, with the flame of Sinai in his look and the fire of the Southland on his cheek. In Africa he is most numerous in Morocco, where 300,000 souls struggle for daily bread and are hated according to their number, while in Egypt, where once he was found in largest numbers, now only about 10,000 Jews live the whole number for africa does not exceed half a million in asia he is two hundred thousand strong or weak in america above two million while europe has given him room enough to grow into seven million between ten million or eleven million is about the whole number of jews now in existence with the city of new york as the largest jewish center in the world having no less than six hundred thousand of the faithful to describe the Jews in their varied environments means to draw many pictures and yet one, for while they differ widely according to the degree of civilization by which they are surrounded, certain characteristics remain the same. Everywhere the Jew becomes outwardly like his masters, but often remains unlike them in his spiritual life and in those deeper things which express themselves spontaneously and which are too well grounded in his nature to be wiped out entirely by the mere touch of the stranger physically he is usually smaller and weaker has brown or gray eyes and dark hair although not seldom it is red and curly among the europeans his head and neck are always large but his face is the smallest there are a vivaciousness in his manner a rather emphatic and constant gesticulation and a certain something in his speech which always mark him and mark him unmistakably the jew he quickly reciprocates both good and evil and is regarded with apprehension because of his aggressiveness for as both friend and foe he is intense where an inch of approach is granted he may want an l while where he hates he does not hate in moderation his business shrewdness is proverbial although it is not his native genius for the proverb current in the orient Quote, it takes one jew to cheat three christians it takes one armenian to cheat ten jews it takes one greek to cheat twenty armenians while no more correct than such generalities are likely to be proves the assertion that he is not the champion in the chief game of life he has had bad environment for the development of business honesty yet i know of scarcely a community in the world in which the jew plays any part where he would not have a strong representation if a group of the most trustworthy citizens was called together for any purpose the world in which he lives and in which he trades is the world which he reflects and he has not always created the conditions which exist there to jew down which is a synonym for beating down in price is as current in business where he has no factor as where he is in italy it is an economic disease and in russia in those regions closed to the jewish tradesman the native haggles with the priest about the price of a funeral or a baptism with the cab driver over the fare and even attempts to bargain on the railroad when he buys his ticket to generalize about the good or bad characteristics of the jew is as difficult as it is to portray those of any race 
when he judges himself he is either unjustly severe or profusely apologetic for a people which has lived for so many centuries under abnormal conditions cannot be known by the stranger nor can it know itself at present the jew is somewhere between shakespeare's shylock and george eliot's daniel deronda and more shylock where the hate of the middle ages makes it impossible for him to grow into george eliot's ideal he is most uncomfortably felt in those countries where he is in the transition period where he is apt to be overbearing and given to sensuous pleasure even then he is not so grasping as shylock although not so lovable as daniel deronda he does not need much time to come to his full development his genius quickly manifests itself and while he is charged with superficiality the fact that in all sciences there are accurate scholars of the jewish race disproves that accusation although his emotional nature does not best fit him for the patient task of the investigator his neighbors are quickly conscious of his faults because he is not yet schooled in the art of suppressing them and his virtues are often unrecognized because they shine the brightest in the inner circle from which the neighbor is usually excluded by mutual consent in northern africa we find him to-day just as he was thirty-five or forty years ago when sir moses montefiore tried to alleviate his inhuman treatment and his impoverished and miserable condition the moors without knowing the prophecy concerning the fate of israel are actively engaged in fulfilling it with a cruel literalness in every city and village the jews have their separate quarters and their own judges they are not permitted to study the reading and writing of arabic lest their eyes defile the sacred pages of the koran they are not allowed to ride a horse although they may ride a donkey and they must walk barefooted before the mosques they are prohibited from going near a well when a mussulman is drinking and must wear black a color despised by the moors the men are all ugly because of the abject fear on their faces their eyes are always cast down and their walk is unsteady while the whole posture is expressive of the worst kind of slavery they may be beaten kicked and spit upon at any time without being able to protect themselves or even having the spirit to do it the women are unusually handsome and some of the homes are splendidly furnished and are hospitably opened to the traveller the same conditions existed in algiers until it passed under the rule of france where the jews asserted their superiority and became landowners manufacturers and business men so that nearly half of the property in algiers is said to be in their hands for which they are again beginning to feel hatred and persecution the egyptian jews are found only in the two cities of cairo and alexandria but they have followed the victorious arms of england and have entered the heart of africa where in khartoum and the fabled timbuktu there are jewish communities in asia minor the largest jewish population outside of jerusalem is in smyrna where there are over thirty thousand in the city and vicinity these jews like those of morocco are descendants of spanish fugitives and are considered even by their enemies honest and industrious performing the commonest and hardest labor jerusalem remains to this day the unhappiest city in the world for the jew who sees in it his glorious past and his present shame and who must feel the pangs of persecution most in the city in which once he was master and lord highly interesting is the story of the jews in china that they existed there was known as early as the sixteenth century when the jesuit riki found them in kai feng fu the old capital of honan how they came to china is not definitely known but according to chinese history they came as far back as fifty eight b c in eighteen forty eight they were found by some english missionaries who reported their synagogues in ruins and the jews unable to read the one scroll of the law which remained at present there are only about twenty families left and but a few years ago a number of jews came from the interior of shanghai to be taught hebrew by the english jews and to have the rite of circumcision performed the real jewish world and that which touches our own each day is in the eastern part of europe in hungary poland russia and romania 
while most of the jews in the south of europe and asia are the descendants of spanish jews from whom they inherit a peculiar language and certain tendencies of worship and belief those of eastern europe are nearly all under the cultural influences of germany whose language they speak in a more or less corrupt form they left germany because of the persecutions of the middle ages and settled among the slavs where they have lived for many centuries never quite sure of an abiding place and suffering ever-recurring persecutions of varying degrees of intensity the jews of bohemia whose spiritual centre was the ghetto of the city of prague as well as the jews of hungary exhibit certain liberal tendencies in their faith and are midway between orthodox and reformed judaism they are generally classed among german jews while the jews of poland lithuania and bessarabia are classed with the russian jews by far the largest number and the one great source of jewish immigration to this country the cause of this immigration is found in the persecutions not new in the history of israel but like death always holding a new terror in russia the horrors of these persecutions are shared with other non-russians yet there is in the jewish persecutions an element of hatred and contempt which makes them exceptionally galling and affects not only the jews civic social and economic condition but their self-respect also they are classed with the kalmuks the samoyeds the kirghizi and other aboriginal tribes of low mental capacity and still lower standards of civilization while not sharing with them their legal status being as jews regarded as outlaws for whom special repressive legislation is necessary above all else these laws tend to keep them within the pale which pale is the old kingdom of poland and the western provinces originally belonging to poland on this territory which is by far the smaller portion of european russia over five million jews are virtually imprisoned entrance into the larger russia being permitted only to one merchants of the first class who have to pay an annual tax of nearly five hundred dollars two professional men who have university diplomas as however of the entire number of pupils admitted to the higher schools only from five to ten per cent are permitted to be jews this class is very small three old soldiers who have served twenty-five years in the army four students of higher education five apothecaries dentists surgeons and midwives six skilled artisans who have no legal residence outside the pale but who may follow their vocation anywhere provided they earn their living by their trade and that they are members of their trade guilds a privilege rarely granted to jews worst of all is the element of uncertainty as to the interpretation and operation of the laws which are now lax now severe but always means of extortion and a recognized avenue of income for numerous officials the greatest hardship suffered comes from the fact that in the villages only those residents who were there prior to a certain date are permitted to remain while the vast majority is herded together in the city ghettos which offer but a scant living in the normal population the jewish part of the city the ghetto is invariably sunk in mud or dust according as there is rain or sunshine and is the picture of melancholia cadaverous men in long black greasy cloaks countless children and women who alone carry sunshine for in the jewish woman's heart the hope of giving birth to the messiah is not yet dead all of these people are narrow-chested with the melancholy eyes deep set they have long bodies and short limbs with which they make ambling strides like the camel in the desert it is a haggling bargaining pushing crowding seething mass ugly in its environment hard for the stranger to love cowed by fear unmanned by persecution a thing to jeer at to ridicule to plunder and to kill this is no apology for the jew he carries the faults and the sins of ages not only his own but those of his persecutors also he is himself the keenest critic of racial faults and once awakened to them hates them and his race most unmercifully his people are greedy greasy and pushing are doggedly humble as might be expected of hunted human beings who for two thousand years have known no peace wherever the cross overshadowed them 
they could escape torment in a moment by having a few drops of holy water sprinkled over them for baptism opens to all the door of opportunity whatever else may have died the ancient fire is not dead in them and they prefer to suffer to die if need be rather than to enter a so-called christian church through the door of expediency sometimes that door has to be entered but the jews who enter it are still jews and often they suffer agonies of mind and spirit to which persecution might be preferable a friend of mine in moscow a manufacturer of tobacco who had lived in that city for thirty years received sudden notice to dispose of his business and leave the city he was prosperous his children were going to school they knew no home but moscow and the town to which they were to go was in the crowded jewish pale which he had left as a child he and his family were baptized he became a full-fledged russian with all the rights of citizenship and his business went on as usual soon afterwards however he became depressed the depression increasing each time that he had to take part in religious ceremonies which were hateful to him and it was not long before he grew violently insane i have no doubt that as soon as the jewish disabilities are removed most of those who have entered the greek church will return to the faith of their fathers which they have never really left it is said in moscow of a certain jew that after the priest had instructed him in the catechism he asked now what do you believe and he replied i believe that now i shall not have to leave moscow much more than this these so-called converted jews do not and cannot believe most of them prefer to live in dirty little hovels hungry and wretched to brood over the ancient lore the psalms of david the prophets messages from god the laws of moses and the sayings of the sages day and night while hunger gnaws and poverty oppresses they look to jehovah and fast and mourn and believe minsk wilna kovno and warsaw contain jewries in which from eighty thousand to two hundred thousand souls are living no one knows how two-thirds by manual labor the commonest and the coarsest for the lowest wage tomorrow's bread is always an unknown quantity and these people do walk by faith and not by sight no labor is too heavy or too dirty and the mournful jewish face will look out at you from the pit of a mine from under a burden of wood or water from the margin of the river as boats are unloaded or from the seat of a miserable cab whose horse and driver are alike most pitiable because of their weak bodies they are not regarded as good laborers except at tailoring locked in the city hampered in their movements by unreasonable laws groaning under taxes too heavy to be borne the government labor religion life itself a burden they are living egypt over again waiting and praying for their deliverance why are they persecuted can any one answer that question has any one yet found the reason for blind hate that blindest of all the hate of race they are hated because they are supposed to be rich yet seventy five per cent of them are poorer than chinese coolies they are hated because they have strange customs because they hold themselves in a large measure aloof from the common life how can they be anything but strangers to the adherents of a religion who choose a holy day the day of resurrection to kill them easter time is almost invariably the time of persecution how can they be other than strangers to a church the ringing of whose bells marks the carnage of hundreds of thousands murdered for the glory of jesus a jew how can they be anything but strangers to a government whose officials will step among the mobs to encourage them shouting steady boys keep it up they are hated by the government because they are supposed to be revolutionists if only they were the masses of the jews are so cowed by fear that they are unmanned they do not know the use of a weapon here and there a jew alert and keen sees his misery and is brave enough to defend himself many of them advocate socialism it attracts them because it knows no race because it preaches a certain kind of peace because it is a brotherhood the jew does not find in the orthodox church the meek and lowly nazarene because the messiah whom the church preaches is masked behind church millinery because the representative of the lowly nazarene sits upon the throne of the haughtiest autocrat and because the cross is an ornament and not an element in the salvation of men 
the jew in russia is persecuted because he is supposed to use the blood of gentile children for his passover this false accusation has followed him through the years in spite of the fact that those who promulgated it knew it was false the shedding of human blood was never one of israel's crimes and killing is a desire which the jew lost long ago having never been a master in this art frankly the root of this persecution of the jews is found in their superior ability to cope with the difficulties of existence in russia in their thrift and shrewdness which knows no bounds and which have almost crushed in them their spiritual longings making them a byword among the nations but a new inspiration has come to the jews of eastern europe through the zionist movement a revival of jewish nationalism a desire to win back the lost palestine the fatherland of their spiritual sires the way back to palestine is a difficult one and neither their maccabian spirit nor the wealth they accumulate may avail them as a nation to reach their goal but the way there is beautiful the dream is glorious and spiritual and physical miracles wrought among the wealthiest and the poorest of them are remarkable a new literature and a new psalmody are being born a new maccabian spirit is filling the emaciated bodies of these sons of israel and one of them sings and he but one of thousands arise and shine jerusalem the costly jeweled diadem put off thy ash-strewn garb of gray in glorious dress thyself array jehovah made thy people free now that they long for liberty at end is all thy suffering night jerusalem send forth thy light a note of ancient psalmody fills heaven and earth with melody a sacrifice of grateful praise from altars old we now upraise and god looks pleased from glory down his smile o oh, israel is thy crown put off thy ashen garb of gray jerusalem see thy glorious day but for a long time to come this jerusalem will have to be new york and their palestine america one can but hope that the jew will so live and act as to become one of the highest ideals of his new country and so unwrap himself from ancient faults that in the truest sense jerusalem will be the bride adorned for her bridegroom and the city come down from heaven among men in whose midst the reign of god will be an acknowledged fact End of chapter 9, The Jew in His Old World Home Chapter 10 of On the Trail of the Immigrant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. On the Trail of the Immigrant by Edward Steiner. Chapter 10. The New Exodus. In a little studio on the west side of New York, a Jewish sculptor modeled the clay for a medal upon which he was to engrave for grateful Israel the memorial of its settlement in America two and a half centuries ago. The face of the metal bore the veiled form of justice, casting the evil spirit of intolerance from his throne, and placing upon it the goddess of liberty, who is bestowing on all alike the rich gifts in her keeping. On the reverse side of the metal, victory is engraving the date 1655, the year of the landing of the Jewish forefathers. The victory modeled by this Jewish genius is not the triumphant, overbearing, conquering spirit, but in her noble form are embodied graciousness, determination, and a sincere gratitude. At the celebration of the 250th anniversary of the landing of the Jews in America, held in Carnegie Hall on Thanksgiving Day, November 30th, 1905, these feelings were given utterance in various ways by various persons, but by none more truly than by the Reverend Dr. Joseph Silverman in his opening prayer. Quote, we thank thee for america this haven of refuge for the oppressed of the world we thank thee for the blessings of a permanent home in this country its opportunities for development of life and advancement of mind and heart for its independence and unity its free institutions the right of life liberty and the pursuit of happiness we reverently bow before thy decree which has taught us to find enduring peace and security in the sure foundation of this blessed land. End quote. 
the jewish pioneers were cultured and far-travelled men who came from portugal holland and england and their provinces they were imbued by the adventurous spirit of the people whom they had left in order to seek the undiscovered paths of the sea which led to fabled wealth it is no wonder if at that early period when jewish persecutions were at their height and the jewish name under the darkest cloud they had difficulty in gaining free entrance to their desired haven and that the charter which was granted them was given grudgingly it reads thus twenty sixth of april sixteen fifty five quote we would have liked to agree to your wishes and request that the new territories should not be further invaded by people of the jewish race for we foresee from such immigration the same difficulties which you fear but after having further weighed and considered the matter we observe that it would be unreasonable and unfair especially because of the considerable loss sustained by the jews in the taking of brazil and also because of the large amount of capital which they have invested in the shares of this company footnote the dutch west india company after many consultations we have decided and resolved upon a certain petition made by said portuguese jews that they shall have permission to sail to and trade in new netherlands and to live and remain there provided the poor among them shall not become a burden to the company or the community but be supported by their own nation you will govern yourselves accordingly End quote these jews true to their religious instincts built synagogues wherever they settled and were called sephardic congregations until the beginning of the nineteenth century they were the dominating religious and cultural type and while yet retaining certain racial characteristics they blended into the national life having no small share in its development with the coming to this country of the german peasantry there was brought from the villages and towns a not inconsiderable number of jews who scattered through the north and south upon all the highways of commerce and who finally became the second strata of the jewish life in america at first they were more or less amalgamated with the portuguese jews but as their numbers grew overwhelmingly great they developed their religious and social life after their own traditions and were distinguished from their sephardic brethren by the generic name ashkenazim germans within this group developed the german reform movement which has in greater or less degree attracted all the germanic jews and from which the merely traditional and ritualistic element has quite disappeared so that at the present time it is not far removed from unitarianism in faith and practice later when the population of the eastern portion of europe found its way across the sea under the impulse of great nationalistic movements in austria hungary and poland a new factor was introduced into the jewish community which brought with it rabbinistic lore and faithfulness to the traditions of the elders and this factor tended to strengthen the jewish consciousness in after years a good portion of this group attached itself to the reform movement and cannot be differentiated from the germanic group while the residue has become the link between it and the overwhelmingly large mass of russian jews which was to come and which now forms the greatest proportion of the jewish population this russian jewish group is not easily analyzed it is neither heterogeneous nor homogeneous it is polish romanian lithuanian bessarabian and galatian it is steeped in traditionalism overburdened by ritualistic laws loaded by the fetters of rabbinism held under the spell of kabbalism and wonder rabbis swayed now by this teacher and now by that one it has no common center or common aim it has not analyzed itself nor its environment strongly individualistic its members are united to one another and to the other groups only by their common misfortune an indefinable racial consciousness intellectually and culturally far below the other groups it bears the marks of oppression and of the oppressor in its thoughts and in its action nevertheless it is destined to be the determining influence in the future of judaism in america and as such deserves special study and consideration the jewish population may be divided into four groups some of which are subdivided one the sephardic or spanish portuguese jews who have not retained their native speech but who have preserved certain peculiarities in their worship and distinctive ritualistic forms which are dignified and stately the hebrew language which they use in their service is pronounced in a peculiar way and in better harmony with the spirit of the language than one hears elsewhere 
they are the real aristocracy among the jews rarely poor with much of old-time spanish pride remaining in their bearing and expressed in their attitude towards the other jewish groups they are centered almost entirely in the eastern cities where they are found in the upper world of finance and in business and professional life this group is receiving scarcely any additions through immigration the second group the ashkenazim or german jews has most quickly adjusted itself to the life in america and has developed what might be called an american judaism in which liberal tendencies have prevailed and have played havoc with the traditions of the past very often at the expense of the spirit of judaism some of these congregations have made sunday the sabbath of their week and the service is conducted in the english language with the hebrew almost entirely eliminated out of this group have come most of the prominent jews in the united states and in nearly every community of any size we find german jews engaged in reputable business most often owning dry goods or clothing stores the third group is composed of austrian and hungarian jews many of whom have remained orthodox without being slavishly attached to rabbinism while their congregations are usually upon what is called the status quo basis which is neither extremely orthodox nor reformed and consequently is sterile they are apt to be more clannish than the german jews grouping themselves into centers according to the districts from which they come strongly retaining the characteristics of the races among which they lived so long and bringing with them many of the antagonisms engendered in that conglomerate of nationalities the austro-hungarian monarchy this is especially true of the hungarian jews who have become convivial like the magyars and are not over fond of work the coffee houses of little hungary in new york draw their revenue largely from these jews to whom life without the coffee house would not seem worth the living and for whom each day must hold its pause for a friendly game of cards or billiards and a pull at a long and strong black cigar among them are shrewd traders pawnbrokers and a very small portion of peddlers although the occupation of peddler entails a position not agreeable to their proud spirits in a larger degree than the other groups mentioned they are engaged in mechanical labor being wood and metal workers and makers of artificial flowers and passementary in these trades they have attained real proficiency they are not so well distributed as the german jews and are found largely in new york with a slowly increasing number in chicago and st louis they have brought with them many of the loser ways of such cities as vienna and budapest therefore they are less thrifty than the russian jews and less intelligent than those from germany their judaism is apt to sit very lightly upon them as they have neither the spiritual vision of the first group nor the ethical conception of religion which the second group possesses racially they are also less conscious of judaism and easily intermarry with gentiles or lose themselves among them where their physique does not betray them a hungarian jew usually prefers to be called a magyar yet i know of many instances where that fact was stoutly denied though undoubtedly the magyar spirit was grafted upon semitic stock the last and largest group the russian jews the youngest army of the immigrants is ultra orthodox yet ultra radical changed to the past and yet utterly severed from it with religion permeating every act of life or going to the other extreme and having none of it traders by instinct and yet among the hardest manual laborers of our great cities a complex mass in which great things are yearning to express themselves a brooding mass which does not know itself and does not lightly disclose itself to the outsider more broken into individualistic groups than the austrians and hungarians they have the strongest racial consciousness and perhaps are also the depository of the greatest jewish genius the synagogue is the center of each provincial or village group gathered in some ghetto and being subject to no ecclesiastical law outside of itself is thoroughly congregational these synagogues vary in size and untidiness as the services vary in monotony and disorder each man prays or chants as fast or as slowly as high or as low as he pleases naturally the effect is not harmonious neither is there much harmony in the administration of ecclesiastical affairs rabbi cantor and chaussette 
the official slaughterer are usually out with each other and with various members of the congregation and quarrels during service are not unknown while the worship seems fervent it is often spiritless and only a small portion of the russian jewish population works seriously at the business of its organized religious life the younger generation has much unsatisfied longing for the real spiritual life and there are a few jewish endeavor societies entirely apart from the synagogues in which this spirit expresses itself a still larger number of the young people have slowly but surely drifted into complete antagonism to the faith of their fathers and here lies the great conflict as well as the great problem nothing in the whole story of immigration is so pathetic as this growing breach between the old and the new this ever widening gulf which is not being bridged the ethical culture society has a hold although not a very vital one upon a small number and here and there one or the other of the young people drifts into a christian church but this makes no serious impression upon the mass zionism has become the strong rallying point for many of them and has gathered into its various lodges much of the radical element which is coming back to the law and the prophets by the way of an awakened consciousness the russian jews are the busiest of our alien population and although at first among the poorest a respectable middle class is growing up and is marching towards wealth if not as yet enrolled among the millionaires of the total of six hundred thousand jews in new york city nearly one hundred thousand are engaged in various branches of the clothing industry and in mechanical and manufacturing pursuits this is a remarkable showing for people who nearly all had to adjust themselves to manual labor for which they were not physically fitted and which they had no opportunity to perform in russia in the trades which they have entered they usually maintain a satisfactory wage and cannot be regarded as a serious economic menace if they remain crowded in the ghettos of the eastern cities it is due not so much to their gregarious habits and to the needs springing from their religious observances as it is due to the fact that the trades in which they find readiest employment are here concentrated and the wages most satisfying the needle above all else is to blame for the congestion of the ghetto and the great transformation must come over israel both physically and mentally before the needle will be exchanged for the plough end of chapter ten the new exodus chapter eleven of on the trail of the immigrant this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. On the Trail of the Immigrant by Edward Steiner. Chapter 11. In the Ghettos of New York at last we are free although still upon uncle sam's ferryboat which carries those of us who have passed muster to the battery the gateway into the gigantic city and the vast country which lies beyond where sans ceremony we are landed boarding-house runners call out the names of their hostelries express men entreat us to entrust to them our belongings a voice of the banana peddler is heard in the land and through the babble of sounds there arise the joyous shrieks of those who welcome their dear ones over in hoboken where the cool-blooded anglo-saxon awaits his wife who toiled not neither did she spin during her year abroad the joy remains unexpressed she may say to him hello old man and he will reply how are you old girl and that is all so far as the public knows but here on the battery where jacob meets his leah for whom he has toiled and suffered these five years for whose sake he ate hard rye bread and onions that he might save money to bring her to him when jacob meets his leah there are warm embraces and kisses through the tears here men embrace and kiss each other and children are held up to the father's gaze fathers who left them as infants and now see them grown half a dozen stalwart men and women will almost crush a little wrinkled mother Laban, their mother coming to them for the sunset of her life which is to be bright and beautiful after many dark mornings and cloudy noondays i attached myself to a young russian jew of about my own age who had no relatives waiting for him but who had the address of his parents friends they had come here a few years before and now served as the clearing-house for that particular district of russia of which their native town was the centre 
we went up broadway and after plunging into the whirlpool of its traffic emerged safe at the city hall crossed the bowery and were at the edge of the great ghetto the heart of the largest jewish community in the world its numbers now nearly seven hundred thousand souls scattered through all parts of greater new york and massed in four centers commonly called ghettos of which the one through which we are passing is the great original one it is less dirty less suspiciously fragrant than the ghetto which my comrade has left and in spite of squalor and visible signs of poverty a certain air of joyousness pervades its life which is lacking in the old home the hurdy-gurdy grinder lures nimble-footed children from block to block like the pied piper of hamlin and they are happier and more graceful than the much bestarched children of the rich who take lessons in dancing and in conventional deportment the sidewalks and driveways are packed by humanity most of it children for the abrahamitic promise that his seed shall increase like the sands of the sea has not yet departed from israel only the illustration is not quite complete for while the ghetto children are as numerous as the sands i counted almost two thousand in one block they are not nearly so clean the language of the ghetto is yiddish a mixture of german hebrew and russian but with enough english mixed with it to make the immigrant halt before such words as jemavet g jumped g trusted which sooner or later will become part of his own vocabulary street signs are written in hebrew letters and the passer-by is invited by them to drink a glass of soda for a cent to buy two bananas for the same sum to purchase a prayer mantle or kosher meat to enter a beer saloon or a synagogue many of these signs are translated into english and rabbi levinson on cannon street has in large english letters quote, performer of matrimony end quote. in the same house one finds wedding dresses for hire and can have his picture photographed and also may buy furnitings for bedrooms and parlors everything is for sale on the street from pickled cucumbers to feather beds and almost all the work done in this ghetto is done by jewish workmen there are jewish plumbers locksmiths masons and of course tailors and work and trade are the watchwords of the ghetto where in all my wanderings through it i have not seen that genus americanum the corner loafer the prevailing type of dwelling even after tenement house legislation is much too crowded and too dirty the new york ghetto looks remarkably decent from the outside but pharisaic landlords have beautified the outside of the cup and platter while within the house is poorly prepared for human habitation a good example is the house into which i lead my friend it is an old-fashioned front and rear tenement with fifty families as residents and on climbing the stairway to the fifth story to which our address directs our nostrils are greeted by a fragrance which compared with the well-remembered smells of the steerage is likened to the odors of araby the blessed we come into the kitchen where the family of nine is just at dinner two of the number a husband and wife are regular boarders i doubt whether anywhere else under similar circumstances we would have received so genuinely hearty a welcome in spite of the fact that we are practically strangers to them and that i had no claim whatever upon their hospitality one of the children has already been dispatched to the nearest store to buy additional dainties, and room is made at the already crowded table for two very hungry adults. My Russian friend, amazed as he was at the turmoil of the streets and the height of the buildings, is still more awed by the sight of such abundant and wholesome food to which he may help himself without stint. There are large sweet potatoes which taste better than cake, and are permeated by the delicate flavor of nuts they are a greater contrast to the small gnarly scant portion of potatoes which it has been his lot to eat than any forty-story skyscraper can be to the tumble-down shanty in which his father kept store meat a huge piece of meat on his plate and in the memory of his palate only the soft end of a soup bone as a special delicacy what a contrast last but not least the pie that apple pie of which he had a whole one for himself and knew not how to attack it until finally following good precedent he took it into his trembling hands and let his joyous face disappear into its juicy depths after the dinner he was catechized all the inhabitants of the faraway town were inquired after and the record of the living and the dead told to the news-hungry hearers 
what a marvellous group this is and typical of thousands the father is a cloak presser he is a small cadaverous looking man of very gentle mien who knows not much beyond the fact that to-morrow the whistle will blow and that he will be on the fifteenth floor of a great cloak factory doing his allotted task god willing the enemies that await him are many the red-headed irish for lady who looks hard after the creases in the cloaks and who in turn is suspected by him of all the evils in the catalogue of sin the cloak designer a viennese jew who hates all jews especially russian jews and more especially this particular one with whom after the fashion of the viennese he quarrels for pastime his fellow cloak presser whose name was elijah and who now calls himself jack is an ardent socialist who pesters my host by his economic theories which are obnoxious to him in the extreme i used to have to let him talk is the refrain of my host's complaint our hostess is corpulent and somewhat untidy her horizon is even more limited than that of her husband she too works she is a skillful operator and from eight a m until six p m she hears nothing but the whirr of the machine she does not even have an enemy to vary the monotony by her socialistic doctrines the oldest daughter is called blanche although she was named rebecca she too works and has worked for several years albeit she is not past sixteen she embroiders in a fashionable dressmaking establishment on broadway and likes her place she sees fine ladies and handles fine stuffs and above all she says to me in good english i don't have to associate with russian jews she reads good books fiction biography history everything the two on her shelf that evening were ivanhoe and the life of florence nightingale other children are growing up and going to work soon so the family is on the upgrade in spite of the fact that work is not always steady that the wife's parents who live with them are old and feeble that the youngest child is threatened by blindness and that they have paid much money to quack doctors who advertise and to those who do not it was pathetic in the extreme to see this family crowd together to make room for us for the night my friend slept on a sofa the ribs of which protruded like those of pharaoh's lean kine and i slept soundly on the smoother surface of the floor the next day brought to us the momentous task of going out to find work and before the whistle blew for the night's rest my friend was part of a sewing machine while i being stronger was assigned to pressing cloaks my fellow cloak presser told a piteous story of his wife and four children on the other side who had been almost heartbroken because he had been here two years and been kept by hard luck from sending for them i worked by his side for a day receiving my first lessons in cloak pressing from him and the last letter from his wife was so pathetic that it drew tears from my eyes and money from my pocket-book towards those tickets when the day's work was over and the possibility of soon seeing his family was almost realized he said as we parted i shall sleep happily to-night and so did i in spite of heat and sore muscles rarely do these clothes pressers rise to the higher place in their trade although occasionally by strict economy and much hard labor one may own a shop and sweat the greener as he has been sweated in my wanderings through the ghetto i dropped into a pawn shop on avenue c one day and after i made some purchases the proprietor grew friendly and introduced me to his family he is the happy father of seven sons all of them smart as a whip and all of them doing well the youngest one charles t the smarter is still in school and like all the yiddish boys at the head of his class charles t knows everything from marquis of queensbury rules to the schedule of the lectures at the educational alliance building what are you going to be charles i asked a business man like my father and the keen look in his big eyes the determination of his whole frame and face showed that he would succeed even better than his father who was beginning to think of being at ease in zion and retiring from business charles t s father began life by buying rags on houston street his sons will sell bonds on wall street the ghetto is not all barter and manual labor for there are many synagogues in which prayers are said every day although only a few of these synagogues are anything more than halls or large rooms and tenement houses sometimes above or below a drinking place and in many instances in ballrooms which on saturdays and holy days put off their unholy garb 
if all the population of the ghetto attended to its religious duties these one hundred synagogues would have to be increased to a thousand but on saturdays many have to work and increasingly many wish to work so that not twenty per cent of the ghetto population attend religious services however on the great feast days new year's day and the day of atonement everybody goes or as charles t's father would say i go to the synagogue twice a year to pay my dues and then i'll not have a thing to do with them for another year charles t's father is a politician most of the ghetto rabbis are like mr levinson performers of matrimony and not much else they are professionally pious and not deeply religious they have no vision and measure a man's religion by his observances of fasts and feasts they are ignorant of all literature except the talmud that treasure-house of jewish thought and prison-house of jewish souls they are as superstitious as their constituency and often less honest but in not a few cases truly devout and charitable there is no ecclesiastical control over these rabbis and they are in some cases self-made men in the worst sense of the word while their influence upon the ethical life of the ghetto is almost nil they are the jews law court and judges in matters which pertain to ritualistic questions but they are almost nothing to them in life there is very little preaching less pastoral visitation and much useless bending of the back over musty books full of dry bones of rabbinical lore the one great jewish intellectual and ethical center of the ghetto is the educational alliance building with its various scattered branches it is everything which a young men's christian association is to a gentile community only more inasmuch as it ministers to all from childhood to old age israel's intellectual hunger is as great as its proverbial greed for wealth and this gigantic building covering a block and containing forty-three classrooms is entirely inadequate to meet the demand the main entrance is always in a state of siege and two policemen are stationed there to maintain order and keep the crowding people in line i visited it on a hot sunday afternoon in july and i found the large well-stocked reading room uncomfortably filled by young men the roof garden is a breathing place for thousands and is always crowded with children who are supervised in their play and who enjoy it eagerly the annual report reads like a fairy tale many of the lectures and entertainments have to be given a number of times to give all an opportunity to hear and see and some of the most difficult subjects discussed find the most numerous and enthusiastic hearers baths sewing and cooking schools are maintained and to give even a list of all the agencies employed to lift this population would exhaust my space there has been marked improvement among its constituency mentally and ethically and the redemption of new york from tammany was in no small measure due to the faithful work done by this and other similar centers not the least among them being the university settlement there are several christian churches in this district but what their influence upon the newcomer is i could not determine in the main it may be said that the churches do not concern themselves greatly regarding this problem around them although there are a few notable exceptions the following letter does not give one a hopeful view of the situation the gentleman to whom this letter was written mr usser marcus was actively engaged in the kind of politics in which the churches ought to have an interest he organized a club and through one of its members secured a room in the woods memorial church on avenue a after the first meeting mr marcus received the following letter new york november first nineteen o one mr usser marcus one fifty seven second avenue city dear sir word has just come to me that your club will mainly consist of jews also that you are acting independently of the club already formed now you must know that the young men who have the club are the men of our church and therefore it would not be right to oust them for strangers and especially jews the men are quite worked up about it and came to see me about it the other night and this is my decision that you get another place of meeting other than ours i have issued orders that you cannot meet again and another thing i told you strictly that you must be out by ten p m which you were not as you kept the room open until eleven o'clock all these things have determined me on my course and i hope that you will not take it in the wrong spirit as i am acting simply for the best interests of my church and feel that this is the best way for all concerned 
it seems to me that being jews you would scorn to accept any favors from christians i should certainly be pretty far gone before i should ask or even accept a favor at the hand of a jew knowing as i do the feeling which exists between them and the people of our religion yours respectfully the jew suspects every convert and suspects and hates the missionary his own religious faith may have little hold upon him but he is hostile to the attempt to proselyte him and his brethren he knows christianity from its worst side and he does not always see it in these missions from its best side for all religious work which bends its effort towards making a big annual report must be superficial if not dishonest and the temptation to make converts is very great even if the methods employed are above suspicion the work of the jewish mission in the ghetto ought to be the interpretation of the spirit of christianity so that it might remove suspicion and prejudice and not increase them making converts in that mechanical way used in the revival service of the past is as obnoxious to the sensible christian as it is to the sensitive jew while the coddling of the convert and his exhibition as an example do more harm than good a true interpretation of jesus by christian people in the churches and out of them a touch of kindness here and there without a thought of definite results the treating of the jew as a man and not as a special species would do more to reach the jewish soul than any organized missionary effort with which i am acquainted the two great social factors of the ghetto are the yiddish newspapers and the theater each of them in some degree entering into the life of every dweller in the ghetto as indeed each of them is a mixture of good and ill a battlefield of past ideals and modern aspirations the paper most in evidence on the street is the jewish vorwaits the social democratic organ if all its readers were adherents of this political faith its strength would be enormous a careful examination of this subject shows that there are about three thousand social democrats in the ghetto and that three hundred of that number are of the extreme type the politics of the ghetto used to be very uniform they were democratic years ago a jewish republican was a curiosity today he is a very important minority tammany had a very strong hold upon this district and even today the tammany district leader is its political saint to fix and be fixed used to be considered no crime and is still winked at with both eyes although every time that tammany is defeated the ghetto has a few less crooked windings to evade the law is a vice brought from the lawlessness of russia and the political tutelage of the east side of new york has not improved the situation the hearst influence is felt here in a remarkable degree and the new york evening journal is a great power for both good and ill the jewish immigrant receives his first training for citizenship in one of the lodges or societies of which there are legions here he becomes conscious of himself and above all he can talk and unlock the floodgates of unexpressed emotion i attended a mitank as it is called of the sick and benefit society and i think it is typical of all of them the meat tunk was held on lewis street in a hall on the top story of a rather old and rickety building underneath the lodge room is a dance hall beneath that is a synagogue and a saloon occupies the basement the occasion was a public installation of officers and the ladies were invited to one who has seen these people in their old environment the change seems miraculous the men wore the very best and cleanest clothing and the women were obtrusively stylish all the red tape of the american lodge was observed in this society in which most of the members knew nothing of parliamentary law and had never taken part in debate unfortunately for the decorum of the ladies there was a wedding ball in the room below and the polish mazurka kept their feet in motion and did not seal their lips the president used the gavel freely and in spite of stamping feet and wild measured music the installation services were carried out the personnel of this society is of some interest its eighty members are drawn almost entirely from one district in the old country with the exception of three or four men they are all engaged in manual labor the retiring president is a graduate of a gymnasium speaks four languages poorly and english very well is a republican is thoroughly americanized and although not active in politics is an influence for good in their affairs he neither smokes nor drinks and manages to save money from his meagre wages 
the newly installed president is a wood-turner by trade earns eighteen dollars a week is also a republican not active in politics but a conscientious citizen the newly elected vice president is a cloak presser a strong social democrat and would die for his political faith he belongs to the social labor wing and he hates the social democratic wing with a desperate hatred he is a good speaker honest though fanatical and one who might be made to see the weakness of his political creed the secretary is a polish jew a dealer in plumber's supplies a democrat not of the tammany order a stereotyped anti-imperialist and free trader speaks english fluently although only ten years in this country and is on the road to harlem that is to wealth the treasurer is a russian jew an apparator earns eight dollars a week speaks english very well has been six years in the country but is not yet a citizen he will be a social democrat first and a republican when he has a bank account of the eighty men present fifteen were republicans twenty were democrats two were socialists and the rest were not yet citizens most of them spoke english fairly well and some could understand a few words although only four months in this country of the married women the fewest could speak english but the young girls knew it well enough slang vaudeville songs and all after the installation services there was much useless discussion under the good of the order upon minor points so typical of such meetings outside the ghetto characteristics of the mitunk was the fact that the leaders were all members of other lodges of the women who spoke for the good of the order a daughter of rebecca the wife of the president made a capital speech the mitunk adjourned for a banquet served in the basement where a hungarian stew and beer cheered and filled but did not inebriate or cause indigestion national songs were rendered by the young people as the spirit moved them and after the banquet the whole mitunk invited itself to the wedding ball upstairs where in the polka and mazurka they drove time away wildly and prepared themselves badly for the next day's hard labor in the ghetto friday the day before the sabbath is a day of agitation of scrubbing cooking baking and merchandising saturday is the day of meditation when the faces are solemn and the step is slow and although many must work there is a perceptible stillness everywhere with shuffling step and pious mien the rabbis and members go to the synagogue and with much wailing and lamentation praise and bless jehovah the second generation of the immigrant jew has lost its adherence to the solemn observance of the day of rest eats and drinks whenever and wherever opportunity offers and smokes cigars on the sabbath a most heinous sin americanization means to the jew in most cases dejudaizing himself without becoming a christian there is a painful eagerness on the part of some of the younger generation especially to cast aside everything which marks it as jewish and i have heard some of the severest criticisms of the jews from the lips of such people the american jew becomes overconscious of the faults of his race and not seldom hates the word jew and feels himself insulted if it is applied to him i hate them all i heard a number of younger jews say and there is no vice in the calendar of hades which they did not ascribe to their own race if as some people claim the jews are discriminated against in new york by the gentile business firms i have proof that there are a number of jewish firms that do not employ any jews and very many that prefer gentile help the jews who come from various european countries hate one another on general principles and a hungarian or a german jew looks down in the greatest derision on the pole and the russian these latter two nationalities are mentally and physically stronger their needs are smaller their wits are sharper and as getting ahead always starts calumny the russian jew gets a good share of it his is not a prepossessing nature his form and face are often repulsive and his habits are none the less so but he has an abundance of ambition and a superabundance of sharpness which when they are led into right channels become an ennobling talent east broadway the wholesale district of the ghetto suffers from overmuch such talent and its capacity for shrewd trading and quick thinking cannot be excelled anywhere in new york outside of wall street the polish and russian jews are under strong suspicion of making money out of fires and bankruptcies and the suspicion must be well founded for the insurance companies discriminate against them and many of them refuse to take the risks 
great crimes are seldom laid to the charge of the russian jew although too often he lends himself to rather shady business transactions and the percentage of certain crimes is rapidly increasing taking him as a whole however he is honest industrious and frugal and has above all the making of a man in him it is true that he works for small wages but he soon wants more he lives on little money but he soon spends more he does not have as many faults as his enemies assert and he has as many virtues as one might reasonably expect he is to be feared not for his weakness but for his strength not for his faults but for his virtues he is here to stay he does not care to return to russia and he cannot if he wishes to the russian government sees to that if he wishes to return home for a visit he changes his name puts a big cross around the necks of his children and says he is a protestant but he has a hard time to convince the officials and often is forced to return without seeing his native village the ghetto is not an ideal dwelling place its nearness to the bowery the crowded conditions of its tenement houses and its inherited weaknesses and sins are against it yet i have never seen a drunken man on any of its streets and i have witnessed only one quarrel but that was worth a great many of its kind in other places the ghetto is a peaceful community if not a united one for instance the young man with whom i drifted into new york remained closely attached to the jews from his own district in russia and consequently retained all the prejudices against the jews who came from more or less favored portions of the czar's domain he was from lithuania and regarded himself and his kind as intellectually keener and more learned in the law than they facts which were acknowledged by his neighbors but who added to them less complimentary characteristics such as exceptional unreliability and trickery in trade not long ago as i walked slowly up second avenue i was met by a well-dressed man whose face was shaven and whose trousers were created after the manner of americans in good english although with a strong accent he called my name and brought back to my memory a journey across the sea and a start in life together on this side and how are you getting along abramowitz getting along like pulling teeth what do you mean i am learning to be a dentist with my father-in-law who keeps a fine office where do you live on rivington street and you must come to see me i followed him into a tenement house of the better class and found him rather well situated the home which consisted of three rooms contained all the hallmarks of american civilization carpets of various hues were upon the floor colored supplements of sunday newspapers lined the walls a huge plush album contained pictures of the friends left behind and the new ones made in america and last but not least on the wall hung crayon portraits of himself and his bride in their wedding attire they also possessed a phonograph on which they played for my special benefit the latest songs current in the variety theatres the young husband told me of his increasing prosperity and when i questioned him as to why he did not move into a better locality he answered that he had contemplated doing so even having rented a flat out towards harlem but when he and his wife viewed the neighborhood they found that it was peopled by russian jews not of their own native region so they preferred to remain on rivington street to them that street is only a suburb of minsk here the news drifts with every incoming steamer and although it is almost always sad news they thus keep in close touch with the weal and woe of their kindred and acquaintances i have made it an especial task to follow as closely as possible the career of a hundred russian jews with whom i have come in touch during my journeys and investigations although they did not pass into my field of observation together and represent various ages and conditions the following may be of interest after five years about forty per cent had learned to speak english very well and about fifteen per cent could write it almost faultlessly while more than sixty per cent could read english newspapers of this number seventy eight per cent had become wage earners and only fifteen per cent of these had not materially improved their lot in life eighteen were citizens of the united states three were social democrats of an intense type five believed that way but voted the republican ticket and the rest were divided on national questions about evenly between the two dominant parties they voted as they pleased in local affairs although they were strongly influenced first by tammy and later by the hearst movement which more and more dominates the east side of new york 
91 per cent has ceased to be orthodox in their religious practices although in 37 per cent the spirit was willing but the flesh was weak all the social democrats with the exception of one had entirely drifted from their ancient moorings and were avowed atheists as to their relation to christianity i asked one of them do you know anything about american christians and he replied how shall i know anything about christians on the east side nearly all of them were saving some money and one of them had grown rich at least in the estimation of his neighbors and he was in the real estate business among all of them there has been an intellectual awakening as one of them said they have room to think though they have but little leisure modifications and almost marvelous transformations had taken place in the features of many and these were the men who had thought themselves most into our life whether there was growth in ethical conception it is hard to say for one cannot easily reach beyond the exterior in sociological observations and depths do not disclose themselves when one watches people by the hundred their business sense certainly has not grown less keen and making money is as much an object in life as it always was perchance even a little more the scale of things has changed i find in most of them that they are more honest in little things which comes from the fact that they need not be penurious the real estate dealer is an unscrupulous sharper i know but in that he merely shares the unenviable reputation of his guild i should say that many of the surface vices born of certain economic conditions have disappeared although i do not see that any great virtues have taken their places or that at the present time any great ethical movement is apparent the synagogue is sterile in that direction and the average rabbi among this class is no ethical factor the public schools which of course reach only the children are much too crowded and have such a superabundance of raw material to work upon that it is impossible for them to reach deep enough into the crowded life of the ghetto great ethical factors are the jewish alliance already mentioned cooper institute with its many lectures and sunday afternoon services and some of the settlements in which many honest attempts are made and splendid results achieved but salvation is still from the jews still from within and the best thing which can be done for the russian jews of new york and for all the jews in america is to make them more truly jewish and that is a task at which happily both jew and christian may work and for that task we all need a larger vision which comes partially at least from knowing one another end of chapter eleven in the ghettos of new york Chapter 12 of On the Trail of the Immigrant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On the Trail of the Immigrants by Edward Steiner. Chapter 12 The Slavs at Home. Nearly the whole eastern portion of Europe is Slavic territory and although here and there broken into by other races it's the slavs own world which he inhabits a world which is constantly growing larger in spite of the fact that his advance in asia has been checked one need not travel longer than a few hours from the german cities of berlin leipzig from the austrian capital vienna or from venice in italy to find himself far from german speech habits and customs on the baltic and on the adriatic as well as on the black sea the slav holds complete possession although politically he may not everywhere be the master he undoubtedly differs in many ways from his close neighbors but just where that difference lies is hard to tell because the portrayal of the characteristics of a race seems perilous the danger being to ascribe to a nation as traits the agreeable or disagreeable impressions gathered from individuals during visits of shorter or longer duration inherited prejudices play no little part in such judgments and again we too often hear nations given praise or blame which is based upon an indigestible dish 
a disagreeable day, a good glass of wine, or joyous camaraderie. To characterize the Slav is doubly difficult because he has managed in the last twenty years to start many conflicts, and therefore has made enemies who are apt to ascribe to him uncomplimentary characteristics. The Englishman has disagreeable notions of the Slav in the East, the German has his Polish problem, the Austrian has the belligerent Czech, the Italian on the Adriatic, has the assertive Illyrian. The Turk doesn't think very highly of his Slav neighbors, the Bulgarians and Montenegrins. It is not only hard not to be prejudiced against the Slav, but it's hard to be informed about him. First, because he has written very little about himself, with a few notable exceptions. And, secondly, because there are so many Slavic tribes which have remained isolated one from the other, have developed upon different lines, or have been influenced by the stronger race to which they happened to be neighbors, so that many characteristics which we ascribe to them are often the borrowed virtues, or, more frequently, the sins of their neighbors. The caption to a picture of three men. From the Black Mountain there is no more sturdy stock in Europe than the Slav on Montenegro, none more ready to turn from gun to wood axe, from blood revenge to citizenship. End of the caption. The Vans, Poles, and Bohemians show in speech and life influences of their German neighbors. The Slovak in Hungary has a strong Magyar taint. The Croatian, Serbian, Bulgarian, and the Montenegrin come dangerously near the Turk. The Dalmatian on the Adriatic, in spite of his resistance against it, shows influences of Venice not only in the magnificent architecture of his churches, but also in language and character. While the Slovene of the Alps has received much good from his brave Tyrolese neighbors, whom, of course, he in turn has influenced. The only Slavic people who present an unbroken surface for observation are the Russians, who, undivided by high mountains or other natural difficulties, have blended their differences to some extent and have become a vast nation with a common language, a common faith, and certain characteristics which have become the common possession of all the people but to generalize even about the russian is impossible inasmuch as there are at least two well-defined types divided geographically and differing not only in outward appearance but in nearly everything about which one is sorely tempted to write in general terms the great russian who occupies the largest part of his native land is undoubtedly of mixed blood the Finnish extraction manifesting itself in the flattened features and the protruding cheekbones. While his enemies say that you need not scratch him long before you strike the Tartar. He is rather roughly made. His features are anything but delicate. The nose is heavy and inclined to be pugnacious. This may be taken as the general tendency of the Slavic nose. His eyes are brown or pale blue and friendly, and the face is suffused by a health-betraying glow. The color of the hair is seldom or never black, and shades all the way from a light brown to a definite red, and from that to a rather indefinite blonde. The other pronounced type is that of the Little Russian who occupies nearly all the southern portion of the country, and differs from his more numerous brothers in physique and habits, as the southern people usually differ from the northern. Note from the reader. Nowadays, Little Russia is better known as Ukraine. The Little Russians are, generally speaking, smaller, the face more delicately chiseled, complexion and hair darker, their women vivacious and handsome, 
and they claim to be of purer Slavic blood, although you do not have to scratch them at all to find the Tartar. The Slav has moved from the Dnieper as far east as the Ural, and has moved beyond it as fast as steam could carry him. He has entered the heart of Europe, is at the doors of the German capital, and has almost supplanted the native Austrian in Vienna. In the Alps, on its southern slopes, he has built his huts within nature's citadels and faces Italy on the Adriatic. In the Balkans, he has asserted himself, has shaken off the yoke of Islam, and is destined to be the master of the Bosphorus, while the Carpathians, which, like a crescent, wind about Hungary, are the stronghold of the ever-increasing Slav. In a larger measure, the other Slavic tribes of non-Russian soil differ one from another. Thus, the Dalmatian is the giant among them, and he of the Bok de Kataro, is a veritable Slavic Apollo, measuring, on an average, six feet three inches. He is dark-skinned and graceful in his movements, but size and beauty decrease as one travels northward toward Bulgaria and Serbia into Hungary, Bohemia, and Poland. One despairs of designating as a race, or even as a nation, a people which differs more widely than one can tell within the limits of a chapter. People who have neither a history nor a literature in common, and whose language, although philologically one, varies so that if they undertook to build a tower or an empire, the confusion of the biblical Babel would find a parallel in modern history. And yet, these differing tribes or nationalities have some things in common, especially in the social life and organism. There is, first of all, a temper, which is among all of them impassive, seldom aroused even under the influence of drink. This explains the ease with which they have been conquered by other races, seldom coming to independence, only the nature of their country having compelled the Russian to make a Russia, which they were a long time in making. This also explains the despotism of the Tsar, the patience with which it has been borne, and the long stretches of years without revolution or reformation. But now his wrath is kindled, and the oppression of years has aroused his fury. The Slav is not a builder of empires, because he is not a citizen but a subject, a severe master or a submissive servant. As a rule, he bears oppression patiently, shrinks from overcoming obstacles, is seldom inquisitive enough to climb over the mountains, which lock in his native village to see what's beyond them, never cares much for the sea and its perils, the Russian's desire for harbors being a political necessity rather than a natural want. Even a democratic institution, such as the Mir in Russia, which borders strongly upon communism, and is by some scholars urged as an indicator of the Slavs' independent spirit, is to me a proof of their lack of that spirit. Anyone who has been at a meeting of the Mir knows that the one or the few never dissent. Things go just as they come, and the strong rascal, and there are such among the Slavs, rules mir or bratstva at his own pleasure, and no one says, why do we are so? The family bears among the Slavs strong archaic forms, especially among those on the south, where the bratstva, brotherhood, is still the unit. A bratstva occupies, according to its size, one or more villages, and church, cemetery, meadows, and mills are held in common. Besides these peaceful possessions, they have every quarrel in common, and every member of the bratstva is most ready to avenge the honor of his people. 
There are characteristics visible in their colonies in America. In Montenegro, the Herzegovina, and also in some parts of Dalmatia, blood vengeance is still practiced, and it not seldom happens that, to avenge one life, war is waged until there is not one male member left who can carry a gun. Then the quarrels are continued by the next generation. The Bratstva is ruled by an elder, elected by all its male members. He is their justice of the peace, the presiding officer at all meetings, and, in case of war, is the captain of his company. The members of a Bratstva consider themselves blood relatives. Intermarriages were formerly prohibited, and even now are not common. The aristocratic spirit shows itself in the fact that mechanics, especially blacksmiths, are expelled from it and share none of its privileges or responsibilities. The elder of the bratstva, or household, is an embryo czar, and the honors shown to him by all its members express the reverence which the Slavs always shows to those in authority. He can withhold permission for smoking, dancing, or playing. No one touches the food until he has tasted it. No one is seated in his presence until he has permitted it. He is the one member of the household who has an individual spoon, which may not be used in the cooking. And yet, from experience, I know that he may sometimes play the czar too much and that there is temper enough left in the household, if not in the men, at least in the women, to make it decidedly uncomfortable for him, and to remind him of his plebeian origin and his democratic relatives. The further north one travels, the more the bratstva decreases, although the large communal households do not entirely disappear even in Russia. Everywhere the bond of relationship is very strong, and to become the godfather of a child unites one to its family for well or woe. There is one relationship common among the southern Slavs which exceeds that of the closest tie of blood. It is that of pobratimstvo, or prosestrimstvo, a brotherhood or sisterhood, or close friendship between two men or two women, or even between a man and a woman, which among Orthodox Slavs is still solemnized with the sacraments of the Church. Of course, this solemn service is followed by a feast, and the following toast shows the spirit of that occasion. With whom drink I today? With thee, honored brother, with thee drink I today, in God's name, the Virgin bless thine early store, increase thine honor more and more, be near thy friend with helpful deed, but never do his help to need. God grant thee much of early bliss, and may the saints thy forehead kiss, may wine for friends abundant flow, and children in thy household grow, may God unite our house and land, and we thus grasp each other's hand. Admirable as is the family tie which binds the Slav, abhorrent even to the strongest Slavophile is the position occupied by women in the family and in the social life among southern and eastern Slavs. To escape the charge of prejudice, I shall quote a few proverbs current among the southern Slavs a few out of many hundreds. The man is the head, the woman is grass. One man is worth more than ten women. A man of straw is worth more than a woman of gold. Let the dog bark, but let the woman keep silent. He who does not beat his wife is no man. What shall I get when I marry? asks a boy of his father. For your wife a stick, for your children a switch. Twice in his life is a man happy, once when he marries, and once when he buries his wife. 
and the women sing in the Russian folk song, which I have freely translated. Love me true and love me quick, pull my hair and use the stick. Although there are love songs of another kind, in which woman is praised for her charms, she becomes virtually a slave as soon as she marries, and the little poetry of the folk song does not accompany her even to the marriage altar. She is valued only for the work she can do in a household and for the children she can bear, and should this latter blessing be denied her, her lot becomes doubly pitiable, and she sometimes seeks release by suicide, after which the proverb says of her, It is better thus, a barren woman is of no use in the world. In Montenegro the proverb says, my wife is my mule, and she is treated accordingly, and to see her bent double beneath her load of wood, flour, or oil, while her liege lord walks erect by her side, with his arsenal of weapons in his girdle, is to see the proverb in action. Yet here, where woman's lot is the worst, woman's virtue is regarded most highly, the penalty for adultery being swift death and the social vice almost unknown. It would, of course, be unjust to charge every Slav with beating his wife, but unfortunately it is the rule rather than the exception among the peasants, and the lot of the Slavic woman grows better only as the Slav is further from Eastern barbarism and nearer to Western civilization. Yet she is wooed with the same ardor as is her more flavored sister, and perhaps she is loved just as much by her husband, only he has a strange way of showing his affection. That the Slavic woman possesses the qualities to make of herself a new woman can be plainly seen among the women of the higher class in Russia, where there is a second paradise for women. America, by common consent, being the first. Among all the Slavs, music is much loved, and the fields in the busiest harvest times are melodious from song. The Czech's love for music has become proverbial, although the proverb is not complimentary to him and was invented by his enemies. It is said that when a Czech boy is born, the nurse hold up to him a penny and a violin. If he seizes the penny, he will be a thief. If the violin, he will be a musician. It is true that every Czech village has its band, which often wanders all over Europe, making melody as it goes, and, in nine cases out of ten, the little Sherman Pand upon which the American bestows his pennies and his jokes, does not come from Germany at all, but from some village in Bohemia. Mechanical musical instruments have played havoc with the native genius of these people. Slavic music has a melancholy strain, and this is especially true of the music of the southern Slav, whose simple musical instruments, the Swirala and the Gusla, are not capable of giving one joyous note, even at a wedding. They may be truly called a Jeremiah instrument. With the love of music goes the love of dancing, and the Czechs and Poles invent new dances for every occasion, while the southern Slavs cling to their monotonous national kolo, which is a reckless sort of kicking exercise, accompanied by the aforesaid instruments while some old minstrel sings of the heroic deeds of the past. Cities among the Slavs are rare. The people usually live in villages, nearly all of which have common characteristics. It seemed strange to find that I could walk through a Russian village near Moscow, and yet could easily think myself among the Slovaks, thousands of miles away, or even among the more picturesque Dalmatians on the Adriatic. The villages all look alike. There is always one street and just one in the village. One wood or mud house leans against the other, 
one thatched roof overlaps the other and there is never more than one fire at a time in a village like this for generally the whole business burns down at once the barns called stodoli are generally built together a short distance from the village the church occupies the center of the village and nearby is a mud puddle where geese pigs and babies take their daily swim put into some convenient place a pump tie some ox teams to it place in the foreground clouds of dust or a sea of mud and you have a fair picture of slavic villages of course they differ in degrees of ugliness the russian village taking the first prize for unadulterated homeliness as there is no sign of beauty not even a primitive attempt at decoration anywhere among the slovaks in hungary and among the neighboring tribes there is an attempt at art crudely painted houses are the rule and somewhere about them there will be an indication of decoration but it requires a vivid imagination to find out just what it is the art spirit being strong but undeveloped little flower gardens near or around the houses are seldom or never seen in russia but are common among the czechs and other western slavs the interior of the houses differs among them as to size and arrangement the russian house has two rooms separated by the main entrance one is called the cold room and the other the hot room the hot or winter room has as its chief possession a brick bake cook and heating stove or oven the top of which is the bed the top of which is the bedstead in the winter time and a very comfortable place it is the cleanliness in these slavic homes is also of varied degrees and is often conspicuous by its absence dirt i am sorry to say is often in evidence and certain insects which would annoy us dreadfully exist in these rooms in uncountable numbers but are treated with silent contempt which does not tend to their diminution the slavic tribes differ in their costumes but nearly all of them have retained the sheepskin coat which they wear summer and winter the wool is turned inside the skin is often colored red and the legs of the sheep hang over the shoulders both men and women wear this coat but of course the woman's coat is decorated in fantastic ways and costs a great deal of money the rest of the man's attire consists of linen trousers and shirt home made from the tough fiber to the coarse stitching a cap is also worn and in russia is generally of fur there are numberless varieties of this dress but in each village all dress alike differing only in the fineness of the material used how do the women dress can a man ever describe a woman's dress and can any mortal describe the slavic woman's dress when in nearly every village they have a peculiar style and oh what styles color in everything red yellow silver and gold laces and embroideries and what not costing sometimes nearly two hundred dollars but of course they do not get a new dress every year just one in a lifetime on if they are really good maybe two the costliness of the woman's dress is the cause of much suffering for although the styles do not change vanity is a shrewd mistress and will put a half inch broader lace upon a woman's cap thus setting all the feminine hearts on fire from envy and the next market day the broader lace will be shading every woman's eyes although perhaps a feather bed had to be pawned or next winter's pig had to wander to the butchers ere its time had come
among the slovaks with whom woman's garb is most costly and most picturesque there is a great desire to lay it aside and adopt the more fashionable dress of society for the peasant's costume compels one to be addressed as an inferior t thou and putting on the modern garb puts one at least in the eyes of strangers upon a higher social level and ani you is the pronoun used the slavic peasant lives simply enough at home his food consists largely of a vegetable diet and meat on the table is the sign of a holiday a wedding or of a fortunate excursion into a neighbor's chicken coop or pigsty among one large tribe they have only one meal a day usually at noon it is cooked in the morning and kept warm under the ashes or under the feather bed until it's time to eat it the main staples of diet among all are potatoes black sour rye bread cabbage for soup and cakes kasha or gruel and finally borscht a concoction made of beets and not half so bad as it looks the czech has a reputation as an epicure and the bohemian girl is generally an excellent cook in addition to her other good qualities to mention slavic cooking and leave out garlic would be hamlet with the prince left out and i feel sure that travelers in slavic countries will readily testify to the excessive presence of this fragrant bulb although they may never have seen it the literature of the slav is abundant and some of it is no doubt great that of bohemia is the oldest that of poland the most finished and that of russia in modern times the most abundant the folklorist has here much virgin territory in which to gather material but it remains to be seen whether it's worth gathering and preserving both folklore and literature are strongly realistic being a reflection of the slavic character and not a protest or reaction as with the germanic people the slav speaks and sings about plain things plainly but naturally and not offensively when one understands the source of his song it never makes sin attractive and consequently is wholesome the lyric love song is made in the hearts of the people travels from lip to lip and is simple and beautiful to the original thus the czech sings if i see thee kneeling praying in the church my dear i am far from god and heaven but to thee am near if i'd love my god in heaven as i now love thee i would saint or very angel in his presence be the slovak sings thus of love whence getteth everybody love in his very breast it grows not on the bushes it's hatched not in the nest and were this love abiding on a rock as heaven high we'd send our hearts to find it yes even if we die more poetically the croatian sings oh what is the love a zephyr mild as gentle as a newborn child to kiss each blossoming flower oh what is love a wild storm cloud a roaring maddening tempest loud a weeping drenching shower oh what is love a scattered gloom a thousand glorious flowers in bloom a glowing burning fireball a giant held by chains and thrall a joyful chiming wedding bell a dreadful chasm a burning hell oh may thy love thou dearest child like spring winds be so sweet so mild oh reach to me thine angel hand and lead me to that heavenly land one of the marked characteristics of the slav is his deep religious feeling if you wander through moscow 
you will see at every step evidences of this in the many churches chapels and wayside icons before which the faithful cross themselves or lie prostrate in the dust everywhere the russian manifests his deep allegiance to the church and every action of his life is in some way influenced by its teaching he obeys implicitly all its rules especially in regard to the many fast or feast days he venerates the churches and cloisters has implicit faith in the intercessions of the saints and every year out of every village go forth pious pilgrims over barren wastes and through dense forests to some sacred tomb in some faraway cloister the height of ambition of every pious mujik is to take a pilgrimage to jerusalem and the whole lifetime is spent in self-denying struggle to accumulate money enough for that purpose common to all the slavs is the tendency to superstition remnants of the old heathenism remain everywhere startling one by stories and usages which during centuries of winter's nights have grown to grotesque proportions in the dark uncomfortable izbas of the peasants and have curiously blended with their christian faith so that it's difficult for them to distinguish one from the other the slav is usually charitable to the poor although not always generous to the weak and he cannot be praised for excessive hospitality he is too often clannish is apt to be jealous and consequently not always faithful or honest the polish and russian peasants are proverbially thievish as one of their current saying has it the only thing which they will not carry away are hot iron and millstones a characteristic which they lose completely under better economic conditions the slav is humanity still in the rough and to that fact are due his faults his virtues his weakness and also his strength end of chapter 12 the slavs at home read by mark chulsky massachusetts 2014Chapter 13 of the On the Trail of the Immigrant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On the Trail of the Immigrant by Edward Steiner. Chapter 13 The Slavic Invasion. The Slovak and the Pole or the hunkies as they are often contemptuously called are among the most industrious and patient people who come to our shores i know this because time after time i have followed them from their native villages across the sea and into the coal mines of pennsylvania or the steel mills coke ovens and limestone quarries along the lakes to which they were called because their virtues as laborers were known even on board ship they are the most patient passengers for hardships are not new to them and the bill of fare meager though it is contains not a few luxuries to which their palates are strangers if it were not for the seasickness they would consider their ocean trip as much of a pleasure as do those of us who cross the sea for a wedding trip or a vacation i have crossed the ocean with them ten times at least and have never heard a word of complaint although their more refined traveling companions say much about their untidiness rudeness and other marks of semi-civilization i have never seen one of them read a newspaper only one man do i remember who read a book and that was a prayer book of the greek church 
they leave their picturesque garb at home and lie on the deck in all sorts of weather in all kinds of dress and undress the women being barefooted even in winter in conversation with the men I can never go beyond the facts that they are going to work, earn money, pay off a mortgage on a piece of land at home, or save enough money to send for Kachka or Anka to be their wedded wife. If the Slovak feels any great emotions when he reaches New York, he never expresses them. He is usually dumb from wonder and half frightened as he faces this new and busy world in which he will be but an atom or just so much horsepower in spite of the contract labor law he is billed to an agent in new york or taken to pennsylvania where his new life begins and too often ends in a coal mine the home which he will make for himself is one of many and all alike are painted green or red shells of buildings into which crowd them fifteen to twenty people who are taken care of by one woman whose husband may be the foreman of a gang and the chief beneficiary of its labor in the town of verboch in hungary I recently met a man who had returned from America with two thousand dollars in his pocket and whose career here is typical of a large number. He came to America fifteen years ago and worked in a mine in Pennsylvania near Pittsburgh. He had stayed long enough to learn English, to be able to receive and give orders and have them carried out, so he became a foreman his wife and children then came and moved into one of the houses previously described bringing with them twenty men boarders through much industry and frugality they saved these two thousand dollars and now in their old age they had returned to spend that money at their pleasure the wife has permanently put off the peasant garb and has retained in her vocabulary such bits of English as come on, go on, and how much, which she displays on every occasion. The children are still in America, one of the sons being in the saloon business and on the road to greater wealth than that which his father accumulated. Their competitors in the field of labor accuse them of filthiness, Yet, after having walked through hundreds of these shanties, I can say that the report of untidiness among them is exaggerated. For the majority of homes are cleaner than their crowded condition would warrant, while there are not a few in which the floors are scrubbed daily and fairly shine from cleanliness just as uncomplainingly as into the life on board ship the slovak fits into the new work whatever it may be and no animal ever took its burden more patiently than he does his as he faces unflinchingly the hot blasts of a furnace or the dark depths of mines he can be worked only in gangs directly by one of his number who has gathered a few crumbs of english and who seasons them freely by those words which are usually printed in dashes such a thing as rebellion he does not know as his whole past history testifies in our strikes he is a very convenient scapegoat and not seldom a sheep led to deeds whose consequences he has not measured in nearly every case of violence which I could trace and in which he took an active part, he was inflamed by drink, which interested persons had given him. He is considered by the tradesmen of his town to be their most honest customer, and one merchant who has dealt with the Slovaks for twelve years 
who has carried them from payday to payday and through strikes and layoffs told me that he had not lost one cent through them while his losses from the other miners were from fifteen to thirty five per cent and with but slight variations this is the testimony of all the merchants in no small measure this is due to their fear of law for in hungary every debt is collectible and not even the homestead is exempt from the executioner there is also no petty thieving in communities where they have lived for twenty years and they have never been accused or even suspected of theft as one common accusation against them is that they spend very little in this country and send most of their earnings abroad i examined this matter very carefully interviewing every merchant and every class of merchants the postmasters and even the saloon keepers and they all agree that these people are fairly good customers in visiting their homes i found that usually they are not lavish as to house furnishings the front room which in the american household would answer for the parlor is filled by the trunks of the boarders and in a few cases has that beginning of american civilization the rocking chair a stand with a white cloth cover holding a few knick-knacks is a rarity but exists in about five per cent of the houses i have visited carpets i have seen only twice but the lace curtain fashion has not a few imitators upon his bed the slovak lavishes a great deal of money making it his costliest piece of furniture while his imported feather beds keep out entirely the more sanitary mattress and blankets he does not stint himself in his food as is commonly supposed for he eats a good deal although his steak being cut from the shoulder is cheap and is always called pollock steak he eats quantities of beans cabbage and potatoes and about eight dollars a month covers the board bill of an adult he drinks too much but drinks economically preferring a barrel of beer for the crowd to the more expensive glass and he carries a bottle in his hip pocket as invariably as the cowboy is supposed to carry a pistol instead of whiskey he sometimes take alcohol and water which may after all be the same rose by another name in buying clothing i am told that he buys the best which is fitted for his work and for his station and to see him after working hours cleanly washed and dressed in american fashion from the boots up to the chalking collar one would not suspect him of miserliness he does save money for out of an average earning of forty dollars a month he will send at least fifteen dollars to hungary and on payday the money order window in the little post office is crowded by these industrious toilers who have not forgotten wife children old parents and old debts many of them claim that they would buy houses in this country if they were assured of steady work and in many places they plead that they cannot buy property because the company owns all the real estate and prefers to rent all the houses falsely called homes unfortunately they have imported into this country their racial prejudices which are keenest towards their closest kin and each mining camp becomes the battleground on which ancient wrongs are made new issues by repeated quarrels and fights which become bloody at times although premeditated murder is rather infrequent in a large number of cases these unfortunate divisions are intermingled by religious differences although the slovak and the pole do not speak well of one another even if they belong to the same church 
the pole regards himself as the special guardian of the roman catholic church and while a majority of the slovaks are of the same church protestantism has made some inroads and the greek church claims many loyal adherents many of the catholics belong to the greek catholic church which is that portion of the greek church in austria which united with rome after the division of poland and which was permitted to use its own slavonic ritual and retain its married clergy only a portion of the greek church entered this union so that nearly every large slovak community has a number of russian greeks who look upon the roman greeks with a great deal of scorn in marblehead on lake erie where these slovaks are engaged in the limestone quarries this division was discovered after all the greeks had built one church that of the roman greeks a few of the wiser ones who arrived in this country later were dreadfully shocked when they saw this and in peter shigalinsky's saloon plans were made to gain possession of the church for the only true greeks the russian many pitched battles were fought a long and fruitless litigation followed and finally peter shigalinsky built next to his saloon a new church whose orthodoxy is emphasized by one of the horizontal pieces of the cross slanting at a more acute angle than that of the roman greek church in which of course there can be no salvation where they have no church of their own they are usually found worshipping with the english or germans if they are romanists but in many cases the priests told me that they are not wanted and must keep to one corner of the building there are not priests enough to shepherd them and those they have are in many cases unfitted for the task it is asserted that the lutheran pastors are no better and count for little or nothing in making these people christians and citizens they are naturally suspicious of strangers but grateful for every kindness and once a door is opened to their heart it is never closed again unfortunately they speech shuts them out from the touch with american people of the same community but there are avenues of approach in which only one language is spoken the language of love and kindness one noble american woman whom i know ministers to them by nursing them and suggesting simple remedies when they are ill and has thus become no small factor in their social and religious redemption of literature little or nothing enters the mining villages although among the poles the hunger for it grows and many papers and magazines are coming into existence the slovak lives an isolated life sublimely ignorant of wars and rumors of wars his breakfast is not spoiled by the glaring headlines of the daily paper nor does the magazine or novel press upon him the problems of human society he knows his camp his mine his shop and though he lives in america and in the most busy states of the union his world now is not much bigger than it was when its horizon touched his village pastures as yet he is not a factor politically though the political boss finds him the best kind of material for he is bought and sold without knowing it and votes for he knows not whom at braddock pennsylvania it was told me that he is sold first to the democrats and then to the republicans and afterwards is naive enough to come back to the democrats and tell of his bargain willing to be bought back into his political family like almost all foreigners 
he is a democrat by instinct or by association one scarcely knows which although he is usually anything that a drink of liquor makes him i asked one his political faith are you a democrat no me catholic greek not russian was the reply what are your politics i asked a number slovak was the invariable answer not twenty per cent of those i interviewed knew the name of our president not two per cent the name of the governor of the state in which they were residing the slovak does not know the meaning of the word citizen and the limited franchise in hungary is exercised for him by those shrewder than himself he is just force and muscle with all the roots of his heart in the little village across the sea and with his brain wherever the stronger brain leads him at a recent election in hungary a district where the slovaks were in a large majority they were nevertheless defeated by the magyar element which knew how to manage them so that they may be said to have had just enough political training to fit them into the political life of the average American community. Although the Slovak is a quiet and peaceful citizen, on feast day he does not consider his religious nature sufficiently stirred without a fight, which is usually a crude, bungling affair, devoid of the science which accompanies such an episode among the Irish and also without the deadly results of an italian fracas on the wedding day of yanko and kachka the silence of the camp is broken by the sound of a screeching violin followed by the wailing of a clarinet and the grunting of a bass viol above the discord of noise made by these instruments is heard the voice of the bridegroom who leads the dances with the song i am so glad i have you i have you and i wouldn't sell you to anyone if you enter the house of the bride you will find it full of sweltering humanity all of it dancing up and down down and up while the fiddlers play and the bridegroom sings about the sweetheart he is glad to have and wouldn't sell to anyone usually the slab dancers provide the notes and the bank notes also for at the end of the piece half a dozen stalwart men will throw themselves in front of the musicians each one of them demanding in exchange for the money tossed upon the table his favorite tune to which he sings his native song the result is half a dozen men each singing or trying to sing a different song all of them pushing crowding and at last fighting until in the middle of the room you will find an entanglement of human beings which beats itself into an unrecognizable mass the wedding lasts three days the ceremony often taking place after the first day's festivities the order of proceedings and the length of the feast vary according to imported traditions which among the slavs are different in every district the caption to a picture of a family of about a dozen people men women and children without the pale not always is the adverse decision of the commissioner so easy as in the case of some serving gypsies who deported from new york found their way to canada and quickly made police records end of the caption of course the whole mining camp is an interested spectator and guests usually do not wait for a formal invitation the ceremony over the wedding dinner is served and never in all the carpathian mountains was there such feasting as there is in the alleghenies pollock steak cabbage with raisins beets slices of bacon 
links of sausages, sweet potatoes, and, last but not least, the great American dish, conqueror of all foreign tastes, pie, huge, luscious, and full of unheard-of delicacies. Beer flows as freely as milk and honey flowed in the promised land. Again, the musicians play, and if the bridegroom has voice enough left, he will sing the song of the sweetheart he is so glad to have and wouldn't sell to anyone, no, not to anyone. Barrel after barrel is emptied until the pyramids of Egypt have small rivals in those built entirely of beer barrels in the little mining town in Pennsylvania. Many of the drinkers fall asleep as soundly as Ramses ever did before he was embalmed. While others are making ready for the end of the feast, the fight, for no fight, no feast, is the proverb. Somebody calls a Slovak a Pollock, or vice versa. Some young man casts glances at some young maiden otherwise engaged and the fight is on. I have never discovered just the reason for the fight, as one might as well search for the cause of a cyclone, but the results are nearly the same. Furniture, heads and glasses, all in the same condition, broken. Everybody on the ground, like twisted forest trees, while one hears between long black curses the peaceful snores of the unconscious drunk. The next day, and the next, the program is repeated, and this is the Slovak's only diversion, unless it be a saint's day, when history repeats itself, and he once more practices his two vices, drinking and fighting. As a rule, the Slav is virtuous, although this depends largely upon local conditions in the village or district from which he comes. One could prove him in certain regions the most virtuous of men, while in others he is just the reverse. Almost without exception, where one woman cooks for fifteen or twenty men, as is often the case in mining camps, they respect her as the wife of one man, while she respects her own virtue and would fight, if necessary, to remain loyal to her husband. There is much coarse, indelicate talk and much crudeness, for this love is a realist in speech and action. Therefore, that which would seem to us immoral is simply his way of expressing himself accustomed as he is to call a spade a spade. The Pole, who emigrates to this country, comes from nearly the same region as the Slovak, and lives very much the same life, although in many things he is his superior. He has greater self-assertion, is not so submissive to the church, chafes more under restraint, has a greater racial and national consciousness, and is, by virtue of his historic development, both better and worse than the Slovak. He becomes more identified with American life, and will remain an important part of it, whether for good or evil, while a large portion of the Slovaks will return to the villages and the peaceful acres from which they are came from which they came. The Polish community is consequently more of an entity and looks toward permanence. The centralizing power is usually the church. Around it, and stimulated by it, grows the Polish town which not unfrequently occupies the best location to be had, with its agencies well organized and controlled. Perhaps the best example of such a Polish town completely governed and controlled by the church is in New Britain, Connecticut, where the population is engaged in manufacturing hardware. 
with rare foresight the best situation in the city was bought and facing the still undeveloped part of this real estate holding the church a magnificent white stone structure was built a church which might well be the pride of any community their priest who is both czar and pope is a strong wise monarch who holds in his keeping the destinies of thousands who trust and obey him implicitly the houses built are rather rude tenements evidently built to bring large and quick results but the sanitary condition must be good if it can be judged by the cleanliness and wholesomeness of the children indeed this part of the city of new britain is as clean and orderly as one might reasonably expect among a population imported to do the roughest kind of labor one is likely to be apprehensive as to the future when one realizes that nearly all the children go to a parochial school in which only a minimum of the english language is taught that the men are all organized into patriotic and religious brotherhoods which march which march armed through the streets one cannot yet determine how much these things will do to prevent americanization and assimilation two things which are exceedingly desirable and which these and other agencies seem to prevent besides slavs and poles lesser group of kriners from the austrian alps croatian and serbian have gathered in the larger slav centers and around them and while in a great measure they live the same life as do their more numerous kindred there are minor differences which are somewhat accentuated by the abnormal conditions under which they all live end of chapter 13 the slavic invasion read by mark chulsky in massachusetts chapter 14 of on the trail of the immigrant this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mark Chulsky in Massachusetts. On the Trail of the Immigrant by Edward Steiner. Chapter 14 Drifting with the Hunkies. The great city had not been kind to them. For three weeks, they had been beaten back and forth all the length and breadth of its hot and inhospitable streets until their little money and their courage were exhausted and they had drifted back to the battery the place nearest home which they could reach quote, without money and without price end quote. they had come here for work and had sought it from shop to shop wherever men with a fair share of muscle were wanted, but they always found that some stronger man had come before them, so they were left, like the sick man at the pool of Bethesda, unhealed at the edge of the water. They had been my traveling companions across the sea, and I felt some responsibility for them, besides being anxious to know what becomes of men in America who have neither our speech, which might be silver, nor the silent gold, which serves as power. So I cast my lot and my small change among them. We traveled as far as a five-cent fare would take us and began looking for work among the large mansions and fancy farms which lined the shore of Long Island Sound. Barking dogs, frightened housemaids and discourteous lakeys we found everywhere but neither work nor food for the four of us we did not look like tramps although our clothes were shabby 
and the dust and grime of the city did not tend to improve our appearance. Yet we spent a whole day looking unsuccessfully for work, and when night came upon us, nothing remained but to return to the city, as bankrupt in our stock of courage as in our finances. That blessed and famous bread line, where the Lord answers his poor people's prayer for daily bread, kept us from starving, and there was enough free ice water to be had to wash down the bread and benumb our digestive organs into silence. Union and Madison Square Park benches were our beds a few minutes at a time, for the watchful policemen kept us moving as if we were drunk from Laudanum. We went the length of Lower Broadway to City Hall Park and finally to the Battery, where the next morning's gray found us wearier and shabbier than ever. Twenty-four such hours as we lived were enough to push us down the social scale to the level of the tramp, and we were greeted as such by those birds of passage, one of whom proved to be a friend in need. He really pitied my speechless companions, and after sharing with us his bagged buns, he told us of New Jersey paradise, where orchards and truck gardens were waiting for the toil of our hands. He promised to accompany us, and was generous enough to offer to pay our way across the river. He seemed to enjoy the task of leadership and unfolded his great plans for us, as he led us along the railroad track by the salt marshes of New Jersey, where we nearly perished from the attacks of mosquitoes. The New Jersey mosquito is enough of a factor to prevent the distribution of the immigrant. I certainly should not blame anyone who preferred the stenches of Rivington Street to the sting of the mosquitoes on the New Jersey marshes. Nowhere was work given us, although we were treated less shrewdly, and in a few cases were offered food in exchange for a few chores. Our traveled friend diligently instructing us to do as little as possible in return for the kind of food which we generally received. The day's earning of food included smoked sturgeon, which was warmy, and ham bones, to which clung a minimum of meat and a maximum of tough skin. On the whole, we were soon made to realize that the New Jersey farmer knew how to drive a good bargain, in connection with what he was pleased to consider his charities. When night came, our friend suggested an empty freight car as our lodging place, and, in lieu of a better one, we went to sleep for the first time in this country, where the bed cost us nothing, and where someone else's property became temporarily our own. We slept, in spite of the soreness of our muscles and the continued attacks of mosquitoes, and when we awoke it was still dark, at least in the car, into which neither starlight nor sunshine could penetrate for we were uh, locked in, our guide and guardian gone, and with him three watches, four coats, and our shoes. After a long, long time, in answer to our cries, a railroad man opened the car and found us more destitute than we had yet been, and in need of a better friend than the one we had lost. I told him our story, and he directed us to a farmer on the Trenton Road, who always needed laborers, and who he was quite sure would take us in, notwithstanding our denuded condition. Barefoot and coatless, we reached the farm, which we recognized by the fact that a sign was tacked to the gatepost, stating in four languages that laborers are wanted within 
In the rear of the house we were received by a beaproned gentleman who proved to be the cook and housekeeper of this strange establishment. After I had told him the story of our adventures, we were invited to breakfast, to which we did ample justice, in spite of the fact that it was prepared by a man who evidently knew little or nothing about the art of cooking. He told me that he, too, had drifted from the great city, an immigrant who had found no standing room in the crowded shops. He told me also that every man at work here was a greenhorn, as he expressed it, and that not one of them had been longer than six months away from the old country. At last the quote-unquote boss came from the field, a rather portly man, red-faced, hard-headed, and with small, beady eyes. He made a poor impression upon me, especially when he began to speak German, a language we had acquired to be able to deal with his help. He offered us the hospitality of his farm and ten dollars a month, beside which he was ready to advance us the necessary farm clothing which he kept in stock for such emergencies. The clothing consisted of overalls, jacket, a straw hat, and very coarse shoes. We were not told what he charged us for them, but I began to suspect the man when that evening he drove me to the village to buy a pair of shoes, none of those in his stock fitting me. When we reached the store, he told the proprietor in English, which I was not supposed to understand, to tell me that the shoes were handmade and cost $3.50. They were common, roughly made shoes which could be bought in any store for a dollar and a quarter, and I have no doubt that the profit was to be divided between these gentlemen. At night, in the loft of the barn, a dozen men, representing about ten nationalities, met, and after looking at one another in stolid silence for a time, went to sleep. In the morning, we were initiated into our task, which consisted of the customary chores, and finally the field work in the patches of garden stuff, where hoeing and pulling weeds were the order of the twelve hours' labor, with the beady eyes of the boss ever upon us. He grew more and more impatient with our unskillful ways, and swore loudly in English and German, terrifying my Slavic friends beyond my ability to calm them. Each day was the same as the one just passed. Hard work in the field, poor food in the kitchen, a hay bed at night, and the impatience of the boss manifesting itself in personal violence against those of us who were the weaker among his slaves. Each day, one or the other man disappeared, some of them leaving behind the little bundle of clothing bought from the farmer. This he immediately appropriated and sold to the next comer, for one or more new men of the same type were sure to drift in, to begin the labor which brought no wages. According to the cook, the four of us broke the record, having stayed nearly a month. About two days before payday, I came in at evening with a broken cultivator. Whether running it into a tree stump had wrecked it, or whether it had been ready to fall to pieces at the slightest provocation, I do not know. But the boss grew violent in his anger and attacked me with a pitchfork, driving me out of the very gate through which I had come twenty-nine days before. I went to the village, and after finding a justice of the peace, laid before him my complaint, but he discouraged any legal action on my part, because I did not have money enough to back it. When night came, I returned to the farm, and calling out my men, who were only too ready to follow, we cut through a tall cornfield, and climbing a wire fence were again on the Trenton Road. We walked the whole night 
into Trenton and out of it, and far on our way to Pennsylvania. The next day we found that our labor was indeed wanted, and a few weeks in the tobacco fields of a Pennsylvania Dutch farmer put money in our purses and flesh upon our muscle. Upon finishing our work we started again upon our journey and soon entered the industrial region of Pennsylvania, where steel furnaces lined the highway and coke ovens illumined the landscape, making the air heavy by their fumes. Here, for the first time, my companions saw labor in America at its highest tension. They were frightened by the pots of glowing metal and made dizzy by the roar of the furnaces. Opportunity for labor was soon secured, but my companions entered into it so timidly that I tried to dissuade them from it, but could not as here alone was steady employment offered to men of their class. I can still see them in the great yard of one of the steel mills, pale and trembling, as if facing the dangers of war. Half-naked, savage-looking creatures darted about in the glare of the molten metal, which now was white, quote-unquote, like the bitten lip of hate then grew red and dark as it flowed into the waiting molds. Close to these hot molds, the men were stationed to carry away the bars still full of the heat of the furnace, and they became part of a vast army of men who came and went, bending their backs uncomplainingly to the hot burden. I watched them day after day coming from their work, wet, dirty, and blistered by the heat, dropping into their bunks at night, breathing in the pestilential air of a room crowded by fifteen sleepers, and in the morning crawling listlessly back to their slavish task. No song escaped their parched lips, attuned to their native melodies, and the only cheer came on payday, when the silver dollars looked twice as big as they were, when a barrel of beer was tapped at the boarding house, and this hard world was forgotten. Then they tried to sing from throats made hoarse by the heat. Cervene pivo, bile colace. With the song came memories of their native village, the inn and the fiddlers, the notes of the mazurka and crack of young, and visions of the wives and children who awaited their return. To the town they went that day and sent twenty dollars each out of the month's earnings to Kachka and Suzanka and Marinka, and the anticipation of their gladness making them happy too. It was the beginning of the second month, and I had drifted back to watch my men at the furnaces. They were still carrying hot bars from one place to the other and had withered into almost unrecognizable dryness. I watched these gigantic monsters consuming them, and as I watched, a terrible thing happened. An appalling noise arose above the roar to which my ears had grown accustomed and which seemed the normal stillness. White rising serpents shot out from the boiling furnaces and were followed by other monsters of their kind which burned whatever they touched and before i knew what had happened the whole dark place was full of smoke and the smell of burning flesh eight men my three among them had been caught by the molten metal scorched in its own fire and consumed by its unquenchable appetite. What happened? Nothing. A coroner came to view the remains, of which there were practically none. Out of the center of the cold metal, lumps of steel were cut and buried, and that is all that happened. And, oh, it happens so often. As I write this, the daily paper lies before me, the Chicago Tribune, 
of May 13th, 1906, it devotes six columns to the horrors of the steel mills in South Chicago. I could fill the whole paper with the horrors which I have witnessed in mill and mine, and I could fill pages with the names of poor hunkies, whom nobody knows and about whom nobody cares. I cannot write it. It makes me bitter and resentful, so I shall let this newspaper reporter speak, and he knows but half the story. I know the other half, but the whole truth would hardly sound credible. Center of Mill Horrors Here in this hospital building and its environment centers the horror of horrors of the untutored mill workmen. Its inspiration is terror to the millman of the polyglot payroll as he enters the 88th Street gate to his work. Hun, Paul, Austrian, Bulgarian, Bohemian, the hunkies of Illinois steel colloquialism, indifferent to pain of shattered, burned, mangled body, grow frantic as the stretcher bearer nears this fortress hospital. At its gates, over and over again, the frantic, hysterical wife and children of the victim have begged and pleaded for admission against the grim barrier of the guards. Why is it? You cannot get the information in South Chicago unless it be that these men are ignorant. South Chicago distinctly doesn't like the hunky. He jams the money order window of the post office for two long days after the bimonthly payday. He sleeps sometimes thirty deep in a single room after the day shift, and he sleeps again in the still warm floor bed thirty deep after the night shift. He has his grocer's book, on which are entered his scant half of full meats, which day after day are prepared for him by his hired cook. He wears little and he sleeps in that. His bed is never made for the reason that someone always is in it. His money goes to the saloon keeper or through the foreign money order window at the post office. He is merely a hunky in Illinois Steel or in South Chicago. What if the Illinois Steel Hospital is his conception of Inferno? He doesn't know much. He doesn't know when he is spoken to unless it is by an epithet which makes any other man fight. Then he moves doggedly and often with little understanding. Not understanding, he is the chosen, predestined occupant of the hospital bed. From accident to hospital. A hunky who has been hunked in Illinois steel makes a lot of strictly corporation trouble. The chief safety inspector and his staff are alert and active at a moment's notice of an unofficial accident report. The Illinois steel photographer and his camera are made ready. The stretcher bearer sees stretchers to the necessary number and a hurried move is made toward the scene of the accident, of which the Chicago Police Department may never know. On the scene, the camera is set and the photograph, which so seldom is ever seen beyond the gates of Illinois Steel, is made. Then the hunky, protesting if he be conscious enough, is picked up, put upon the stretcher, and the giant bearers of the body start for the hospital, which may be a mile away. There are difficulties in the march. Surface lines for ore and coal trains net the grounds. Often a train's crew finds difficulty in breaking a train to let the body through. Sometimes the crew balks and swears, and the stretcher bearers wait for the shunting of the cars. In the hospital, few people know and they don't talk. There is a visiting hour but the surly guard at the gate passes upon the applicant's request long before the request may be repeated at the hospital door. And at the door they don't encourage, 
VISITORS End of chapter 14 Drifting with the Hunkies Chapter 15 of On the Trail of the Immigrant this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On the Trail of the Immigrant by Edward Steiner Chapter 15 The Bohemian Immigrant Whatever apprehensions one may have about the Slav in America may be dispelled or accentuated by a study of the Bohemian immigrants. They began coming to us when, during the Counter-Reformation under Ferdinand II, Austria sent her Protestants to the gallows or to America. In Baltimore, the churches they founded still stand, and a sort of forefathers' day is observed by their descendants, who, though they have lost the speech of their fathers, still cling to the historic date which binds them to a band of noble pioneers, close comrades, in spirit to the pilgrims of New England. Under Austrian rule, Bohemia became impoverished physically, mentally, and spiritually, and after the misgovernment of church and state had done its worst, the flood tide of immigration set in anew towards this country. Bohemia grew to be in the last century an industrial state, and the immigrants who came here were half-starved weavers and tailors who naturally flocked into the large cities. In New York, nearly the whole Bohemian population turned itself to the making of cigars, and the east side, from 50th to about 65th streets, is the center. In Cleveland, Ohio, more than 45,000 Bohemians live together, while Chicago boasts of a Bohemian population of over 100,000, who nearly all live in one district, which began on 12th and Halstead Street, but now stretches southward almost to the stockyards, with a constant tendency to enlarge its boundary towards the better positions of the city. The large tenement house is almost altogether absent from this locality, the little frame house of the cigar box styled being the prevailing type of dwelling, and most of the homes are owned by their tenants. This part of the city is as clean as the people can make it in a place where street cleaning is a lost or never learned art. The prevailing dirt is clean dirt with here and there an inexcusable morass which offends both the eye and nostril. The whole district is typical of Chicago rather than of Bohemia, and if it were not for the business signs in a strange and unfanatic language, and occasionally a sentence in the same queer speech, one might imagine himself anywhere among any American people of the working class nor there is a trace of the native country in the interiors, where one finds stuffed parlor furniture, plush albums, lace curtains, ingrain carpets, and a piano or organ, all true and sure indications of American conquest over inherited foreign tastes and habits. Yet the conquest is only on the surface, for it takes more than a carpet sweeper to wipe out the love of that language for which Bohemia has suffered untold agony, to which it has clung in spite of the pressure brought to bear upon it by a strong and aristocratic government, and which it is trying to preserve in this new home, in which the English language is more powerful to stop foreign speech than is the German in Austria though backed by force of law and force of arms. With many Bohemian daily newspapers, with publishing houses, printing new books each day, with preaching in the native tongue, and with societies in which Bohemian history is taught, the Czechish language will not soon disappear from the streets of Chicago, and language to the Bohemian 
as indeed to all the Slavs is history, religion, and life. The Bohemian immigrant comes to us burdened by rather unenviable characteristics, which his American neighbor soon discovers, and the love between them is not great. Coming from a country which has been at war for centuries, and in which today a fierce struggle between different nationalities is disrupting a great empire and clogging the wheels of popular government, he is apt to be quarrelsome, suspicious, jealous, clannish, and yet factious. He hates quickly and long, and is unreasoning in his prejudices, yet that for which a people is hated, and which we call characteristic of race or nation, soon disappears under new environment, and the miracle which America works upon the Bohemians is more remarkable than any other of our national achievements. The downcast look, so characteristic of them in Prague, is nearly gone. The surliness and unfriendliness disappear, and the young Bohemian of the second or third generation is as frank and open as his neighbor with his Anglo-Saxon heritage. I rather pride myself upon my power to detect racial and national marks of even closely related peoples, but in Chicago I was severely tested and failed. I have addressed many Bohemian audiences to which I could pay this compliment that they looked and listened like Americans, but what thousands of years have ploughed into a people cannot be altogether eradicated, and the Bohemian, with all of us, carries his burden of good and evil buried in his bones. Of all our foreign population, he is the most irreligious, fully two-thirds of the hundred thousand in Chicago, having left the Roman Catholic Church and drifted into the old-fashioned infidelity of Thomas Paine and Robert Ingersoll. Nowhere else have I heard their doctrine so boldly preached, or seen their conclusions so readily accepted, and I have it on the authority of Mr. Jeringer, the editor of the Svornost, that the Rhine Chicago alone, 300 Bohemian societies which teach infidelity, carry on an active propaganda for their unbelief, and also maintain Sunday schools in which the attendance ranges from 30 to 3,000. One of the most painful and pathetic sights is this attempt to crush God out of the child nature by means of an infidel catechism, the nature of whose teaching is shown by one of the first questions and its answer. What duty do we owe to God? Inasmuch as there is no God, we owe him no duty. End of quote. As it is always possible to exaggerate the strength of such a movement, I called on the editor referred to above, one of the leaders, whose paper, in common with two others, pursues this tendency and daily preaches its destructive creed. Calling at the office of the Svornost, I found Mr. Jeringer, a bohemian of the second generation, frank and open in acknowledging his leadership and the tendency of his paper, although he was less extreme than the statements about him by priests and preachers had led me to suppose. He certainly was much more willing to talk about his people than were the priests upon whom I had called, and I found that his views have not been without change in the fifteen years since I last read his paper. We are fighting Catholicism rather than religion he said. And I added, a Catholicism in Austria, with its back towards the throne and its face towards the Austrian eagle. To which he replied, you have hit the nail on the head. In reality, this hatred extends unreasonably to all religion, and among the less educated, it amounts to a fanaticism which does not stop short of persecution and personal abuse. 
Blasphemous expressions and old musty arguments against the Bible are the common topics of conversation among many Bohemian working men, who hate the sight of a priest, never enter a church, and are thoroughly eaten through by infidelity. They read infidel books about which they argue during the working hour, and the influence of Robert Ingersoll is nowhere more felt than among them. His Mistakes of Moses had taken the place of the usual newspaper story, and the editorials are charged by hatred toward the church and toward Christianity as a whole. The unusual number of suicides among the Bohemians is said to be due to the fact that their secret societies encourage suicide. The books published in Chicago are of a rather low type, and among them are many whose sole purpose it is to vilify the church. An unusually coarse materialism pervades the colony. Professor Masaryk, of the University of Prague and a recent visitor to this country, makes this the chief note of his complaint against them. They have singing and Turner societies after the manners of the Germans, but the ideals they foster are really the causes of their materialism and infidelity. The Roman Catholic Church is fighting that spirit by maintaining strong parochial schools encouraging the organization of lodges under its protection, and it now publishes a daily paper. The Protestants cannot boast of more than 1% of members among them, and the three small churches in Chicago are but vaguely felt and are practically no factors in the life of this large population. We don't know what they are here said one of the infidel leaders, and the Catholics take no notice of them at all. Some Protestant literature is scattered among them, but it is not of the highest type, and is not calculated to reach those who need it most. Chicago is as much a bohemian center for America as is Prague for the old Bohemia and the type of thought found there is duplicated in all the bohemian centers that I visited. Everywhere there is a battle between free thought and Catholicism, and many a household is divided between the Svornost and the Catholic. Yet I have good reason to believe that this infidelity is only a desire for a more liberal type of religion, only a strong reaction and not a permanent thing and I found signs of weakening at every point. The little village of New Prague in southwestern Minnesota is a good example. It is the center of a large Bohemian agricultural community and has the reputation of being a tough town and quite a nest of infidelity. I found it a clean and prosperous place of 1,500 inhabitants outwardly neater and better cared for than the ordinary western village. It has a clean and wholesome-looking hotel, a little Protestant church and a big Catholic church, and the usual variety of stores. I was surprised to find the hotel without the customary bar, and to my question about it the hotel keeper replied, I have no use for bars. I ain't no drinking man and I don't want nobody else to drink. The editor of the New Prague Times had been pointed out to me as the chief infidel, yet I found him an interested reader of the outlook and kindred literature, and a rather fine type of the liberal Christian. Indeed, while, of course, the Chicago Svornost and its kind find a great many readers, I came to the conclusion that with the infidels were classed all those who refused to go to confession or had helped to secure a fine edifice for the public school. From the banker, the physician, the druggist, and the photographer, I received additional proof that my conjecture was correct, and the only one who had little to say in praise of these people and much in blame was the village priest a true type of the Austrian Catholic 
who would rule with an iron hand if he could, and who misses the strong support of government. Typical of him was the answer to my question as to his touch with the people in comparison with that of the Austrian priest at home. You know, in Austria the state pays us, and we don't need to come in close touch with the people, but here it is different. Here the people pay, and that alone brings us in closer touch. End of quote. My impression of New Prague is that it's neither tough nor infidel. It is true that it has saloons and too many of them, that the continental Sabbath is the type of its rest day, but in outward decency and in the degree of intelligence among its professional and businessmen, it rivals any other town of its size with which I am acquainted. It is surrounded by Irish and American settlements, the first of which is surpassed in order and decency, and is not far from the other in enterprise and an unexpressed desire to establish the kingdom of God upon the earth. Unfortunately, the saloon holds an abnormally large place in the social life of the Bohemians, and beer works its havoc among them socially and politically. The lodges, of which there are legion, are above or beneath saloons, and all societies down to the building and loan associations are in close touch with them. It is the pride of Bohemian Chicago that two of its greatest breweries are in the hands of its countrymen, and brewers and saloon keepers control much of the Bohemian vote. I asked one of the politicians whether that element was active in politics, and he replied, Oh, yes. We have five aldermen and the city clerk. The fact is that they have given Chicago a poor class of officials and have placed their worst infidels in the city council and on the school board. There is not a little avowed anarchy among them, and a great deal more of Marxian socialism, one of the daily papers advocating the latter political faith. Just as there is much dangerous half-knowledge on religious subjects, so there is on politics, and the worst and yet the most eloquent arguments I have heard on socialism have been by these agitators. Though the Bohemian is very pugnacious, he is easily led, or, or rather easily influenced, and in times of political excitement I should say that he would need a great deal of watching. He is much more tenacious of his language than customs than the German, and I have found children of the third generation who spoke English like foreigners. An appeal to his history, to the achievements of his people, awakens in him a great deal of pride, which he easily implants into the hearts of his children. This does not make him a worse American, and in the Bohemian heart, George Washington soon has his place by the side of John Huss, and ere long is first with this new countryman. The Bohemian is intelligent enough to know what he escaped in Austria, and thus values his opportunities in America. Undoubtedly, too often he confuses liberty with license, but in this he is not a sinner above others. His greatest sin is his materialism and he stunts every part of his finer nature to own a house and to have a bank account. Children are robbed of their youth and of the opportunity to obtain a higher education by this hunger after money, and parental authority among the Bohemians has all the rigor of the Austrian absolutism which they have transplanted, but which they cannot maintain very long, for young Bohemia is quickly infected by young America, and the small-sized revolution is soon started in every household. It is then that the first generation thinks its bitterest thoughts about this country, and its baleful influence upon the young. In fact, the second generation is rather profligate in sowing its wild oats, quote-unquote. 
which are reaped in the police courts in the shape of fines for drunkenness, disorderly conduct, and assault and battery. The Bohemian is among the best of our immigrants, and yet may easily be the worst, for when I have watched him in political riots in Prague and Pilsen, or during strikes in our own country, I have found him easily inflamed, bitter, and relentless in his hate, and destructive in his wild passion. He has lacked sane leaders in his own country, as he lacks well-balanced leaders in this. The settlement and missionary workers in Chicago find him rather hard material to deal with, for he is unapproachable, not easily handed, and repels them by his suspicious nature and outward unloveliness. Although he is better than he seems, and not quite so good as he thinks himself to be, for humility is not one of his virtues. He develops best where he has the best example, and upon the farms of Minnesota and Nebraska he is second only to the German, whose close neighbor he is, and with whom he lives in peace, strange as it may seem. The Bohemian is here to stay, and scarcely any of those who come will ever stand again upon St. Charles Bridge and watch their native Moldava as it winds itself along the ancient battlements of Golden Prague, as they love to call their capital. America is their home, for better or for worse, quote-unquote. They love it passionately, and yet one who knows their history, every page of it aflame with war, need not wonder that they turn often to their past and dwell on it, lingering there with fond regret. Some years ago, while I was in Prague, Antonin Dvorak, the composer, celebrated his 60th birthday, and the National Opera House was the scene of a gala performance and a great demonstration in his honor. They gave his national dances in the form of a grand ballet, and to the notes of those wild and melancholy strains of the mazurka, the kolo, and the krakowian, came all the Slavic tribes in their picturesque garb, and all were greeted by thunderous applause as they planted their national banners. At last came a stranger from across the sea, and in his hand was a flag, the stars and stripes, while to greet him came Bohemia, with Bohemia's colors waving in her hands, and these two received the greatest applause of that memorable evening. These two are in the heart of this stranger. Faithful to the old, he will ever be loyal to the new. How to be loyal to this flag in times of peace? At the ballot box, on the streets of Cleveland during a strike, as a citizen and alderman in Chicago, is the great lesson which he needs to learn, and we need to learn it with him. He will remain the Bohemian longest in the agricultural districts of Minnesota and Nebraska, where he holds tenaciously to the speech of his forefathers. But in spite of that, I consider him a better American than his brother in the city. He needs to find here a Christianity, which will satisfy his spiritual nature and which will become the law of his life, a religion which binds him and yet will make him truly free, and that we all need to find. Above all, he has to resist the temptation to make bread out of stone, to use all his powers to make a living and none of them to make a life, and that is a temptation which we must all learn to resist, for neither man nor nation can, quote-unquote, live by bread alone. End of chapter 15, The Bohemian Immigrant, read by Mark Chulsky in Massachusetts. Chapter 16 of On the Trail of the Immigrant. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Suman Barua. On the Trail of the Immigrant by Edward Steiner. Chapter 16 Little Hungary. The initiated New Yorker knows half a dozen restaurants at the edge of the great ghetto where eating and drinking are a pleasure bought for a modest price and where the fragrance of fine cigars mingles with that of better wine and good fellowship reigns supreme some of these restaurants are splendidly furnished and cater to the lucrative trade of those americans who have had a taste of the social life of southern europe and who like to lapse into its mild sins every once in a while one of these places now so fashionable that the real hungarian rarely darkens its doors where the popping of champagne corks is heard in the early morning hours and where the oyster and lobster have almost entirely supplanted the native gulias is one of the pioneers among them and in its early days served as a boarding house for the hungarian jews who for one reason or another had exiled themselves from the gay boulevards of budapest here they tried to find consolation in food cooked Maillard fashion and in playing for a few hours at Clabrius their social game of cards, which could also occasionally degenerate into gambling. The keeper of the place, whose Semitic name of Cohen had been changed into the Maillard colony, recovered the fortune which he had lost in the old country, but in spite of the fact that his bank account grew larger every day, he still kept the boarding-house as he had always kept it, with his wife as the cook and himself as the waiter. In stentorian voice he would call out, Harom Lovos, three soups, or Harom Gulyash, three Hungarian stews. Into the kitchen and out of it he would rush with full and empty plates in evident enjoyment of his hard task. The reputation of the place travelled as far as Broadway, and great was the day when rich clothing merchants came to eat his twenty-five cent dinner with evident relish but still greater the day when their genteel customers were brought thither to taste of the flesh pots of little hungary with increased speed he would run to the kitchen calling harom lovos returning with three plates of soup upon his outstretched arm unburdened by a coat sleeve and his bank account grew and his children also two sons boys still held the father call out the orders until they came to a realization of the dignity of the business and the size of their father's bank account it was a sorry day for simon coroney when bills of fare appeared upon his tables they were there only after a bitter struggle which cost him many a sleepless night with the bills of fare came waitresses, leaving the old man no occupation but to stand silently and receive the quarters which were heaped in great piles in the till, while he grew daily more silent and morose. The sons had caught the enterprising spirit of this country. They bought a lot on a street a few blocks nearer Broadway and built a house with a suggestion of hungry in its style. The dining room was frescoed in Hungarian scenes with mottoes in Maillard tongue and was soon transformed into a fashionable resort. Simon Coroney, the founder of Little Hungary, moved into the house reluctantly. Stormy scenes followed the introduction of American dishes into the bill of fare and when as a last straw a cash register appeared on the counter, the old man's heart almost broke. Hesitatingly, his gentle old fingers moved over the keys of the machine, but he was pushed rudely aside by the hurrying hand of his younger son. Thus, dishonoured in the sight of his guests, Simon Coroney, tottering like a drunken man, went to his apartments upstairs, and there remained until the Chavra Kedisha, the Jewish funeral society, carried him to his last resting place. A few blocks north of these fashionable little Hungaries, the real Hungary begins, and hither come the Mayars, as the ruling race in Hungary is called. 
if you call them slavs they will reject it as an insult the mayar has not the slightest relation to the slavs unless it be that of ruling a portion of them with a rather iron hand and hating all of them proportionately the mayar's closest relation is to the finns on the north and to the turks in the east of europe and he is classed anthropologically as a agro fin in his development he has leaned closely to the west having a germanic culture while still retaining a somewhat untamed asiatic nature which manifests itself in nothing worse than a love of fast horses fiery wine and the wild music with which the gypsy bewitches him and draws the loose change out of the pockets of his tight-fitting trousers in that strange conglomerate of races and nationalities called the astro-hungarian empire the mayar has gained a dominant influence and although numerically among the smallest he has gained for himself the greatest privileges and practically dictates the policy of the empire upon those rich plains by the danube and the theis he has been a ploughman who enjoyed the fruits of his toil as long as the marauding turk would let him furnishing wheat and corn for the rest of europe and gaining not a little wealth since his arch enemy has been driven back into peace what he has made of his country in the last forty years of internal and external peace how he has created for himself a capital which surpasses vienna and build factories and railroads and rival anywhere forms a glorious page in the history of europe from this comparatively wealthy country from its freedom its broad prairies and its picturesque village life there have come to america one hundred thousand men and women who are hard to win from this mayar land but who like all others finally lose themselves in the national life bringing into it fewer vices and more virtues than we ever connect with the hungarian as he is superficially known among us in little hungary rosy-cheeked maidens with bare arms akimbo stand in many a doorway while their swains caught them on the street as they were in the habit of doing at home nearly every second house advertises sorbor or palenka for sale the wine beer and whisky to which the mayar is devoted everywhere one hears the sound of the cymbal that unpromising instrument which looks more like a kitchen utensil than anything else but out of which the gypsy hammers sweet music little hungary has but a small domain in new york it ends abruptly with more restaurants in which goulash the favorite stew of the mayar lures the appetite close by is little bohemia and finally the big germany which overshadows every other nationality the hungary of new york however is only a stopping place is more jewish than mayar and consequently does not promise a good field for observation in cleveland some twenty thousand mayars live together round about those giant steel mills which send their black smoke like a pall over that much alive but very dirty city although street after street is occupied solely by them i have not seen a house that shows neglect and the battle with cleveland dirt is waged fiercely here judging by the clean doorsteps window panes and white curtains which i saw at nearly every house a large catholic church with its parochial school dedicated to saint elizabeth the hungarian queen shows that the mayar does not neglect his religion there are also a greek catholic church and a flourishing protestant congregation a weekly newspaper keeps the hungarians in touch with one another and with the homeland although it does not represent the mayar spirit either by its contents or through the personality of its editor who has no influence among his countrymen i looked in vain for a hungarian political boss for no party can claim these people exclusively social democracy has made great gains among them which is due in no small measure to the fact that they come from a comparatively wealthy country from conditions which are not unbearable and from something of ease and comfort and so finding the work in the iron mills hard and grinding 
they soon grow dissatisfied which means social democracy a sort of pessimistic philosophy is developed and the happy hungarians grow melancholy dejected and homesick they cling with a rare tenacity to the fatherland in which they have a just pride and whenever the opportunity offers itself they show how much they love it the erection of a monument to louis kossuth by men and women of the laboring classes the enthusiasm with which it was dedicated the festivities which recall by speech song and dress the greatness of the man whose memory they honoured speak much for their idealistic and loyal love of country of all foreigners the hungarians are among the most tolerant towards the jews who live in large numbers in hungary while hungarian jews in cleveland love to be known as Mayars and are treated as such by their fellow countrymen the Mayars' good nature is also shown by his treatment of the gypsies who have followed him in large numbers to america and are really a sort of parasite being supported by the easy-going and pleasure-loving Mayars who dance the zardas to the fiery notes of fiddles and cymbals whose owners finally possess the large portion of their patron's wages the hungarian gypsy boy who is supposed to choose between the violin and the penny must in most case take the two for in hungary as in america he is both musician and thief with equal adeptness one gypsy in cleveland keeps a saloon which is a combination of the hungarian zarda inn and its american namesake the saloon and it combines the evils of both institutions the regular bar is supplemented by rickety chairs and tables and a clear space for the dancing floor without which the hungarian zarda does not exist on saturday night the suit of the week washed away the hungarian is found here in all his native glory his moustache twisted to the fineness of a needle point is his most prominent national characteristic unless it be his small shining eyes which barely escape looking out into the world from mongolian openings a small head and prominent cheekbones are also characteristic while the colour of the hair is dark brown and black the blonde being almost unknown he differentiates himself from his neighbour the slav by his agility of both temper and limbs and to see him dance as zardas to hear him sing it and the gypsy play it is as good as seeing that other acrobatic performance a circus when the gypsy innkeeper knows that his guests have payday money in their pockets he has ready a band of gypsies who look shabby enough and very unpromising from an artistic standpoint the leader who plays the first violin tunes it with remarkable care and tenderness the second violin scrapes a few hoarse notes after him the bass viol comes in grudgingly and the cymbal player exercises his fingers by beating cotton-wrapped sticks over the strings of his strange instrument one patriotic youth who has had just enough liquid fire poured into him now lifts his voice and sings a song of the pasta the hungarian prairie of the horses and cattle which graze upon it and of the buxom maiden who draws water from the village well slowly pathetically almost painfully melancholy the notes ring out as if the singer were bewailing some great loss the musicians follow upon their instruments as sorrowful mourners follow a hearse but all at once the measure becomes brisk and the notes jubilant the singer and the musicians are caught as by a fever faster and faster the bows fly over the strings the cymbal is beaten furiously and the bass viol seems in a roaring rage sunday morning finds the dancers sobered and reverent on the way to church most of them going to the roman catholic church in which a zealous priest blesses but is not blessed by them seldom have i found among foreigners such frank criticism of the priest and yet such loyalty to the church the hungarian catholic is not narrow he is much more liberal than the slav or the german austrian and a bigoted priest may hold him to the church but will not win him to himself 
it is always hard to judge of a priest or preacher from the reports of disgruntled members of his flock but the catholics seldom speak ill of their shepherd unless there is much hard truth to tell the following which i heard from trustworthy sources is characteristic at a meeting of one of the lodges the motion was made to have a mass said on a certain memorial day the priest arose to second the motion and said we have two kinds of mass the five dollar and the ten dollar one and i would not advise you to have the cheap one true or untrue the fact remains that this priest has built a fine church and a magnificent parochial school he is a good financier and i doubt not that he is such for the glory of his church and not for his own enrichment i can testify to the fact that he has done much good that he has quieted much turbulence that he is not a friend of strong drink and that he is a narrow but exceedingly careful shepherd of his flock the greek catholic priest in cleveland was driven from the church by his independent parishioners who found him not only a good financier but a bad man a peddler in holy goods as they called him who was ready to dispense his blessing to man and beast for money large or small or for a drink more often large than small the protestant church is shepherded by a young man from the berlin theological seminary who is in touch with the american life and its interpretation of the christian church and ministry the protestant hungarian is as a rule better educated morally on a higher level and in america more quickly assimilated than his catholic brother in hungary this has well defined causes first splendidly equipped protestant ministers not a few of them graduates of english and scotch universities and imbued by the puritan spirit of those countries second a protestant theology of the calvinistic type which harsh and hard as it is makes everywhere strong men and women and which in hungary distinguishes the calvinistic communities from the catholic by a severer philosophy of life and a much more moral conduct the third cause may in the eyes of some persons be the most real one wherever a religious community is in the minority and is or has been severely persecuted it becomes thrifty and highly moral whatever the reason the fact exists and is a pleasant one to chronicle not so pleasant is the problem that in common with all foreigners the maya presents neither church priest nor preacher holds authority over him very long after he reaches these shores he rebels against loses interest in his church and finally ceases to support it neglect not seldom ends in hate and a rude atheism is a common disease among these people besides this it is not easy to find enough and suitable priests and preachers for these foreigners as slight differences in language call for different pastors and in cleveland alone the church could use advantageously men of twenty nationalities of whose existence the average man has scarcely any idea the imported pastor is almost always in discord with his congregation which is generally in accord with the freer american spirit and cannot be treated as he treated his parish in hungary or poland many perhaps most of the pastors who are educated abroad have no sympathy with the democratic spirit of our country and they frequently complain of its effect upon their authority i met one such priest on his way back to europe he was leaving his work because as he said i could find nobody in my parish to black my boots for everybody considered himself as good as i am in the old country my people would stop on the street and kiss my hand but here the children say hello father and go on their way the ministers trained in america are few and these are yet young and inexperienced the english protestant churches are not seriously concerned about this growing problem the solution of which does not consist only in building missions and paying money into the treasury but also in presenting to these foreigners a living 
acting and blessing Christ, who when uplifted draws all men unto him. It is good to be able to say of people who come to a strange country, as of the Hungarian, that they maintain their integrity. He is, as a rule, honest, easily imposed upon, somewhat quarrelsome, addicted to drink, not so industrious as the Slav, but much more intelligent, comprehending more easily and assimilating more quickly. He is not a problem but a lesson. Crossing the ocean in December on the Red Star Line steamer, Vaterland, I found among the mixture of steerage passengers over 200 Mayars, or, as we more exactly call them, Hungarians. I was eager to know what they were carrying home to their native country after years of living with us, and I found that many of them seemed completely untouched by the American life. Their language spoken by but a few people in Europe is almost unknown in America, and the man without a language is almost always the man without a country. If anything, these poor creatures seemed worse than when they came, for many of them had failed and were broken in spirit. Some whose tongues had become loosened were aware of the larger life and were full of the praises of America. They were going back to look again upon the village in which they were born, in which they made whistles from the hanging willows by the creek, where they chased the pigs into the mud puddles, where they lived their small and simple life, and to which they were now returning as travelled men. They had crossed the ocean, seen miles of earth, had struggled with wind and weather, felt freedom's breezes blow, and had grown mightily. Brain, heart, and soul had developed, or perhaps only changed, but even change is experience, if not always life and growth. It was good to talk to these men who had arrived, who saw things as we see them and felt them as we feel them, and who carried American flags in their pockets to show to their friends, and who gloried in their American citizenship. I love the old country, said one of them, but I love America more. Stay in Hungary? Oh no, I do not even want to die there, but if I do, I want them to wrap me in this shroud and he pulled out of his pocket the stars and stripes. End of chapter 16 Little Hungary Chapter 17 of On the Trail of the Immigrant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chapter 17 The Italian at Home. Somber as is the Slavic world from which both Jew and Slav emigrate, so bright and joyous is all Italy, the home of most of the Latins who come to us. Nowhere in Europe does the sky seem so blue, the stars so brilliant in their setting, or the color of the earth and sea so entrancing. Approach it as you will, it fills you and thrills you with pleasure unspeakable, and to eyes unaccustomed to the sober plains of Russia and the dull colorlessness of her villages, it seems as unreal as a dream or the stage setting of grand opera. Venice, Genoa, Naples, Milan, Florence, Rome, these names conjure more in one's vision than the pen can record. But one could mention a hundred little spots to us, nameless, towns with their own beauty, with their own art treasures, and their own large influences upon the history of mankind. All Italy has mountains and plains, the north and the south vast natural contrasts, yet there is everywhere the one inexplicable charm which makes the name of the country synonymous with beauty and art. Yet while Italy is one, the Italian is not. A great gulf still divides the people of different provinces and districts, and old political divisions still survive, leaving their marks upon the speech and the character of the individual. All the older and newer invasions have left their traces, and wherever an alien army has come, it has plowed its way with the sword into the life of these impressionable people. 
where the slav has touched the italian you see his heavy finger marks in a rougher exterior a slower gait a harsher speech more industry and less art where the austro-germans have enthralled and governed him you will find him more governable more sedate more a statesman and less a revolutionist a captain of industry rather than a leader of brigands more a business man and less a dreamer where the French crossed the mountains, they made a gateway for their tastes and habits, which blended quickly and easily into the Italian character, for the Italians were never very unlike the French, who were their friends and enemies in turn, and often both at the same time. Where the Arabians and the Greek touched the South with thought and thoughtfulness, with culture and vices, with rest and restlessness, these contrasts are accentuated in the Italian, who, although small in stature, is great in passions and desires. Yet frugality and industry have been forced upon him by the climate and by economic conditions. The rest of Europe long ago became conscious of this fact. When railroads just began to be built, the Italian blasted his way through the mountains, and I am sure there is not a tunnel which he did not help to dig, and perhaps not a great stone bridge whose foundations he did not lay. Until comparatively recently, the Italian seemed indispensable in all such undertakings, and in a greater portion of Europe his camp could be seen wherever the railroad was making a new path for civilization never given to alcoholic excess like the slav more inventive than his duller competitor easily adjusted to any task or condition he would lie uncomplainingly in a ditch where the weather was hot or cold wet or dry and for a comparatively small wage do a full day's work which the natives of these countries seem unable to do the pioneer of Italian migrations was his lazier brother, who, with a trained monkey and a hand organ out of tune, made his way from place to place. He also came first across the Atlantic and caused many of us to believe that he was the typical Italian. The tourist who is besieged by the beggars in Naples, and who sees the lazy Lazzaroni stretched out upon the ground with his face turned towards the baking sun, sees the exceptional Italian, although this exception seems to be numerous. As a rule, the Italian asks for but little in life. He lives on olives and macaroni, cornmeal mush, or polenta, as it is called, and is content. He rarely drinks to excess his wine being often watered to such a degree that it can no more be called an alcoholic beverage. His home need not be either beautiful or commodious when all out of doors is his, when God has set ornaments into the heavens and calls out of the earth such beauties as no mortal can reproduce. The very rags which cover his body become picturesque as the sunlight plays upon them with its wonderful coloring satisfied as is the italian at home by his condition he is equally unsatisfied with any restraint by authority lawlessness has cut so deep into his life that it may be said to be a natural characteristic the root of it lies in the fact that for centuries the lawmakers were aliens and conquerors the laws being made for the strong and not for the weak to oppress and not to protect brigandage and heroism often became synonymous while murder and theft were easily excused upon the grounds of expediency much of this spirit has remained in all classes of society especially in the south and the population is so used to it that the criminal is more often pitied than condemned while the people would rather put a halo around the heads of assassins and murderers than a rope about their necks Modern psychology, under the leadership of the Italian physician Lombroso, has encouraged this leniency towards criminals, and the Italian, when he can find no other excuse for a crime, lays it to hereditary influences, which makes the criminal still more an unfortunate man. Rarely does he call a prison by its right name. It is the place for unfortunates. The criminal is regarded as an unfortunate one, and heinous indeed must be the crime which is looked upon as more than a misfortune. The various secret societies in Italy, which once had political bearing, have become largely a menace to organized society, and a school for the worst kind of crimes. The consequence is that many of the criminals who come to our shores are Italians who are trying to escape punishment, or who are entangled in the meshes of the Mafia or Camorra, and the officials are very glad to have their room rather than their company. 
evidences are not lacking that their way out is made easy even if it cannot be proved that the government aids them to come it does not follow that the italian is dishonest he compares well with the average european who comes to us but in his ethics he is decidedly mixed and his poetical temper does not always help him to tell the exact truth his exceedingly great politeness prevents him from saying no when he means it and often when one feels himself aggrieved by what seems a deception it is only an overplus of good manners he is extremely amorous in his wooing jealous when he has attained his end and fights for his love to the death he is generous if not chivalrous to his wife and with proper training in america he may become a docile husband even now he is one of the few european fathers who may push a baby carriage through the streets without losing caste by it traveling through italy i have come upon many a husband who took complete charge of the baby during the journey while his wife looked out of the window and enjoyed the leisure the ties which bind him to his wife are rather easily broken due to the fact that many marriages are contracted early so that the wife passes from youth to age quickly and great family cares are apt to make him feel that he would better move on socialism tinged by anarchy has deeply eaten into the life of the common people and is regarded by most italians as an important factor in the control of the government in which corruption and graft are nearly as common as in russia while better conditions are in sight they have not yet come and taxation is as heavy as it is unjustly raised and distributed eighty four per cent of all the taxes raised are expended upon the national debt the administration and defense while all the rest of the national needs must be met by only seventeen per cent but two point seven nine per cent of that sum is used for education the consequence being that fifty per cent of the population of italy are illiterate that the public schools both government and church schools are poor and that the high schools and universities are suffering from the lack of proper equipment and are not able to keep pace with modern advancement in education compulsory education is a law never enforced and yet suffrage depends upon the ability to read and write therefore over six million voters are robbed of their right to vote the king is loved for the simplicity of his life the honesty of his purposes and for his adaptability to modern thought and conditions but this cannot be said of most of his ministers and state officials the accepted name for an official used to be and in a measure still is governor ladro which means government thief the italian is a good business man and a good organizer having a talent for the dollar which today makes him a new business force in europe and one to be reckoned with especially if he improves his business morals which are very poor in spite of the fact that italy is the center of the most dogmatic christian church the italian is tolerant towards those of other faith or race even while being superstitious to a degree he loves the pomp and splendor of the church but has not been deeply touched by her ethical features and is in a measure as much pagan as when his forefathers worshipped local deities although now he calls them patron saints one might justly accuse the catholic clergy of not having risen to their responsibility of having increased the enmity rather than the love of a large portion of the population of having played politics on the off side and of having had no social vision but a charge like this though true has back of it certain facts which would perchance show us the roman priests in a better light there are priests and priests bishops and bishops even as there are popes and popes if the clergy of italy were made after the pattern of the present pope if it had his spirit his devotion and his piety the italian might still become a christian who would prove the power of his faith and who would be thoroughly genuine and tolerant not a dogmatist a thorough optimist a man of great faith and consequently not a good politician we know enough of pope pius x to wish for italy and for america also that he might become the model for all roman catholics then indeed the immigrant would be to us no problem but a blessing yet one cannot judge the hierarchy by the pope and there are in italy not a few discerning men who distrust the church the more in the measure in which it has a good pope behind whom to hide its evil designs 
yet who that has looked into the face of pope pius x will ever forget its strong yet sweet manliness he must indeed have no religious sensibilities who does not realize when in his presence that he is face to face with a man of god shortly after his evaluation to his office he stood before a congregation of some ten thousand people who filled the court of saint damasia his face shone from the pleasure of loving those who stood before him and they could not help loving him he began to speak and gradually a deep-felt silence crept over the vast assemblage i am so glad he said my dearly beloved friends to see so many of you here and i thank you all from the depths of my heart they tell me that society is corrupt full of weakness and disease a sickly dying body but i he said and his voice was filled by the strength of his faith do not believe it he then told the simple story of the child which jesus raised from the dead he told it as simply as it was written as a disciple of jesus who was an eyewitness might have told it to the humble folk of judea he told how jesus with his companions came how he looked upon the girl and as he laid his hands upon her head said the child is not dead it is not true with his face bathed in a flame of holy passion the great pope and preacher said to the breathless multitude non e vero it is not true non lo credo i do not believe it and if we all cling to one another i believe that humanity still has vitality and that it will come to full life and health as long ago did the little child in palestine as i look upon the italian at home with his many social diseases which have so deeply eaten into his life that one might judge him incurable i nevertheless say non e vero non lo credo it is not true i do not believe it true my faith in his healing does not rest with the pope in spite of his native piety and his sterling character the italian is sick and sore because the church which has so long been his physician acknowledges no error and even its humble pope will not persuade it that it must radically change its treatment this not only for the sake of italy but for the sake of america also the most dangerous element which can come to us from any country is that which comes smarting under real or fancied wrongs committed by those who should have been its helpers and healers such an element italy furnishes in a remarkably great degree and i have no hesitation in saying that it is our most dangerous element End of chapter seventeen the italian at home chapter eighteen of on the trail of the immigrant this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. On the Trail of the Immigrant by Edward Steiner. Chapter 18 The Italian in America. It is hard to determine how long it is since the first Savoyard came to our country with his trained bears, making them dance to the squeaky notes of his reed instrument as he wandered from town to town. He and the man with the monkey and organ were of the same adventurous stock, and they were the vanguard of a vast army of men who were to come, first with a push-cart, later with shovel and pickaxe not to destroy but to build up and to help in the great conquest of nature's resources so abundantly bestowed upon this continent while the average italian immigrant is not regarded by any of us as a public benefactor it is a question just how far we could have stretched our railways and ditches without him for he now furnishes the largest percentage of the kind of labor which we call unskilled and he is found wherever a shovel of earth needs to be turned or a bed of rock is to be blasted hundreds of thousands come each year and each one of them fits into the work awaiting him moving on to a new task when the old one is finished 
the kind of work which they do calls for unattached migrating labor and eighty per cent of those who come have no marriage ties to hinder their movements when the winter comes and out-of-doors work grows slack or when the labor market is depressed these unattached forces return to italy and bask in its sunshine until conditions for labor on this side of the sea grow brighter their quarters which are as near as possible to their work are easily recognized not because they are more slovenly than their neighbors but because there is such a helter-skelter i don't care sort of atmosphere about their squalor this comes from the fact that they regard their quarters as purely temporary and treat them as one might a camping ground which tomorrow is to be abandoned for a better site like all foreigners they prefer to be among their own not so much from a feeling of clannishness although that is not absent but because among their own they are safe from the ridicule which borders on cruelty and with which the average american treats nearly every stranger not of his complexion or speech in passing through connecticut where nearly every large town has its italian colony i found one lonely italian asking the conductor whether this was the train for new york which way won't you go usually the american thinks that the foreigner can understand poor english all the italian knew he repeated new york new york the conductor left the puzzled man standing on the platform and the train moved on i remained with the italian and saw him three times treated similarly if not worse and i concluded that it is not too safe for the italian to distribute himself too thinly over this continent the italian usually moves into quarters formerly occupied by the irish or jews whose demands have risen with their better earnings and who have left the congested districts for the uptown or the suburbs at present it is no doubt true that the italian is satisfied by these quarters and that what nobody wants he is ready to take so it is that he comes to the edges of the great ghetto in new york to bleecker street and beyond and that his trail leads almost into the heart of it jewish and italian pushcart peddlers stand side by side the italian barber shop seeks semitic customers the smells from the genoese restaurant blend with those from the kosher kitchen and the air is disturbed by the perfumes of garlic and paprika a combination not half so bad as it smells in chicago little italy hovered around a large district condemned to the sheltering of vice and when good business sense dictated that it be moved to some less conspicuous portion of the town it was immediately invaded by italians scarcely a day had passed yet the change made was as complete as it was revolutionary large plate windows were broken and pillows were stuck into the aperture to keep out the lake breeze the broad stairs which had led to destruction were slippery now but not so dangerous as before the large parlors were divided and subdivided while the gay paper was torn from the walls it looked as though conquerors had come who were bent upon destruction a happy change was manifest in the streets for it was full of children and the innocent face of a child had not been seen in those streets for years housing conditions among the italians are as bad as can be imagined and the most crowded quarters in our cities are those inhabited by them four hundred and ninety two families in one block is the record and it is held by new york on prince street between mott and elizabeth streets while philadelphia can boast of having the most unwholesome tenements where air is a luxury and daylight unknown in that city thirty families numbering one hundred and twenty three persons were living in thirty four rooms of course the landlord who builds these shacks and the community which tolerates them are equally to blame both commit a crime against society but a good share of the blame must fall upon the italian himself for being satisfied with such surroundings he is of course anxious to save money and a decent dwelling in our large cities is a luxury so he who at home used the heavens for the roof of his tenement and the long street for his parlor is naturally content with but a small shelter for the night considering the conditions under which the italians live their quarters are not nearly so bad as one might expect and when a period of prosperity has come upon the community when it can look back upon a year or two of consecutive work they show in common with other foreign quarters decided improvement 
rather characteristic is the tenement district of hartford connecticut which has gone through all the stages of such districts in other cities is no better than they and in many respects worse there are buildings occupied which would be condemned elsewhere as unfit for human habitation there are whole blocks which look damp dingy and dirty ancient structures with filth oozing from every pore jews and italians are the chief inhabitants of this district although one comes across a stranded american family here and there the dregs of new england the most hopeless people in this new city of ancient tenements the two nationalities live rather close together and it is a mixture of russian and italian dirt the italian article being much the cleaner walk through the streets with me and you will readily forget that you are in america here pietro the shoemaker on his three-legged stool mends boots out on the streets while lorenzo shaves his customer upon the pavement in front of his shop gossiping groups of swarthy neighbors sit together upon the threshold of their homes and bianca lorenzo's wife is complaining in a loud voice that pietro the shoemaker has called her a hussy and he a low-down sicilian a good-for-nothing has called me the barber's wife a hussy she is rousing the ire of her neighbors, and woe to Pietro, for Lorenzo's wife has a temper. They do look so unchanged as yet, nearly all of them, so genuinely homely as if they had landed but yesterday, and they have not yet gone through the transforming process, except as Francesco, the chief of the hurdy-gurdy grinders, has changed one or two tunes of his repertoire, for he appeases the New England conscience by playing nearer my god to thee with variations rock of ages closely followed by tammany and airs from cavallario rusticana if the italian in hartford were less handicapped by the wretched conditions of his dwelling he would more easily be able to utilize the splendid advantages of that city as it is he rises very slowly but perceptibly although he lives in the worst possible houses he is growing more and more cleanly he is gaining in self-respect and when he has had the opportunity and the experience of the irish people he will probably not only duplicate their splendid record in new england and elsewhere but excel it slowly but surely he is rising from a tenement dweller to a tenement owner and soon he will do others as he was done and charge exorbitant rent for uninhabitable quarters the italian is regarded as a good asset in the real estate business for he can be crowded more than any other human being he is fairly prompt with his rent and he does not make heavy demands in the way of improvements this he himself appreciates for he has business sense and buys real estate as soon as he can invest his small earnings usually he acquires a small house with a large mortgage he moves into the house at once proceeds to draw revenue from every available corner and in a few years lifts the mortgage and is on his way to buy more real estate the value of the business is proved by the fact that in the italian quarters in new york eight hundred italians are owners of houses a large portion of course being tenements of the worst character which nevertheless represent the respectable value of fifteen million dollars a like large sum lies in the savings bank of that city deposited by italian immigrants while the total value of all the property owned by them in the city of new york alone is not far from seventy million dollars these figures i must confess do not impress me for the sufferings endured and meted out for the sake of these earnings are terrible and in the tit-for-tat of our economic order the italian gives as good as he gets the narrow quarters he rents are invariably sublet and he imposes upon the newcomer conditions as hard as or harder than those under which he began life in the land of the free the hardest conditions are those he imposes upon his wife and children yet he is not a cruel husband or father and shares their hard labor often making the children part owners of what they earn of course the western and southern cities where the italians have settled make a better showing for they are not the men who came but yesterday they have had a larger opportunity and have made full use of it 
italian clubs opera houses and chambers of commerce are being organized in the western and southern cities and one can judge of the quality of our italian immigrant best where the struggle for life is not too keen the surroundings not so terribly depressing and where the american spirit has had a chance to be grafted upon the latin stock more and more he is leaving the city and in the southwest especially colonies of italians are springing up and are conducted with such eminent success that with some encouragement the italian may be made helpful in reclaiming our arid deserts even as he is now making the rocky hill farms of connecticut and massachusetts to blossom as the rose among these settlements that at bryan texas is the most notable it is composed of what we usually call the least desirable italian element the sicilian nearly twenty five hundred people have settled there as renters although not a few of them are owners of the land they work some eighteen miles separate the various families all of whom come from near palermo and have lived together in reasonable harmony making rapid financial progress they are as peaceful a community as is found in so turbulent a state as texas in utah and california the progress made is still more marked and proves that the italian like the rest of us needs only a fair chance i have had good opportunity also to observe him in his migratory state attached to a construction crew on the railroad and tending by a cut in the rock or by the western fields usually the farmer fears his coming the word dago has in it an element of dread it carries the sound of the dagger and the dynamite bomb the faraway villager who sees the camp approaching fears its proximity i have watched the italians coming and going and although there was a heated brawl at times they quarrelled among themselves disturbed nobody left the hen coops of the farmers untouched did not burn down the village and paid decently for their food when they went away a fairly good source of revenue had disappeared and with it a good share of unreasoning prejudice as competitors in certain fields of activity they are justly feared by those who have regarded those fields as their own peculiar province and they are pushing the russian jew very hard in his monopoly of the manufacture of clothing the nimble fingers of the italian woman her lesser demands upon life and the ease with which she carries the burdens of wifehood and motherhood have enabled her to outdistance the workers of the ghetto although the strife is still on and the issue not decided yet i believe that the future clothing worker in america will be the italian and not the jew for the jew loves life and its good things and moreover he has educational ambitions for his children which the italian does not yet feel he being a sinner above all others in the use of his children's labor the chicago truant officers have had the privilege of arresting nearly all the parents in one little italy at least once for almost every child of school age was kept at home and sweated for all the strength it possessed the italian is very fertile in inventing excuses for the purpose of evading the law and his ethical standard in that direction is still extremely low this comes from his inherited hatred of all governmental restrictions he still thinks that the state seeks only its own good and his hurt in its insistence upon the education of his children substantially this is the italian's attitude towards law in general and to that in a large measure is due the fact that he rates relatively high in the statistics of crime i have thus far refrained from using statistics largely because they may be juggled with as has been done very successfully just as zealots juggle with bible texts to prove their contentions i have done something besides gathering figures and that something may be of importance i have visited nearly all the penitentiaries in the eastern and western states not to ask how many foreigners there are in jail but to ask why and how they were convicted what their present behavior is to look the men and women squarely in the face and to converse with them let me say here again emphatically that statistics are misleading and that in spite of the large number of italians in prison there are by far fewer criminals among them than the statistics indicate in a large number of cases the crimes for which the italian suffers have grown out of local usage in his old home none the less are they justly punished here lest they be permitted to perpetuate themselves in the new home 
most of the italians in prison have used the stiletto and the pistol too freely just as they used them at home when jealousy made them mad or when they were in pursuit of vengeance for real or fancied wrongs there are not a few real criminals who have used the weapon for gain but in the majority of cases the stabbing and shooting was an affair of honor with those concerned and even the aggrieved parties preferred to suffer in silence and die bequeathing their grudge to the next generation rather than bring the affair before a sordid court testimony in such cases is very hard to get and i have seen many a wounded italian bite his lips inwardly groaning and suffering in silence unwilling to let strange ears hear the proud secret of which he was the keeper and the victim italian burglars have not reached proficiency enough to have a place in the hall of infamy and bank robbers and hold-up men need not fear serious competition from that source the prisons contain many italians who transgressed out of ignorance as well as from passion numbers suffer because they do not know the language of the court and did not have enough coin of the realm the worst thing about the italians is that they have no sense of shame or remorse i have not yet found one of them who is sorry for anything except that he had been caught and in his own eyes and in the eyes of his friends he is unfortunate when he is in prison and lucky when he comes out he no bad his neighbor says he good he just caught and when he comes out he is received like a hero this is the severest indictment that can be brought against the italian and it is severe enough but it comes largely from his attitude towards the state and from the nature of the crime lillian betts who knows her foreigners critically and sympathetically says quote, in new york the streets the italians live in are the most neglected the able head of this department claiming that cleanliness is impossible where the italian lives the truth is that preparation for cleanliness in our foreign colonies is wholly inadequate the police despise the italian except for his voting power he feels the contempt but with the wisdom of his race he keeps his crimes foreign and defies this department more successfully than the public generally knows he is a peaceable citizen in spite of the peculiar race crimes which startle the public the criminals are as one to a thousand of these people on sundays watch the colonies the streets are literally crowded from house line to house line as far as the eye can see but not a policeman in sight nor occasion for one laughter song discussion exchange of epithet but no disturbance they mind their own business as no other nation and carry it to the point of crime when they protect their own criminal like every other human being in god's beautiful world they have the vices of their virtues it is for us to learn the last to prevent the first End quote. in spite of the fact that italy seems to be the land of beggars the italian immigrant is rarely a medicant and according to jacob riss among the street beggars of new york the irish lead with fifteen per cent the native americans follow with twelve the germans with eight while the italians show but two per cent in the almshouses of new york the italian occupies the enviable position of having the smallest representation with ireland having one thousand six hundred seventeen persons and italy but nineteen while the figures for the united states are equally favorable considering the congested conditions of the tenements the italian retains much of his inherited vigor but consumption which plays havoc with him in this uncongenial climate is aggravated by his mode of living that is so entirely changed especially do the women and children suffer for they are suddenly transferred from a complete out-of-door life to the prison-like walls of the tenements in chicago i visited a family in which i had become interested through a son who was in constant antagonism to the school law and who was a special pet of the truant officers when i first saw these people they occupied two rear rooms in which the mother had been for three months without once going out of doors she was coughing constantly although hard at work making vests and the husband could not understand how her red cheeks could so soon have disappeared or why her color was as yellow as the light of the coal oil lamp by which she worked ten of the fourteen working hours of the day tomasio the son was stunted physically and mentally and the mark of the tenement was upon him 
he was the oldest of eight children and had borne the burden of his seven brothers and sisters as if it were his own while the other boys were playing on the sidewalk he had to rock the baby through seven years he had rarely seen gods out of doors except as it shone upon him through a little spot in the air shaft of the tenement he and his parents hated the school and the school officers who were after him and that c-a-t spells cat will be as much as he will know of all the mysteries in spite of the zealous truant officers and teachers lay and clerical the public schools will be unable to work their magic not only upon tomasio and his family of seven but upon numbers of the same kind reared under the same circumstances for even before they were born they were robbed of their mental and physical background and their horizon will always be bounded more or less by garbage cans barrels of stale beer wash tubs full of soiled clothing and by cradles full of little bambinos nevertheless the italian is not a degenerate he usually survives the wretched years of his infancy and then like all people who share his environment grows up less rugged perhaps more subtle and hardened to some things which would prove a very serious handicap to those of us who know the value of pure air and of soap and water it would seem upon a superficial glance that the large incursion of italians to america would add strength to the roman catholic church here and that their coming into a community would be welcomed because of that but i have found almost the opposite to be true the irish priests do not like them they lack the serious devotion to the church which characterizes irish or german parishioners they care only for the show element in religion and are not willing to pay even for that they will come to church on great holidays when many candles are lighted and banners are carried but they do not bother themselves to come to early mass nor are they the best attendants at the confessional they will spend much money upon showy funerals and christenings but if the catholic church were dependent for its support upon the italian immigrants it would fare badly this of course may be due to the fact that they are very poor and that in italy the church is comparatively rich but it is most likely due to the fact that contrary to the common opinion the italian is not religious by nature that as a rule he has no understanding for the serious and ethical side of religion that he is a heathen still who needs to have his spiritual nature discovered and stirred after which he should have the alphabet of the gospel preached to him in the simplest possible way the italian priest in america is the poorest kind of vehicle for that purpose in proof of which i quote lillian w betts because she cannot be accused of prejudice in the light of the conclusions which she draws quote, to one who knows and appreciates the great spiritual life of the roman catholic church the relation between that church and the mass of the italians in this country is a source of grief for it does not hold in the lives of this people the place it should reluctantly the writer has to blame the ignorance and bigotry of the immigrant priests who set themselves against american influence men who too often lend themselves to the purposes of the ward healer the district leader in controlling the people who too often keep silence when the poor are the victims of the shrewd italians who have grown rich on the ignorance of their countrymen one man made eight thousand dollars by supplying one thousand laborers to a railroad he collected five dollars from each man as railroad fare though transportation was given by the railroad and three dollars from each man for the material to build a house they found as a home the wretched shelters provided by contractors which with we are all familiar this transaction when known did not disturb the church or social relations of the offender but it increased his political power for it showed what he could do he is recognized today as the mayor of blank street his influence is met everywhere the claim is made that the parochial school has the advantage that it gives religious as well as secular instruction observing and comparing the children living under the same environment who attended the public and parochial schools i found that they did equally good work in english but that the public schools did very much better work in arithmetic the time given in the public schools to the so-called fads and frills was apparently given in the parochial school to religious exercises and instruction with about an equal degree of comprehension and application on the part of the pupils there was no difference in the appreciation of truth honesty or peace they lied stole and fought without showing distinction in training 
the singing voices of the children in the public schools were far better trained than the voices of children in the parochial schools what the italian needs in new york above all things is his church in the full possession of its great spiritual power young men born in this country imbued with the love of and appreciation of its great opportunities trained for the priesthood to work and live among the italians in the interval before this is accomplished a novitiate of at least five years for all foreign-born and trained priests before they are put in charge of an american parish the establishing of music schools in connection with all the roman catholic churches in the foreign colonies the rapid disappearance of the italian parish because the people have become american above all the immediate suppression of all proselyting among these people their church is in their blood the veneer which is all the new church connection is stifles the vital breath of the soul and leaves the so-called convert without a church the exceptions prove the rule remove the temptation of the loaves and fishes in this proselyting endeavor and see how successful the effort is let the catholic church in america live at her highest among these people and the political problems they create will disappear End quote. i do not fully agree with the author of the above but i join with her heartily in the desire expressed in her last sentence i would also add let the protestant church live her highest before these people let her take a share in the responsibilities which these strangers bring without a thought of proselyting them and she will find that her efforts are needed and are not in vain end of chapter eighteen the italian in america chapter nineteen of on the trail of the immigrant this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by suman barua on the trail of the immigrant by edward steiner chapter 19 where greek meets greek a baggage wagon heavily loaded by bags and trunks and half lost to view in the muddy street and against the muddier sky of chicago stopped in front of the saloon to the acropolis on halstead street the baggage man was surrounded by an angry mob for he demanded four dollars for his trip and that the unsuspecting immigrants were unwilling to pay in this they were supported by their countrymen who had come out of the saloon to welcome them to new greece which is unpicturesquely located on the west side of chicago between dives and cheap restaurants on one side and the busy ghetto on the other men of all nationalities if of no occupation gathered about the haggling crowd and the baggage man received the support of the mob for he wore a union button and the war cry it's the union price was the shibboleth by which the greeks were vanquished and made to pay the four dollars not of course without having spent an hour in their national pastime of haggling for the price the driver mounted his quickly emptied wagon with a curse upon the dagos and the crowd informally discussed for a while the immigration question its verdict being that it is time to shut our doors against the greeks for they are a poor lot from which to make good american citizens the crowd dispersed as quickly as it came and the freshly landed greeks entered the gates of the acropolis a greek saloon and restaurant combination not unlike externally at least its american prototype on the same street where the saloon is decidedly at its worst the newcomers were feasted on black olives brown bread and goat's cheese for the greek is very loyal to the national appetite and they immediately begin to plan their entrance into the busy life of america through the avenues of barter or of labor it is not to be wondered at that the crowd which knows nothing of the greeks call them dagos for it would be hard even for one who knows them only from the classic past properly to place this group of men 
were it not that their speech betrayed the ancient heritage. We never picture the heroes of Greek epics, undersized like these moderns, round-headed, looking into the world out of small, black, piercing eyes, their complexion sallow and their hair straight and black. We too would place them nearer modern Palermo than ancient Athens, and judge their blood to have flowed through the veins of rough Albanese mountaineers and crude Slavic ploughmen, rather than through the perfect bodies of those Greeks who have dissolved with their myths, and who disappeared when Mount Olympus was deserted by its divine tenantry. These modern Greeks have retained much of their past, stored in their memories at least, and scarcely one of those whom I have met but knows the Iliad and the Odyssey, or whose black eyes do not sparkle proudly when he recounts the glory of those Attic days. They are still eager to know, even more eager to tell what they know, and a brave front is not the least part of the equipment of the modern Greek. A consuming pride which amounts to conceit shuts his eyes to his own faults as well as to the virtues of other races, and he will long hold himself aloof from the hopper which grinds us all into the same kind of grist. Where do these men come from, Mr. B? I asked the keeper of the classic bar of the Acropolis. They are all Athenians. Every Greek is, although cradled in some island unrenowned either in the past or the present. Why do they come to Chicago? To make money? I answer my own question. Oh no, replies the classic barkeeper, delicately ironical. They are not poor. No Greek is ever poor, even if he cannot buy five cents worth of black olives. Do they come here because they have a better chance? Chance? Why, every one of these men was on the way to become a Demarc, mayor. They have come here to learn American ways, and incidentally to enrich American culture by their presence. Full of this pride and confidence in themselves, they are nevertheless ready to blacken our boots for ten cents, and they do it remarkably well, displacing Negroes and Italians, until later... They open stores and sell American candies to an undiscriminating public hungry for the cheap sweets. No labor is too hard for them, although they prefer to stand behind the counter. More or less, all the Greeks will finally be in trades of some kind and monopolists in all of them. At present, their eyes are on boot blacking and confectionery stores nearly every town of any size in the united states being invaded by them so that their presence is beginning to be felt the modern greek still has the license of the poet and he uses the license whether he has the poetry or not i think he is happiest when he exaggerates to no one's hurt albeit like the rest of us he does not always stop to ask whether it hurts or not Conceit and deceit are as close relatives as poetry and lying, and to Greeks and Americans they often look strangely alike. If the modern Greek is a hero, he is a cautious one, and recklessness is not one of his faults. He is no plunger, but moves along the straight and narrow way which leadeth to a big bank account. Contented by little, he does not despise the much, and although he is not meek, he will inherit a fair share of this earth's goods. Born with democratic instincts, he soon feels himself as good as anybody, and when he grows sleek and fat, he selects the chief seat in the synagogue or some other lofty height from which he looks in disdain upon his poorer brothers. While hospitable, he has become strangely suspicious of strangers, and he is not a good bedfellow, for he likes to occupy the whole bed. If it is a settlement which opens its doors to him, it becomes all his, and he does not shrink from intimidation as a means of driving the Italian or the Jew from its welcoming gates. He is industrious and temperate, 
yet he likes to lounge about the saloons where he sometimes gets too much of his native wine and then he can be a really bad fellow in his native village he is as chaste as the women but in america he has a bad name and the neighborhood in which he lives is not regarded as the safest for unprotected women the chicago police especially has an eye upon his candy stores which are supposed to be as immoral as they often are uninviting the fact that in the chicago colony ten thousand greeks live practically without their wives explains this situation and it is just possible that ten thousand americans under the same conditions would not act differently the police in new greece is not on a good footing with the inhabitants and occasionally shooting and stabbing occur at such times it is difficult to know who is more to blame the police or the supposed culprits the modern greek is still punctiliously pious his church and priest follow him into every settlement and he is loyal to the forms of his religion it is doubtful whether here or in the old world it discloses to him the ethical teachings of jesus but in this we are in a poor condition to cast the first stone at him his priest is not servilely revered or feared and the relation between them is too often that of buyer and seller the priest has the means of grace the greek is in need of them for salvation and he pays for what he gets sometimes reluctantly at present it would fare ill with any one who would try to wean him from his church for loyalty to it is loyalty to greece and the greek has never been a turncoat no more patriotic people ever came to us than these modern greeks and although that patriotism is centered upon their native country they will ultimately make good citizens and even before that day make splendid politicians for in the craft of politics every greek is an adept and he is a mighty place hunter before the lord the only trouble with the government of modern greece is that it has not enough officers for all the aspirants for them and this learned proletariat is a fair-sized menace in this little country in governing themselves the modern greeks have not been a conspicuous success and the only things we can teach them in this line are the willingness to acknowledge failure and the eagerness with which we seek the better way the new greece of chicago a few blocks in a busy thoroughfare is not a large world yet it is more greek than the ghetto is russian or little sicily is italian homes in the true sense there are but few because the women have not yet come the housing conditions of the greeks are bad and likely to remain so for a long time there are grocery stores containing little or no american food saloons by far too many but providing food and drink at the same time as is the custom in greece a greek bank the front windows of which are covered by the advertisements of steamship transportation companies clothing and dry goods stores whose proprietors are greeks although their stock in trade is necessarily american and the greek church with a double cross to mark its orthodoxy this is new greece out of it some of our newly arrived immigrants will go in the morning to the railroad tracks to do the digging and the ditching they will be bossed by big pete whose size is exceeded only by the length of his oats and who boasts of being able to handle his countrymen easily because the greeks can be handled only by a man who can show them that he is a better man and that i am and if you don't believe it feel my muscle i pay them dollar one point five zero a day and i treat them like greeks i watched big pete treat them like greeks for half a day and i did not discover that such treatment saved a man from being geared to the highest notch and made to work incessantly while big pete watched and cursed to help the pace 
the same night that they arrived some of the young boys were looked over by the men of the greek colony who had assisted them to come and whose labor was theirs until the passage money was paid and paid with interest the next morning they began their tutelage in blacking boots in so-called parlors whose walls are covered by chromos depicting greek wars in which the greeks are always the victors and the turks are slaughtered like sheep at the stockyards there are also one or two pictures of classic ruins in such surroundings and seemingly unconscious of the life about them these boys will blacken boots for eighteen hours a day with heart mind and soul in greece and their fingers in america only when they handle our coin they will attempt no conversation even after they know our speech literally obeying the scriptural injunction to say ya ya and nay nay and not much else if they can help it they are not nearly so communicative as the italians and although a smile sits well on a greek face i've rarely seen one there the confectionery stores which are outside of new greece are open all the time at least so long as a customer may be expected and although these customers are nearly all americans the greeks have few friends among them they all return to new greece as often as possible and there their virtues unfold and their soul delights itself in fatness they are not exceeded even by the chinese in that loyalty to native food which i call the patriotism of the stomach and a greek grocery store is filled from one end to the other with food from the classic isles there are dried vegetables whose present form does not betray their natural shape but which taste luscious because the flavor of the native soil clings to them fish dried pickled and preserved in some form and cheese made from the milk of goats whose horns buttered broken classic vases instead of modern tin cans the smells seem ancient too but in these the greek revels and here he is at home new greece in chicago is fortunate in having as one of its boundaries hull house one of the numerous activities of which consists in trying to discover the possible point of contact between the home-born and the stranger a greek play given at hull house opened the eyes of many american people to the fact that the past is alive in the modern greek and at a banquet also at hull house where americans and greeks vied with each other in extolling the glories of athens the wealth of the past was again richly displayed how near the american and the greek have come to each other through these two notable events it is difficult to tell but i am sure that they have increased the pride of the greeks and have given us an added respect for them but after all they will be judged by the way they live today and by the measure in which these small dark-haired traders and workers exemplify in their lives the virtues of those men of old whose names they have inherited and whose fame they are eager to preserve end of chapter nineteen where greek meets greek